Chapter 7 They're safe, assured the vampire, spurring on his mule, Drahul. All three of them, Milva, Dandelion, and, of course, Angoulême, who drove us into the sans Retour Valley just in time and told us everything, not stinting with her colourful expressions. I've never understood why the majority of human curses and insults refer to the erotic sphere. Sex is wonderful and associated with beauty, joy and pleasure. How can the names of the sexual organs be used as a vulgar synonym for... Drop the subject, Regis, Geralt interrupted. Of course, I apologise. Warned by Angoulême about the approaching brigands, we crossed the marches of Toussaint without delay. Milva admittedly wasn't overjoyed and was spoiling to turn tail and bring you both aid. I managed to dissuade her. And Dandelion, astonishingly, rather than enjoy the asylum afforded by the borders of the duchy, clearly had his heart in his mouth. You don't by any chance know what he fears so in Toussaint. I don't, but I can guess, Geralt replied sourly. It wouldn't be the first place where our dear friend the bard has been up to no good. He has settled down now somewhat, for he moves in decent society, but nothing was sacred to him in his youth. Only urchins and women who'd climbed to the tops of tall trees were safe from him. Husbands regularly held grudges against the troubadour for unknown reasons. There is doubtless a man in Tucson for whom the sight of dandelion will bring back memories. But these are essentially trifling matters. Let's return to the facts. What of our pursuers? I hope... I don't think... Rages smiled, that they followed us into Tucson. The border is teeming with errant knights who are extremely bored and hankering for a fight. Furthermore, we and a group of pilgrims we bumped into on the border ended up in the sacred grove of Mirkvid, and that place is fearsome. Even the pilgrims and infirm people who make for Mirkvid from the most distant corners to be healed stop in the settlement near the forest edge, not daring to go deeper. There are rumours that any who dare enter the sacred oak groves end up burned over a slow flame in the wicker hag. Geralt inhaled. You mean, of course, the vampire interjected again. The druids are in the grove of Mirkvid. The ones who were previously in Kaidu, Angrin, later journeyed to Loch Monduin, and finally to Mirkvid in Tucson. We were fated to find them. Did I say we were? I don't recall. Geralt sighed deeply. Kair, riding at his back, also sighed. That friend of yours, is he among those druids? The vampire smiled once more. Not he, but she, he explained. Indeed, she is. She has even been promoted. She leads the entire circle. Is she the Hierophantess? She is the Flaminica. That's the highest druidic title when born by a woman. Only men may be hierophants. True, I'd forgotten. So, am I to understand that Milva and the rest are now in the care of the Flaminica and her circle? The vampire, as was his custom, answered the question while it was being asked, after which he set about answering a question not yet asked. I, however, hurried to meet you, for a mysterious thing occurred. The Flaminica, to whom I began to present our case, didn't let me complete it. She said she knew everything that she had been anticipating our arrival for some time. Really? I couldn't hide my disbelief either. The vampire reined in the mule, stood up in his stirrups and looked around. Are you seeking somebody or something? asked Kair. I'm no longer searching. I found it. Let's sit down. I'd prefer to. Let's sit down. I'll explain everything. They had to raise their voices to be able to converse over the roar of a waterfall tumbling from a considerable height down the vertical wall of a rocky precipice. Down below, where the waterfall had hollowed out a largish lake, a black cave mouth gaped in the rock. The witcher stared at it. Yes, right there, Rages confirmed the witcher's suspicion. I rode here to meet you, for I was instructed to direct you there. You will have to enter that cave. I told you. The druids knew about you, knew about Ciri, knew about our mission, and they learned about it from someone who lives down there. That person, if one is to believe the druidess, wishes to talk to you. If one is to believe the druidess, Geralt repeated sneeringly. 
I've been in these parts before. I know what dwells in the deep caves beneath Devil Mountain. There are various denizens there, but it's impossible to talk to the vast majority of them, except with a sword. What else did your druidess say? What else am I to believe? She gave me clearly to understand. The vampire's black eyes bored into Geralt that she isn't generally fond of individuals who destroy and kill flora and fauna, and of witchers in particular. I explained that at the present moment you are more of a titular witcher, that you absolutely don't pester flora or fauna, as long as the aforementioned doesn't pester you. The Flaminica, you ought to know, is an extremely shrewd woman, and noted that you have abandoned witcherhood, not as a result of ideological changes, but because you were compelled to by circumstances. I know very well, she said, that misfortune has befallen a person close to the witcher. The witcher was thus forced to abandon witcherhood and go to her rescue. Geralt didn't comment, but his gaze was expressive enough to make the vampire hurry to explain. She declared, and I quote, the witcher who is not a witcher will prove he is capable of humility and sacrifice. He will enter the sombre mouth of the earth, unarmed, having laid down all weapons, all sharp iron, all sharp thoughts, all aggression, fury, anger, and arrogance. He will enter in humility. And then in the abyss, the humble, not witcher, will find answers to the questions which torment him. He will find answers to many questions. But should the witcher remain a witcher, he will find nothing. Geralt spat towards the waterfall and the cave. It's a game, he declared. A jest, a prank, soothsaying sacrifice, mysterious encounters in caverns, answers to questions. You can only encounter such hackneyed devices from ragged, wandering storytellers. Somebody's mocking me, at best. And if it's not mockery, I would not call it mockery under any circumstances, Rages said firmly. None at all, Geralt of Rivia. What then is it? One of those notorious druidic peculiarities? We shan't know, Gaia chipped in, until we find out. Come on, Geralt, we'll enter together. Uh, no! The vampire shook his head. The Flaminica was categorical in this respect. The Witcher must enter alone, without a weapon. Give me your sword. I shall look after it during your absence. To hell with that, Geralt began. But Rages interrupted his flow of words with a rapid gesture. Give me your sword. He held out a hand. And if you have any other weapons, leave them with me too. Remember the Flaminica's words. No aggression. Sacrifice. Humility. Do you know who I will encounter down there? Who, or what, is waiting for me in that cave? No, I don't. Various creatures inhabit the subterranean corridors beneath Gorgon. I may be struck down. The vampire softly cleared his throat. That cannot be ruled out, he said gravely. But you must take that risk. I know you will, of course. Geralt was not disappointed. As he had expected, the entrance to the cave was filled with an impressive heap of skulls, ribs, tibulars, and other bones. There was no stench of putrefaction, however. The mortal remains were clearly ancient and functioned as decorations intended to scare away intruders. At least, so he thought. He entered the darkness, and the bones crunched and grated beneath his feet. His vision quickly adjusted to the gloom. He was in a gigantic cave, a rocky cavern whose dimensions the eye was unable to take in, for its proportions broke up and vanished in the forest of stalactites suspended from the ceiling in striking festoons. Stalagmites, stocky and squat at the base, becoming slender towards the top, rose white and pink from the colourful shimmering gravel glistening with water on the cave floor. Some of their points reached well above the witch's head. Some of them were fused with stalactites, forming columns of stalagnates. No one called out. The only audible sounds were from the water, which echoed as it splashed and dripped. He walked on, 
slowly, straight ahead into the gloom, between the columns of stone. He knew he was being watched. He felt the lack of the sword on his back intensely, importunately and distinctly, like the lack of his recently knocked out tooth. He slowed. What a moment earlier he had taken as rounded boulders lying at the foot of some stalagmites now goggled great glowing eyes at him. Great moors opened and conical fangs flashed in the matted mass of grey and brown shaggy dust-covered hair. Barbigazzis. He walked slowly and stepped cautiously. Barbigazzis of all sizes were everywhere. They lay in his way with no intention of yielding. Though they had behaved extremely peacefully until that moment, he was nonetheless uncertain as to what would happen if he trod on one of them. The stalagmites were like a forest, so there was no way of walking straight. He had to weave around them. Above, water dripped from the ceiling, bristling with needles of stalactites. The barbigazzis, more and more of them were appearing, accompanied him as he walked, waddling and rolling over the cave floor. He could hear their monotonous babbling and puffing. He smelled their pungent, sour scent. He had to stop. In his way, between two stalagmites, in a place he couldn't pass around, lay a large echinops, bristling with masses of long spines. Geralt swallowed. He knew only too well that the echinops was capable of shooting its spines a distance of ten feet. The spines had a peculiar property. Once stuck into the body, they broke off, and the sharp tips penetrated and worked their way in deeper and deeper until they finally reached a sensitive organ. Stupid witcher, he heard in the gloom. Cowardly witcher, he's frit. <laughs> the voice sounded odd and weird. But Geralt had heard similar voices many times. Creatures not accustomed to communicating using articulated speech spoke like that. They accented and intoned strangely, drawing out the syllables unnaturally. Stupid witcher! Stupid witcher! He refrained from comment. He bit his lip and carefully moved past the echinops. The monster's spines swayed like a sea anemone's tentacles. But only for a moment. Then the echinops stopped moving and once again seemed nothing more than a clump of bog grass. Two immense barbigazzis waddled across his path, jabbering and growling. From the ceiling came the flapping of webbed wings and a hissing cackle, unerringly signalling the presence of vampirods and vespertils. He's come here, a murderer, a killer, a witcher. The same voice which had spoken previously reverberated in the gloom. He's come down here. He dead, but he has no sword, the killer. So how means he to kill with his gaze? <laughs> or maybe, came a second voice with even more unnatural articulation. We kill him. <laughs> the Barbagatsis babbled in a noisy chorus. One of them, as large as a mature pumpkin, rolled closer and closer and snapped its teeth right by Geralt's heels. The witcher stifled the curse, pressing itself against his lips, and walked on. Water dripped from the stalactites, jingling with a silvery echo. Something seized his leg. He refrained from pushing it roughly away. The strange creature was small, not much larger than a Pekingese dog, it resembled a Pekingese a little too. At least its face did. The rest of it was like a small monkey. Geralt had no idea what it was. He'd never seen anything like it. Witcher! 
sang the almost Pekingese in a high-pitched voice, but quite distinctly, clutching Geralt's boot. Witch, cha, bastard! Get off, he said through clenched teeth. Get off my boot, or I'll kick your ass. The Barbagazzis babbled louder, more urgently and menacingly. Something lowed in the darkness. Geralt didn't know what it was. It sounded like a cow, but the witcher bet it wasn't. Witch the bastard. Let go of my boot, he repeated, fighting to control himself. I came here unarmed in peace. You're bothering me. He broke off and choked on a wave of repellent feta, making his eyes water and his hair curl. The strange Pekingese-like creature digging into his calf goggled and defecated right on his boot. The hideous stink was accompanied by even more hideous noises. He swore appropriately to the situation and shoved the aggressive creature away with his foot, much more gently than he should have, but what he was expecting happened anyway. He kicked the little one, something roared in the darkness, above the literally thunderous jabbering and howling of the Barbagazzis. He kicked the little one. He harmed something smaller than himself. The nearest Barbagazzis rolled right over to his feet. He felt the gnarled and steely claws grabbing and immobilizing him. He didn't fight back. He was resigned to his fate. He wiped his befouled foot on the fur of the largest and most aggressive one. He sat down, tugged by his clothes. Something large descended a stalagmite, jumping down onto the cave floor. He knew at once what it was. A knocker. Stocky, pot-bellied, hairy, bow-legged, at least two yards across the shoulders, with an even broader, ruddy beard. The knocker's approach was heralded by the ground shaking, as though not a knocker, but a shire horse was approaching. Each of the monster's calloused and wide feet were, however ridiculous it sounds, a foot and a half long. The knocker leaned over him, and its breath smelled of vodka. The rascals distill hooch here, Geralt thought mechanically. You hit someone smaller than you, witcher the knocker said, breathing his foul breath into Geralt's face. You harmed a small, gentle, innocent creature without cause. We knew you couldn't be trusted. You're aggressive. You have the instincts of a murderer. How many of our kind have you killed? You scoundrel! He didn't deign to answer. Oh. The knocker breathed alcohol fumes harder. I've dreamed of this since I was a child. Since I was a child. My dream has finally come true. Look to the left. Like an idiot, he looked and was punched in the teeth with a right hook so hard he saw an intense brightness. <laughs> the knocker bared huge crooked teeth from the mass of his reeking beard. I have dreamed of this since I was a child. Look to the right. Enough! A loud and sonorous order resounded from somewhere in the depths of the cave. Enough of this fun and games. Let him go, please. Geralt spat blood from his cut lip. He cleaned his boot in a small stream of water flowing down the rock. The almost Pekingese grinned at him sneeringly, but from a safe distance. The knocker also grinned, massaging its fist. Go, witcher, it growled. 
go to him since he summons you. I shall wait. For you will have to return this way, after all. The cave he entered was astonishingly full of light. Through openings in the ceiling, bristling with stalactites, shone crisscrossing columns of brightness, drawing from the rocks and dripstone formations, a kaleidoscope of brilliance and colour. Furthermore, a magical ball blazing with light, amplified by reflections in the quartz on the walls, was suspended in the air. In spite of all this illumination, the end of the cave faded into the gloom, and black darkness loomed in the vista of the colonnade of stalagnates. An immense cave painting was in the process of being created on the wall, which nature had seemingly prepared for that purpose. The painter was a fair-haired elf dressed in a paint-smudged mantle. His head seemed to be ringed by a luminous halo in the magical natural brilliance. Sit down, said the elf, without resting his gaze away from the painting. He gestured to a boulder with a wave of his brush. They didn't harm you, did they? No, not really. You'll have to forgive them. Indeed, I will. They're a bit like children. They were awfully glad you were coming. I noticed. Only then did the elf glance at him. Sit down, he repeated. I shall be at your disposal shortly. I'm just finishing. What the elf was finishing was a stylized animal, probably a bison. For the moment, only its outline was complete, from its splendid horns to its equally magnificent tail. Geralt sat down on the boulder indicated and swore to be patient and meek to the bounds of his abilities. The elf, softly whistling through clenched teeth, dipped his brush into a bowl of paint and colored his bison purple with swift flourishes. After a moment's thought, he painted tiger stripes on the animal's side. Geralt watched in silence. Finally, the elf took a step back, admiring the fresco which now depicted an entire hunting scene. The striped purple bison was being pursued in wild leaps by skinny human figures with bows and spears painted with careless brushstrokes. What's it meant to be? asked Geralt, unable to contain himself. The elf glanced at him in passing, sticking the clean end of the brush in his mouth. It is, he declared, a prehistoric painting, executed by the primitive people who lived in this cave thousands of years ago, and who mainly lived by hunting the purple bison, which became extinct long ago. Some of the prehistoric hunters were artists, and felt a profound artistic need to immortalize what was in their hearts. Fascinating. It most certainly is the elf agreed. Your scholars have roamed through caves like this for ages, searching for traces of primitive man, and whenever they find something like this, they are inordinately fascinated, for it is proof that you aren't strangers in this land and in this world, proof that your forebears have lived here for centuries, thus proof that this world belongs to their heirs. Why, every race has the right to some roots. Even your human race, whose roots should be sought in the treetops, after all. Ha, an amusing quip, don't you think? Worthy of an epigram. Are you fond of light poetry? What do you think I ought to add to the painting? Draw huge erect phalluses on the primitive hunters. That's a thought. The elf dipped his brush in the paint. The phallic cult was typical for primitive civilizations. It could also serve as the birth of a theory that the human race is yielding to physical degeneration. Its forebears had phalluses like clubs, but their descendants were left with ridiculous, vestigial little pricks. Thank you, Witcher. Don't mention it. It was somehow in my heart. The paint looks very fresh for something prehistoric. In three or four days, the colors will fade due to the salt exuded by the wall, and the painting will look so prehistoric you won't believe it. Your scholars will wet themselves with joy when they see it. Not one of them, I swear, will see through my deceit. They will. How is that? You won't be able to resist signing your masterpiece, will you? The elf 
laughed dryly. Quite right. You've seen through me. Oh, fire of vanity. How difficult it is for an artist to quell you. I've already signed the cave painting. Right here. That isn't a dragonfly. No, it's an ideogram denoting my name. I am Crevan Espagne, ip coium macha. For convenience, I use the alias Havelach, and you may also address me as such. I shall be sure to. You, though, are called Geralt of Rivia. You're a witcher. Presently, you are not, however, destroying monsters or beasts, but are busy hunting for missing girls. News spreads astonishingly quickly, astonishingly far, and astonishingly deep. You allegedly foresaw that I'd show up here. You can foretell the future, I gather. Anyone, Avalach wiped his hands on a rag, can foretell the future. And everyone does it, for it is simple. It is no great art to foretell it. The art is in foretelling it accurately. An elegant deduction, worthy of an epigram. You, naturally, can prophesy accurately. And often. I, my dear Geralt, know much and am capable of much. Actually, my academic title, as you humans would say, indicates that. It reads in full, Ein Severn. A sage, a knowing one. Precisely. And willing, I hope, to share that knowledge. Avalach said nothing for a moment. Share, he finally drawled, with you. Knowledge, my dear, is a privilege, and privileges are only shared with one's equals. And why would I, an elf, a sage, a member of the elite, share anything with a descendant of a creature that appeared in the universe barely five million years ago, having evolved from an ape? A rat, a jackal, or some other such mammal? A creature that took around a million years to discover that one can execute some sort of operation with a gnawed bone using its two hairy hands, after which it shoved the bone up its rectum and shrieked for joy. The elf fell silent, turning and fixing his gaze on his painting. Why indeed, he repeated. Do you dare to think I would share any knowledge at all with you, human? Tell me. Geralt wiped the rest of the shit from his boot. Because perhaps, he replied dryly, it is inevitable. The elf spun around. What? he asked through clenched teeth. Is inevitable. Perhaps. Geralt didn't feel like raising his voice, for the reason that a few years will pass and people will simply take all knowledge for themselves, heedless of whether anyone wants to share it with them or not, including knowledge which you, elf and sage, cunningly conceal behind cave paintings, counting on the fact that people will not want to take pickaxes to that wall, painted with the false evidence of primitive human existence, eh? Oh, my fire of vanity! The elf snorted, quite cheerfully. Oh, yes, he said. It would be vanity, truly carried to stupidity, to believe you wouldn't smash something. You smash everything. But what of it? What of it, man? I don't know. Tell me. And if you don't think it fits, I'll take myself off. Ideally, through a different exit since your mischievous chums are waiting for me by the other one, longing to crack my ribs. By all means. The elf spread his arms wide in a sudden movement, and the rock wall opened with a grinding and a cracking, brutally splitting the purple bison in two. Leave this way. Tread towards the light, metaphorically or literally. That is usually the right way. A bit of a shame, Geralt muttered. I liked the frescoes. You must be jesting, the elf said after a brief silence, sounding quite astonishingly kindly and friendly. 
The fresco won't be harmed. I shall close the rock with an identical charm, and not even the trace of a crack will remain. Come, I'll go out with you. I shall escort you. I've reached the conclusion that I have something to tell you and show you. It was dark inside, but the witcher knew right away that the cave was immense. He could tell from the temperature and air currents. The gravel they walked over was wet. Avalach conjured light in the elven fashion, simply using a gesture without uttering a spell. A glowing ball rose towards the ceiling, and the formations of rock crystal in the cave walls sparkled in a myriad of reflections and gleams. Shadows danced. The witcher gasped involuntarily. It wasn't the first time he'd seen elven sculptures and statues, but the impression was the same each time, that the figures of elves and she-elves, frozen in mid-movement, in mid-flicker, weren't the work of a sculptor's chisel, but the result of a powerful spell, able to change living tissue into the white marble of a mel. The nearest statue depicted a she-elf, sitting with her feet tucked beneath her on a basalt slab. The she-elf was turning her head away as though alarmed by the patter of approaching steps. She was utterly naked. The white marble, polished to a milky brilliance, meant one virtually felt the warmth emanating from the statue. Avalach stopped and leaned against one of the columns, marking the way among an avenue of statues. You have seen through me for a second time, Geralt, he said softly. Yes, you were right. The bison cave painting was camouflage, intended to discourage hacking and drilling through the wall, intended to defend everything in here from plunder and devastation. Every race, the elven too, has a right to its roots. What you see here are our roots. Tread carefully, please. It is essentially a graveyard. The reflections of light dancing over the rock crystals drew further details from the gloom. Beyond the avenue of statues could be seen colonnades, stairways, amphitheatrical galleries, arcades and peristyles, everything made of white marble. I want it, Avalach continued, stopping and indicating with a hand, to survive. Even when we depart, when this whole continent and this whole world ends up under a mile-thick layer of ice and snow, dear Nabea Arain will endure. We shall leave this place, but one day we shall return, we elves. We are promised this by an Ithlina Spiat, the Ithlin Aigli Ap Avienen prophecy. Do you really believe in it, in that prophecy? Does your fatalism really run so deep? Everything. The elf looked not at him, but at the marble columns covered with reliefs as delicate as cobwebs. Has been foreseen and prophesied. Your arrival on the continent. The war, the shedding of elven and human blood. The rise of your race, your decadence. The battle between the rulers of the north and the south and the king of the south shall rise up against the kings of the north and overrun their lands like a flood. They will be crushed and their nations devastated. And so shall begin the extinction of the world. Do you recall Athena's text, Witcher? Who is far shall die at once. Who is near shall fall from the sword. Who hides shall die of hunger. Who survives shall perish from the frost. For Teth Dareath, the time of the end, the time of the sword and the battle axe, the time of contempt, the time of the white cold and the wolfish snowstorm, shall come. Poetry. Do you prefer it less poetic? As a result of a change in the angle of the sun's rays, the margin of permafrost will shift significantly. Then the mountains will be crushed and pushed back southwards by the ice sliding from the north. Everything will be buried under snow, under a thick layer more than a mile deep, and it will become very, very cold. We'll wear warm breeches, Geralt said without emotion. 
sheepskins, and fur hats. You took the words right out of my mouth, the elf agreed calmly. And you'll survive in those hats and breeches in order to return one day, dig holes and poke around in these caves to wreck and plunder. Athena's prophecy doesn't say so, but I know it. It's impossible to utterly destroy humans and cockroaches. At least one pair always remains. As far as we elves are concerned, Athena is more explicit. Only those who follow the swallow will survive. The swallow, the symbol of spring, is the saviour. The one who will open the forbidden door, signal the way of salvation, and make possible the world's rebirth. The swallow, the child of the elder blood. You mean Siri? Geralt burst out. Or Siri's child? How? And why? Avalach seemed not to hear. The swallow of the elder blood, he said again. From her blood. Come and look. The statue Avalach pointed at stood out even among the other astoundingly realistic statues, most captured mid-movement or mid-gesture. The white marble she-elf reclining on the slab gave the impression that, having been awoken, she was about to sit up and get to her feet. Her face was turned towards the empty place by her side, and her raised hand seemed to be touching something invisible there was an expression of calm happiness on the she-elf's face. It was a long time before Avalach broke the silence. That is Lara Dorin ap Shiadal. It's not a grave, naturally, but a cenotaph. Does the statue's position surprise you? Support was not gained for the plan to carve both of the legendary lovers in marble, Lara and Kregenan of Lod. Kregenen was a man. It would be sacrilege to waste Amel marble on a statue of him. It would be blasphemy to erect a statue of a man here, in Tir Nabea Araina. On the other hand, it would be an even greater crime to deliberately destroy the memory of this emotion. So, a happy medium was found. Formerly, Kregenen is not here. And yet, he is in Lara's aspect and pose. The lovers are together. Nothing was able to separate them. Neither death, nor oblivion, nor hatred. It seemed to the Witcher that the elf's indifferent voice had changed for a moment. But that would have been impossible. Avalach approached the statue and stroked the marble arm with a cautious, gentle movement. Then he turned around, and the usual slightly sneering smile reappeared on his angular face. Do you know, Witcher, what the greatest snag of longevity is? No. Sex. What? You heard right. Sex. After almost a hundred years, it becomes boring. There is nothing in it to fascinate or excite any longer. Nothing that has the exciting appeal of novelty. It has all been done already. In this or that way, but it has happened. And then suddenly comes the conjunction of the spheres, and you, people, appear here. Human survivors come from another world, from your former world, which you managed utterly to destroy with your still hirsute hands, barely five million years after evolving as a species. There's only a handful of you. Your life expectancy is ridiculously low, so your survival depends on the pace of reproduction. Thus, unbridled lust never leaves you. Sex totally governs you. It's a drive more powerful even than the survival instinct. To die. Why not, if one can fuck around beforehand? That is your entire philosophy. Geralt didn't interrupt or comment, although he felt a strong desire to. And what suddenly happens? Avalach continued. Elves, bored by she-elves, 
caught the always willing human females. Bored she-elves give themselves out of perverse curiosity to human males, always full of vigor and verve. And something happens that no one can explain. She-elves, who normally ovulate once every ten or twenty years when copulating with a man, begin to ovulate with each powerful orgasm. Some hidden hormone or combination of hormones became active. She-elves certainly understand they can, in practice, only have children with humans. So, owing to the she-elves, we didn't exterminate you when we were still the more powerful race. And later... You were more powerful and began to exterminate us. But you still had allies in the she-elves, for they were the advocates of coexistence and cooperation. And they didn't want to admit that essentially it was about co-mingling. What does that? Geralt cleared his throat. Have to do with me? With you? Absolutely nothing. But with Siri. A great deal. For Siri is a descendant of Lara Doran Apshiadal, and Lara Doran was an advocate of coexistence with humans. Chiefly with one human, Kregenan of Lod, a human sorcerer. Lara Doran coexisted with Kregenan often and effectively. To put it more simply, she became pregnant. The witcher kept silent this time, too. The snag was that Lara Doran wasn't an ordinary she-elf. She was genetic potential, especially prepared. The result of many years' work, in combination with another charge, an elven one, naturally. She was meant to bear an even more special child. Engaging with the seed of a man, she ruined that chance, Wasted hundreds of years planning and preparation. At least, so it was thought at the time. No one supposed that the crossbreed begat by Kregenan could inherit anything positive from its pure blood mother. No, such a misalliance could not bring any good. For which reason, Geralt interjected, he was severely punished, not the way you think. Avalach glanced at him. Although the relationship between Lara Doran and Kregenen caused incalculable damage to the elves, and it could have turned out well for humans, it was, however, humans, and not elves, who murdered Kregenen. Humans and not elves brought Lara to ruin. Thus it was, despite the fact that many elves had reason to hate the lovers. Personally, for the second time, the slight change in the elf's voice puzzled Geralt. One way or another, Avalach continued, the peaceful coexistence burst like a soap bubble, and the races went for each other's throats. A war began, which endures until today, and meanwhile, Lara's genetic material exists as you've probably guessed, and has even developed. Unfortunately, it mutated. Yes, yes, your Siri is a mutant. This time again, the elf didn't wait for a comment. Of course, the sorcerers had a hand in this, cleverly combining breeding individuals into pairs, but it got out of control. Few can guess how Lara Doran's genetic material regenerated so powerfully in Siri, what the trigger was. I think it is known by Wilderfortz, the one who gave you a hiding on Thanith, the sorcerers who experimented with Lara and Rhiannon's progeny, running a veritable breeding farm, didn't get the expected results, so they became bored and abandoned the experiment. But the experiment continued just spontaneously. Siri, the daughter of Paveta, the granddaughter of Calanthe, the great-great-granddaughter of Rhiannon, was Lara Doran's true descendant. 
Wilgefortz learned about it, probably by accident. It is also known about by Enir Va Emris, the emperor of Nilfgaard. And you know about it. I know more about it than the two of them. But that means nothing. The mill of destiny is turning. The querns of fate are grinding. Whatever is destined must occur. So what must occur? Whatever is destined to. That which was determined above in the metaphorical sense, of course. Something that is determined by the action of an unerringly functioning mechanism, at the root of which lies the purpose, the plan, and the result. That's either poetry or metaphysics, or the one and the other, for they are occasionally difficult to distinguish. Are any hard facts possible, if only a very few? I'd love to discuss this and that with you, but it so happens I'm in a hurry. Avalach gave him a long look. And where are you hurrying to? Ah, forgive me. You, so it seems to me, haven't understood anything I've said to you. So I'll tell you straight. Your great rescue expedition is meaningless. It has lost all meaning. There are several reasons, the elf continued, looking at the witch's granite-like face. Firstly, it's too late now. The serious evil has already occurred. You're no longer in a position to save the girl from it. Secondly, now that she has taken the right road, the swallow will cope wonderfully by herself. She carries too mighty a force inside her to fear anything. She doesn't need your help. And thirdly... <clears throat> I'm all ears, Avalach. All ears. Thirdly... Thirdly, someone else will help her now. You can't be so arrogant as to think that the girl's destiny is exclusively bound to you. Is that all? Yes. Then farewell. Wait. I said I'm in a hurry. Let's suppose for a moment, the elf said serenely, that I know what will happen, that I can see the future. What if I tell you what is to happen, what will happen anyway, irrespective of the efforts you make, of the initiatives already undertaken? What if I told you that you could search for a peaceful place on earth and stay there doing nothing? waiting for the inevitable consequences of the course of events. Would you choose to do something like that? No. What if I communicated to you that your activities, testifying to your lack of faith in the unwavering mechanisms of the purpose, plan and result, may, though the likelihood is slight, indeed change something, but only for the worse? Would you reconsider? Oh, I see from your expression that you wouldn't. Then I'll simply ask you, why not? Do you really want to know? I do. Because I don't believe in your metaphysical platitudes about goals, plans and preordained ideas of creators. Nor do I believe in the celebrated prophecy of Athelina or other prophecies. I consider them, if you can imagine it, the same bullshit and humbug as your cave painting. The purple bison avalach. Nothing more. I don't know if you can't or won't help me. Nonetheless, I don't feel resentment towards you. You say I can't or don't want to help you. And how might I help? Geralt pondered for a moment, absolutely aware that much depended on how the question was put. Will I get Siri back? The answer was immediate. You will, only to lose her at once. And, to be clear, forever, irrevocably. Before it comes to that, you will lose everybody who accompanies you. You will lose one of your companions in the next few weeks, perhaps even days, perhaps even hours. Thank you. I haven't finished yet. 
the direct effect of your interference in the grinding quorns of the purpose and the plan will be the death of tens of thousands of people. Which, as a matter of fact, doesn't matter much, since soon after tens of millions of people will lose their lives. The world, as you know it, will simply vanish, cease to exist, in order, after a suitable time has passed, to revive in a totally different form. But in fact, no one has, nor will have, any influence on it. No one is capable of preventing it, nor staving off the course of events. Not you, not I, not sorcerers nor sages, not even Siri. What do you say to that? Purple bison. All the same, I thank you, Avalach. While we are about it, the elf shrugged, I'm somewhat curious as to what a pebble falling in the gears of the querns might accomplish. May I do anything else for you? Not really, because you can't show me Siri, I imagine. Who said so? Geralt held his breath. Avalach headed towards the cave wall with rapid steps, indicating the witcher to follow him. The walls of Tirnabea Arain, he pointed to the sparkling rock crystals, have special qualities, and I, though I say it as shouldn't, have special abilities. Place your hands on this. Fix your gaze on it. Think intensively about how much she needs you right now, and declare, so to speak, the mental willingness to help. Think about how you want to run and rescue her, be beside her, something like that. The image should appear by itself and be distinct. Look, but refrain from impulsive reactions. Say nothing. It will be a vision, not communication. He obeyed. The first images, in spite of the promise, weren't distinct. They were vague, but so brutal that he stepped back involuntarily. A severed hand on a table, blood splashed on a glazed surface, skeletons on skeleton horses, Yennefer in manacles. A tower? A black tower. And behind it, in the background, the northern lights? And suddenly, without warning, the image became all too clear. Dandelion, Geralt yelled. Milver, Angolem. Eh? Avalach took an interest. Ah, yes, you seem to have spoiled everything. Geralt leapt back from the cave wall, almost falling over on a basalt plinth. It doesn't bloody matter, he cried. Listen, Avalach, I must get to that druidic forest as quickly as possible. Kaid Mirkvid? Very likely. My companions are in mortal danger there. They're fighting for their lives. Other people are also in danger. What's the quickest way? Oh, damn it. I'm going back for my sword and horse. No horse, the elf calmly interrupted, is capable of carrying you to the Mirkvid before nightfall. But I, I haven't finished yet. Go and get your legendary sword, and meanwhile I'll find you a mount, a perfect steed for mountain tracks. It's a somewhat unusual one, I'd say, but with its help you'll be in Kaid Mirkvid in less than half an hour. The knocker reeked like a horse, but that was where the similarity ended. Geralt had once seen in Mahakam a mountain goat riding contest organized by dwarves, which had seemed to be a totally reckless sport. But it was only now as he sat on the back of the knocker, as it hurtled insanely up the cliff, that he learned what true recklessness was. In order not to fall off, he dug his fingers tightly into the rough shaggy coat and squeezed his thighs against the monster's fleecy sides. The knocker stank of sweat, urine and vodka. It flew as though possessed, the earth thudding under the impact of its gigantic feet as though its soles were of bronze. Slowing slightly, it climbed up hillsides and pelted down them so fast the wind howled in Geralt's ears. It rushed across ridges, mountain paths and ledges so narrow Geralt kept his eyes tightly closed so as not to look down. It cleared waterfalls, cascades, chasms and clefts too extreme even for a mountain goat and each successful leap was accompanied by a savage and deafening roar. 
That is, more savage and deafening than the knocker's usual roar, which was something it did almost constantly. Don't race like that! The rush of air shoved the words back down his throat. Why not? You've been drinking. <laughs> they raced on. The wind whistled in his ears. The knocker reeked. The clatter of immense feet on rock fell silent. Instead, rock fields and scree rattled. Then the ground became less rocky, and something that might have been a dwarf pine flashed by, then a blur of green and brown, for the knocker was loping in insane bounds through a fir forest. The scent of resin mingled with the monster's stench. <laughs> the firs ceased, and fallen leaves whispered, now red, now claret, ochre and golden. Slow down! <laughs> The knocker cleared a pile of fallen trees with a huge bound. Geralt almost bit his tongue off. The breakneck ride ended as unceremoniously as it had begun. The knocker dug its heels into the ground, roared and tossed the witcher onto the leaf-strewn forest floor. Geralt lay still for a while and couldn't even curse from lack of breath. Then he stood up, hissing and rubbing his knee, which had begun to throb again. You never fell off, the knocker stated, with surprise in its voice. Well, well. Geralt didn't comment. We've arrived. The knocker pointed with one shaggy paw. That's Kaid Mirgvid. Beneath them was a basin densely filled with mist. The tops of great trees showed through the haze. That fog. The knocker anticipated the question, sniffing. Isn't natural. What's more, I can smell smoke from over there. If I were you, I'd hurry. Yeah, I'd go with you. I'm sick with a desire to fight. And I dreamed as a child of one day charging at people with a witcher on me back. But Avalach forbade me from showing myself. It's to do with the safety of our whole tribe. I know. Don't bear a grudge that I smacked you in the mouth. I don't. You're all right, for a human. Thank you. Uh, for the lift, too. The knocker bared his teeth among his red beard and breathed vodka. The <laughs> pleasure's all mine. The fog lying on Mirkwood Forest was dense and had an irregular shape, calling to mind a heap of whipped cream squeezed onto a cake by a lunatic cook. The fog reminded the witcher of Brokilon. The forest of the Dryads was often covered by a similarly dense, protective and camouflaging magical haze. Like Brokilon, it had the dignified and menacing atmosphere of an ancient forest, here at the edge consisting predominantly of alder and beech. And, just like in Brokilon, right at the edge of the forest, on the leaf-strewn road, Geralt almost tripped over a corpse. The cruelly massacred people weren't druids or Nilfgaardians, and they certainly didn't belong to Nightingale and Skiru's Hassa. Before Geralt had even spied the outlines of wagons in the fog, he recalled that Rages had spoken of pilgrims. It appeared that for some, the pilgrimage had not ended happily. The stench of smoke and burning, unpleasant in the damp air, became more and more distinct and pointed the way. Soon after... The way was also indicated by voices, cries, and the discordant music of fiddles. Geralt made haste. A wagon stood on the rain-softened road. More bodies lay beside the wheels. One of the bandits was rummaging around the wagon, chucking objects and tackle onto the road. Another was holding the unharnessed horses, and a third was stripping a foxskin coat from a dead pilgrim. A fourth was sawing a fiddle with a bow, evidently found among the loot, and utterly failing to get even a single pure note from the instrument. The cacophony came in useful. It muffled Geralt's steps. The music broke off abruptly, 
The fiddle strings whined piercingly. The brigand slammed down onto the leaves and spattered them with blood. The one holding the horses didn't even manage to shout. The sile severed his windpipe. The third brigand didn't manage to jump down from the wagon. He fell, yelling with his femoral artery carved open. The last one even managed to draw his sword, but not to raise it. Geralt shook blood from the fuller with his thumb. Yes, boys, he said to the forest and the scent of smoke. This was a stupid idea. You oughtn't to have listened to Nightingale and Skiru. You should have stayed at home. He soon came across further wagons and further victims. Druids in blood-stained white robes also lay among the numerous mutilated pilgrims. The smoke from the now close fire crawled low over the ground. This time, the brigands were more vigilant. He only managed to stalk one of them, who was occupied pulling cheap rings and bracelets from the bloody hands of a murdered woman. Geralt, without hesitation, slashed the bandit. The bandit roared, and then the remaining men, brigands mixed up with Nilfgaardians, attacked him, yelling. He dodged into the forest to the foot of the nearest tree so the trunk would protect his back. But before the brigands could run over, hooves studded, and from the bushes and fog emerged a mighty horse draped in a caparison with a red and gold diagonal checkered pattern. The horse was carrying a rider clad in full armour, a snow-white cloak, and a helmet with a perforated pig-faced visor. Before the bandits could compose themselves, the knight was already breathing down their necks and carving every which way with his sword, and blood was gushing in fountains. It was a splendid sight. Geralt didn't have time to watch, however, having two on his hands himself, a brigand in a cherry-red jerkin and a black-uniformed Nilfgaardian. The brigand exposed himself as he lunged, so Geralt slashed him across the face, and the Nilfgaardian, seeing teeth flying, took to his heels and vanished into the fog. Geralt was almost trampled by the horse in the checkered caparison, now running and riderless. Without delaying, he leapt through the undergrowth towards cries, curses and thudding. Three bandits had dragged the knight in the white cloak from the saddle and were trying to kill him. One of them, standing with legs astride, was smiting with a poleaxe. The second was striking with a sword, and the third, small and red-haired, was hopping beside them like a hare, seeking a chance and an unprotected place where he could stab with his bear spear. The knight, lying on his back, was yelling incomprehensibly from inside his helmet and deflecting the blows with a shield held in both hands. The shield sank lower with each blow. It was almost resting on his breastplate. There was no doubt. One or two more blows and the knight's innards would burst through every slit in his armour. Geralt was in the thick of it in three bounds, slashing the hopping redhead with the bear spear across the nape and carving open the belly of the one with a poleaxe. The knight, agile in spite of his armour, whacked the third brigand in the knee with a shield rim and pummeled him thrice in the face as he lay on the ground until blood sprayed across his shield. He rose onto his knees, fumbled among ferns in search of his sword, buzzing like a great iron-plated drone. He suddenly saw Geralt and froze. In whose hands am I? He trumpeted from deep within his helmet. In no one's. The men lying there are also my foes. Aha! The knight tried to raise his visor, but the metal plate was bent and the mechanism had blocked. Upon my word, thank you a hundredfold for your succor. I thank you, for it was you who came to my aid. Indeed? When? He didn't see anything, thought Geralt. He hadn't even noticed me through the holes in that iron pot. What is your name? the knight asked. Geralt, of Rivia. Coat of arms? It is not the time, said knight, for heraldry. Upon my word, tis the truth, stout-hearted Sir Geralt. Having found his sword, the knight stood up. His chipped shield, like the horse's caparison, was decorated with a gold and red diagonal checkered pattern, the letters A and H alternating in the fields. They are not my ancestral arms, he boomed in explanation. They are the initials of my suzerain lady, Duchess Anna Henearetta. I'm called the Checkered Knight. I'm a knight errant, and forbidden from revealing my name or arms. I have taken knightly vows. Pon my word, thanks again for the help, Sir Knight. The pleasure's all mine. One of the defeated bandits groaned and rustled in the leaves. The checkered knight leapt and pinned him to the ground with a mighty thrust. The brigand's arms and legs waved like a spider impaled on a pin. Let us hurry, 
the knight said. The rabble is still raging here. Upon my word, it's not time to repose yet. True, Geralt agreed. There's a gang marauding through the forest, killing pilgrims and druids. My friends are in a predicament. Excuse me for a moment. A second brigand was showing signs of life. He was also vigorously pinned, and his turned-up feet cut such a caper that his boots fell off. Upon my word! The checkered knight wiped his sword on the moss. These good-for-nothings are loath to depart this life. Let it not astound you, Sir Knight, that I'm finishing off wounded. Upon my word, I've not done it for many years. But these imps recover so swiftly, an honest fellow may only envy them. Ever since I happened to cross swords with the same rascal thrice in a row, I began to finish them off more meticulously, once and for all. I understand. I, you see, am errant, but not, upon my word, erratic. <laughs> oh, it's my horse. Come here, Bucephalus. The forest became more open and brighter. Great oaks with spreading but thin crowns began to predominate. They could now smell the smoke and stench of the fire nearby, and a moment later they could see it. Three cottages with thatched roofs, an entire small settlement, were on fire. The tarpaulins of the nearby wagons were also on fire. Corpses were lying between the wagons. From a distance, it was evident that many were wearing white druidic gowns. The bandits and Nilfgaardians, drumming up courage by yelling and concealed behind wagons they were pushing in front of them, were attacking a large house on stilts, leaning against the trunk of a gigantic oak. The house was built from robust beams, with a shingle roof down which the torches thrown by the bandits were harmlessly rolling. The besieged house was defending itself and striking back effectively. Before Geralt's eyes, one of the brigands leaned imprudently out from behind a wagon and fell as though struck by lightning with an arrow in his skull. Your friends, the checkered knight displayed his acuity, must be in that building. Upon my word, they're in desperate straits. Onward, let us hasten to their aid. Geralt heard screeching yells and orders and recognized the robber Nightingale with his bandaged cheek. He also glimpsed the half-elf Shkiru hiding behind some Nilfgaardians in black cloaks. Suddenly, horns roared so loudly that leaves fell from the oak trees. The hooves of war horses rumbled and the swords and armor of charging knights flashed. The robbers fled, yelling in all directions. Pon my word, the checkered knight roared, spurring on his horse. It's my comrades. They're ahead of us. Attack, so a little glory will be left for us. Smite, kill. Galloping ahead on Bucephalus, the checkered knight fell on the fleeing robbers, hacked down two in a flash, and scattered the rest like a hawk among sparrows. Two of them turned towards Geralt, and the witcher dealt with them in the blink of an eye. A third shot at him with a Gabriel. A certain Gabriel, a craftsman from Verden, had invented and patented a miniature crossbow. He advertised them with the slogan, Defend yourself! His handbill declared, Banditry and violence are rampant among us. The law is powerless and inept. Defend yourself! Don't leave home without a handy Gabriel crossbow. A Gabriel is your guardian. A Gabriel will protect you and your dear ones from bandits. Sales were phenomenal. Soon every bandit packed a Gabriel during robberies. Geralt was a witcher and could dodge a bolt, but he'd forgotten about his painful knee. His evasive maneuver was an inch late, and the leaf-shaped point gashed his ear. The pain blinded him, but just for a moment. The brigand was too slow to reload and defend himself. The furious witcher slashed him across the hands and then disemboweled him with a sweeping flourish of his sile. Geralt hadn't even managed to wipe the blood from his ear and neck when he was attacked by a small character as agile as a weasel with unnaturally shining eyes armed with a curved Zeracanian sabre which he was twirling with admirable skill. He parried two of Geralt's blows and the fine steel of the two blades rang and showered sparks. The weasel was alert and keen-eyed he noticed at once that the witcher was limping. He immediately began to circle and attack from a more favourable position. He was astonishingly quick. The sabre's blade seemed to wail as he made dangerous diagonal thrusts. Geralt was finding it more and more difficult to avoid the blows. He was limping worse and worse, forced to stand on his aching leg. The weasel suddenly hunched forward, jumped, and made a dexterous feint and lunge, slashing diagonally downwards. Geralt parried obliquely and deflected. 
The bandit spun nimbly, moving from his stance to a nasty cut from below, when he suddenly goggled, sneezed loudly, and covered himself in snot, dropping his guard for a moment. The witcher jabbed him fast in the neck, and the blade went in as far as the vertebrae. Well, who'll tell me now? He panted, looking at the twitching corpse. That taking drugs isn't bad for your health. A bandit attacking him with a raised club tripped and fell face down in the mud, an arrow sticking out of the back of his head. I'm coming, witcher! Milva screamed. I'm coming! Hold on! Geralt turned, but there was no one left to hack. Milva had shot the only brigand remaining in the vicinity. The rest fled into the forest, pursued by the colourful knighthood. Several were being tormented by the chequered knight on Bucephalus. He caught them, and his terrible raging could be heard from the forest. One of the black-uniformed Nilfgaardians, not finished off precisely, suddenly leapt to his feet and bolted. Milva raised and tautened her bow in a second. The fletchings howled, and the Nilfgaardian fell on the leaves with a grey-feathered arrow between his shoulder blades. The archer sighed heavily. We'll hang for this, she said. Why do you think so? This is Nilfgaard, isn't it? And it's the second month I've been mainly shooting at Nilfgaardians. This is Tucson, not Nilfgaard. Geralt felt the side of his head and took away a bloody hand. Damn it. What is it? Have a look, Milva. The archer examined it carefully and critically. Your ear's been torn off, she finally said. Nothing to worry about. Easy for you to say. I was fond of that ear. Help me to bind it with something. It's dripping down my collar. Where are Dandelion and Angle M? In the cottage with the pilgrims. Oh, a pox on it. Hooves pounded, and from the mist emerged three riders on war horses, cloaks and pennants fluttering as they galloped. Before their war cries resounded, Geralt had grabbed Milva by the arm and pulled her under a wagon. There was no fooling around with someone charging with a lance, which gave the riders an effective range of ten feet in front of their horse's head. Get out! The knight's mounts churned the earth around the wagon with their horseshoes. Drop your weapons and get out. We're going to hang, Milva murmured. She might have been right. Ha! Thugs! One of the knights, bearing a shield with a black bull's head on a silver field, roared. Ha! Rogues! Pon my word, you shall hang! Pon my word, crowed the other, with a uniformly blue shield in a youthful voice. We'll carve them up on the spot. Hi, I say, stop. The checkered knight emerged from the fog on Bucephalus. He had finally managed to lift his twisted visor, from beneath which luxuriant flaxen moustaches now peeped. Free them with all haste, he called. They are not bandits, but upright and honest folk. The lady manfully acted in defense of the pilgrims, and that fellow is a goodly knight. A goodly knight? Bull's head raised his visor and scrutinized Geralt extremely incredulously. Pon my word, it cannot be. Pon my word, the checkered knight thumped an armored fist into his breastplate. It can, I give my word. This doughty fellow saved my life when I was in need, after I was flung to the ground by ne'er-do-wells. He is called Geralt of Rivia. Arms? I'm forbidden from revealing them. The witcher grunted. I can share neither my true name nor my arms. I have taken knightly vows. I am the errant Geralt. Oh! A familiar insolent voice suddenly yelled. Look what the cat dragged in. Ha! I told you, Auntie, that the witcher would come and rescue us. And just in time, shouted Dandelion, approaching with Angoulême and a small group of terrified pilgrims. He was carrying his loot and the ever-present tube of scrolls. And not a second too soon. You have a fine sense of drama, Geralt. You ought to write plays for the stage. He suddenly fell silent. Bull's head leaned over in his saddle, and his eyes shone. Thy Count Julian? Baron de Pirac Piran? Two more knights emerged from behind the oaks. One in a great helm, adorned with a very good likeness of a white swan with outstretched wings, was leading two prisoners in a lasso. The other knight, errant but practical, was preparing a noose and looking for a suitable bow. Neither nightingale, Angoulême noticed the witch's expression, nor Skiru. Pity. Pity, Geralt admitted, but we'll try to correct that. Sir Knight. But Bull's head 
or rather, Baron de Perak Peran, wasn't paying any attention to him. He only had eyes, it seemed, for Dandelion. Pon my word, he drawled, my eyes do not deceive me. It's Viscount Julian in person. Ha! The Duchess will be pleased. Who is Viscount Julian? the Witcher asked curiously. Uh, that uh, would be me, Dandelion muttered. Uh, don't interfere, Geralt. Lady Henrietta will be pleased, Baron de Perak Peran repeated. Ha! Ah, upon my word, we shall take you all to Beauclair Castle. But no excuses, Viscount. I won't hear of any excuse. Some of the brigands fled. Geralt spoke in quite a cool tone. I suggest we catch them first, and then think about what to do with this day. So, interestingly begun. What say you, Baron? Upon my word, said Bull's Head, nothing will come of it. Pursuit is impossible. The criminals fled across the stream, and we mustn't put a foot over it, not even a scrap of hoof. That part of the Mercovid Forest is an inviolable sanctuary, in accordance with the compacts entered into with the Druids by Her Majesty Duchess Anna Henrietta, who benignly reigns over Tucson. The robbers bolted in there, damn it! Geralt interrupted, growing furious. They're going into that inviolable sanctuary to kill, and you're telling me about some compacts. We've given our knightly word. It seemed a mutton head would have suited Baron de Perak Peran's shield better than a bull's head. We are for bad. Compacts. Not a single step onto druidic territory. If they're forbidden, well, that's too bad, Angulem snorted, pulling two bandit horses by their bridles. Drop that empty talk, Witcher. Let's go. I still have unfinished business with Nightingale, and you, I think, would like to talk some more with the half-elf. I'm with you, said Melva. I'll just find some mare or other. Me too, Dandelion muttered. I I'm with you too. Oh, no, 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 called the bull-headed baron. Upon my word, Viscount Julian will ride with us to Beauclair Castle. The Duchess wouldn't forgive us if after meeting you we didn't bring you to her. I shan't stop the rest of you. You are free in your plans and ideas. As the companions of Viscount Julian, her grace, Lady Henrietta, would have gladly received you with all due respect and invited you to stay at the castle. But why, if you scorn her hospitality, we scorn it not. Geralt interrupted with a menacing glance, restraining Angoulême, who was making insulting gestures with her hand behind the baron's back. Far be it from us to scorn it. We shall not fail to pay our respects and due homage to the Duchess. But first, we will accomplish what we must accomplish. We also gave our word. One might say that we've also made compacts. Once we have carried them out, we shall make for Beauclair Castle. We shall unfailingly go there. If only he added knowingly and with emphasis, to ensure that no disgrace or dishonour befalls our comrade, Dandelion. I, I meant Julian, by thunder. Upon my word, the Baron suddenly laughed. No disgrace nor dishonour will befall Viscount Julian. I'm prepared to give my word on it, for I omitted to tell you, Viscount, that Duke Raymond died of apoplexy two years past. Ha! Ha! Dandelion shouted, beaming all over. The Duke kicked the bucket? Oh, these are truly marvellous and joyous tidings. I mean, I meant to say, sorrow and grief, a great loss. Uh, may the earth lie lightly on him. If that is the case, let's ride with all haste to Beauclair, noble knights. Geralt, Milver and Angoulême, I'll see you in the castle. They forded the stream and spurred the horses into the forest among spreading oaks and stirrup-high ferns. Milva found the trail of the fleeing gang without difficulty. They rode as quickly as they could, for Geralt feared for the druids. He was afraid the survivors of the gang, feeling safe, would want to seek vengeance on the druids for the massacre sustained from the knights errant of Toussaint. Well, dandelions come up trumps, Angoulême suddenly said. When Nightingale's men surrounded us in that cottage, he told me what he feared in Toussaint. I guessed, the witcher replied. I just didn't know he'd aimed so high. The Duchess, oh. It was a good few years ago, and Duke Raymond, the one who croaked, had apparently sworn he'd tear out the poet's heart, have it roasted, and make his inconstant Duchess eat it for supper. Dandelion's lucky he didn't fall into the Duke's clutches while he was still alive. We're also lucky. That remains to be seen. Dandelion claims that Duchess Henrietta is madly in love with him. 
Dandelion always claims that. Shut your traps, Nilva snapped, reining in her horse and reaching for her bow. A brigand rushed blindly towards them without a hat, weaving from oak to oak. He was running, falling over, getting up and running again, and screaming. Shrilly, dreadfully, awfully. What the? Angulem asked in astonishment. Milva tautened her bow in silence. She didn't shoot, but waited until the brigand approached and rushed straight for them, as though he couldn't see them. He ran between the horses of the witcher and Angulem. They saw his face, as white as a sheet and contorted in horror. They saw his bulging eyes. What the? Angulem repeated. Milva recovered from her astonishment, turned in the saddle and sent an arrow into the fleeing man's back. The brigand roared and tumbled into the ferns. The earth shook, making acorns fall from a nearby oak. I wonder, said Angoulême, what he was fleeing from. The earth shook again. The bushes rustled and broken branches cracked. What is it? Milva stammered, standing up in her stirrups. What is it, witcher? Geralt looked, saw it and sighed loudly. Angoulême also saw it and paled. Oh, fuck! Milva's horse also saw it. It neighed wildly, reared, and then bucked. The archer flew from the saddle and sprawled heavily onto the ground. The horse raced into the forest. Without a second thought, the witcher's steed rushed after it, unfortunately choosing a path under an overhanging oak branch. The branch toppled the witcher from the saddle. The impact and the pain in his knee almost made him lose consciousness. Angoulême managed to stay in control of her frenzied horse the longest, but finally she too ended up on the ground, and her horse fled, almost trampling Milva as she was getting up. And they saw more clearly the thing that was coming for them, and absolutely, absolutely lost their astonishment at the animal's panic. The creature resembled a gigantic tree, a branching ancient oak. Perhaps it was an oak, but if so, it was a very unusual oak. Instead of standing somewhere in a clearing among fallen leaves and acorns, instead of letting squirrels scamper over it and linnets shit on it, this oak was marching briskly through the forest, stamping its sturdy roots steadily and waving its boughs. The stout trunk, or torso, of the monster had a diameter of more or less four yards, and the hollow gaping in it was probably not a hollow, but it's more, for it was snapping with a sound like the slamming of a heavy door. Though the ground trembled beneath its terrible weight, making it difficult for them to keep their balance, the creature was loping through the ravines quite nimbly, and it wasn't doing it aimlessly. In front of their eyes, the monster swung its boughs, swished its branches, and plucked from a pit a bandit who was cowering there, just as deftly as a stork plucks a frog hidden in the grass. Entwined in the branches, the thug hung among the boughs, howling pitifully. Geralt saw that the monster was carrying three brigands, caught in the same way, and one Nilfgaardian. Run! he moaned, vainly trying to stand. He felt as though someone was banging a white-hot nail into his knee with the rhythmic blows of a hammer. Milva! Angolem! Run! We won't leave you! The tree creature heard them, stamped its roots joyfully and rushed towards them. Angolem, vainly trying to lift Geralt, swore hideously. With trembling hands, Milva tried to knock an arrow on the bowstring, quite pointlessly. Run away! It was already too late. The tree creature was upon them. Paralyzed by terror, they could now see its prey. Four robbers hanging in a tangle of branches. Two were still alive, for they were emitting hoarse croaks and kicking their legs. The third, probably unconscious, was hanging limply. The monster was clearly trying to catch its prey alive but it had been unsuccessful with the fourth, and it had inadvertently squeezed too hard, which was obvious from its victim's bulging eyes and distended tongue, which was flopping down over a chin, soiled with blood and vomit. The next second they were hanging in the air, tangled in the branches, all three of them howling to high heaven. Grace! 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 They heard from below near the roots. Grace! Grace, little tree. A young druidess in a white robe with a flower wreath on her head strode behind the tree creature, driving it lightly with a leafy twig. Don't harm them, little tree. Don't squeeze. Gently, 
graves, graves, graves. We aren't brigands, Geralt grunted from above, barely able to produce a sound from his chest, which was being crushed by the bow. Order it to let us go. We're innocent. They all say that. The druidess shooed away a little butterfly, fluttering around her brow. Grace, Grace, Grace. I've pissed myself, Angoulême whimpered. I've bloody pissed myself. Milva only wheezed. Her head was lolling on her chest. Geralt swore vilely. It was the only thing he could do. Driven by the druidess, the tree creature ran jauntily through the forest. During the run, all of the prisoners, at least those that were conscious, teeth were chattering to the rhythm of the creature's leaps, so loudly it echoed. After a short while, they were in a large clearing. Geralt saw a group of white-robed druids, and beside them, another tree creature. The other had a poorer collection. Only three bandits hung from its boughs, and probably only one was still alive. Oh, criminals, malefactors, oh, contemptible ones, declaimed one of the druids from below. He was an old man resting on a long crozier. Observe carefully. See what punishment befalls criminals and base individuals in Mirkvin Forest. Look on and remember. We shall release you that you might tell others about what you will soon behold as a warning. In the very centre of the clearing stood a cage woven from wicker, a great human-shaped effigy upon a huge pile of logs and faggots. The cage was full of yelling and struggling people. The witcher could clearly hear the frog-like croaking of the robber Nightingale, hoarse with terror. He saw the face of the half-elf Skiru, as white as a sheet and contorted in panicked fear, pressed against the wicker lattice. Druids! Geralt yelled, putting all his strength into the cry in order to be heard despite the general clamour. Lady Flaminica, I am the witcher Geralt! I beg your pardon, responded a tall, thin woman, with hair the colour of grey steel falling over her back, bound around her brow with a wreath of mistletoe. I... I'm Geralt, the Witcher, a friend of Emil Regis. Again, please. I didn't catch that. Geralt, a friend of the vampires. Oh, you ought to have said so at once. At a sign from the druidess, the tree creature put them on the ground, not very gently. Milva was unconscious, with blood dripping from her nose. Geralt stood up with difficulty and kneeled before her. The steely-haired Flaminica stood beside them and gave a slight cough. Her face was very lean, even haggard, evoking unpleasant associations of a skull covered in skin. Her cornflower blue eyes were kind and gentle. I believe she has broken ribs, she said, looking at Milva. But we shall soon remedy that. Our healers will give her help immediately. I regret what has happened. But how was I to know who you were? I didn't invite you to Kaid Merkvid or give my permission for you to enter our sanctuary. Emil Regis vouched for you admittedly, but the presence of a witcher in our forest, a paid killer of living creatures... I shall get out of here without a moment's delay, Honourable Flaminica, Geralt assured her. As soon as I... He broke off, seeing druids with flaming torches walking up to the pyre and the effigy full of people. No! he cried, clenching his fists. Stop! That cage, said the Flaminica, seeming not to hear him, was originally meant to serve as a winter manger for starving animals, was meant to have stood in the forest, stuffed with hay. But when we seized those scoundrels, I recalled the nasty rumours and calumnies which people spread about us. Very well, I thought. You can have your wicker hag. You made it up as a horrific nightmare, so I shall treat you to that nightmare. Order them to stop, the witcher gasped. Honourable Flaminica, don't set light to it. One of the bandits has important information for me. The Flaminica folded her arms on her chest. Her cornflower blue eyes were still soft and gentle. Oh, no, she said dryly. No chance. I don't believe in the institution of turning imperial evidence. 
wriggling out of a punishment is immoral. Stop! the witcher yelled. Don't set fire to it! Stop! The Flaminica made a short gesture with her hand, and Little Tree, still standing nearby, stamped down its roots and laid a bow on the witch's shoulder. Geralt sat down with a thump. Light it, the Flaminica ordered. I'm sorry, witcher, but it must be thus. We druids cherish and venerate life in all its forms, but sparing the lives of criminals is sheer stupidity. Only terror deters criminals, so we shall give them an example of it. I pin great hopes on not having to repeat this example. The brushwood caught fire in an instant. The pyre belched smoke and flames leapt up. The yelling and screaming coming from the wicker hag made the witch's hair stand on end. Of course, it was impossible among the cacophony, made louder by the crackle of the fire. But it seemed to Geralt that he could make out Nightingale's desperate croaking and the high-pitched, pain-filled shrieks of the half-elf Shkiru. The half-elf had been right, he thought. Death isn't always the same. And then, after a terribly long time, the pyre and the wicker hag mercifully exploded into an inferno of roaring fire, a fire in which nothing could survive. Your medallion, Geralt, said Angulem, standing beside him. Eh? He cleared his throat, for his throat was tight. What did you say? Your silver medallion with the wolf. Skiru had it. Now you've lost it forever. It'll melt in that heat. Too bad, he said a moment later, looking into the Flaminica's cornflower blue eyes. I'm no longer a witcher. I've stopped being a witcher. I've learned that now. On Thaned, in the Tower of the Seagull. In Brokilon, on the bridge on the Yaruga. In the cave beneath Gorgon. And here, in Mirkvid Forest. No, I'm not a witcher now so I'll have to learn to manage without my medallion. The king loved the queen boundlessly, and she loved him with all her heart. Something so fair had to finish unhappily. Florence Delanois, Fairy Tales and Stories Delanois, Florence, linguist and historian, born 1432 in Vicovaro, in the years 1460 to 1475, secretary and librarian to the imperial court. Indefatigable scholar of legends and folk tales, he wrote many treatises considered classics of ancient language and literature of the empire's northern regions. His most important works are Myths and Legends of the Peoples of the North, Fairy Tales and Stories, The Surprise or the Myth of the Elder Blood, A Saga about a Witcher, and The Witcher and the Witcher Girl or the Endless Search, from 1476, professor at the Academy in Castelgrappia, where he died in 1510. Effenberg and Talbot, Encyclopedia Maxima Mundi, Volume 4. Chapter 8 A strong wind blew in from the sea, ruffling the sails, and a drizzle like thin hail stung the voyagers' faces painfully. The water in the great canal was leaden, rippled by the wind and flecked by a rash of rain. Come this way, Zaya, the boat is waiting. Dykstra sighed heavily. He was thoroughly sick of the sea voyage. He'd been delighted by those few moments on the hard and solid rock wharf, and he was pissed off at the thought of stepping onto a wobbly deck once again. But what else to do? Lan Exeter, Covier's winter capital, differed fundamentally from the world's other capital cities. In the harbour of Lanexeter, travellers arriving by sea disembarked onto the stone quay, only to immediately embark onto another craft, a slender many-oared boat with a highly upturned prow and slightly lower stern. Lanexeter was built on the water, in the wide estuary of the river Targo. The city had canals instead of streets, and all municipal transportation was by boat. He got in, greeting the Radanian ambassador waiting for him by the gangway. The boat was pushed away from the quay. The oars struck the water evenly. The boat moved off and picked up speed. The Radanian ambassador said nothing. 
Ambassador, Dykstra thought mechanically. For how many years had Rodania been sending ambassadors to Kovir? A hundred and twenty at most. For a hundred and twenty years, Kovir and Povis had been foreign to Rodania, though it hadn't always been that way. From time immemorial, Rodania had treated the countries in the north, on the Gulf of Praxida, as part of its fiefdom. Kovir and Povis were, it was said at the Tretagorian court, the greatest protectorates in the crown dominions. Successive earls were called Troydonids, since they were descended, or so they claimed, from their common forebear, Troydon. Prince Troydon had been the natural brother of Radovid I, king of Redania, later called the Great. Even in his youth, Troydon was already a lewd and extremely beastly character. People were afraid when they realised he would develop with time. King Radovid, no exception in this regard, detested his brother like the plague. He thus appointed him Earl of Kovir in order to be rid of him, to move him as far away as possible, and nowhere was further away than Kovir. Earl Troydon was formerly a liegeman of Redania, but an atypical one. He didn't bear any feudal obligations or duties. Why? He didn't even have to take the ceremonial feudal oath. All that was demanded of him was a pledge of no interference. Some said that Radovid simply pitied his brother, knowing that the Koviran protectorate couldn't afford to pay tax or raise armies. Others, though, claimed Radovid simply wanted the Earl out of his sight. The thought that his younger brother might turn up in Traitagor in person with money or military aid made him sick. No one knew what was true, but so it was, and so it remained. Many years after the death of Radovid I, the law established by the great king was still binding in Redania. Firstly, the county of Kovir was a vassal, but did not have to pay or serve. Secondly, the Koviran inheritance was in the exclusive control of the House of Troyton. Thirdly, Traitagor did not interfere in the affairs of the House of Troyton. Fourthly, members of the House of Troyton were not invited to Traitagor for ceremonies celebrating state holidays. Fifthly, nor for any other occasion. Essentially, few knew and few were interested in what went on in the north. News about conflicts between Kovir and smaller northern rulers reached Redania, mainly by a roundabout route through Kaidwen. About alliances and wars with Hengfors, Maliore, Creden, Talgar, and other lands with difficult-to-remember names. Someone conquered someone else and swallowed them up. Someone allied with someone else in a dynastic union. Someone routed and subjugated someone else. Essentially, no one knew who, whom, or why. However, news about wars and battles lured to the north a whole myriad of brawlers, adventurers, thrill-seekers, and other restless spirits looking for plunder and the chance to blow off steam. They were drawn there from all the corners of the world even from countries as distant as Sintra and Rivia. But they were, above all, citizens of Redania and Kaidwen. Entire cavalry squadrons came to Kovir, in particular from Kaidwen. Rumour even trumpeted that the notorious Aideen, the rebellious illegitimate daughter of the Kaidwenian monarch, rode at the head of one of them. In Redania, it was said that designs were forming at the court of Ard Karich for the annexation of the northern country and severing it from the Redanian crown. Some even began clamouring for armed intervention. Traitagor, however, ostentatiously announced that the North didn't interest it. As the royal jurists deemed, the principle of mutuality applied. The Kovirid state had no obligations to the Crown, so the Crown wouldn't come to Kovir's aid, all the more so since Kovir had never asked for any help. Meanwhile, Kovir and Povis had emerged stronger and more powerful from the wars waged in the North. Few knew about that back then. A clearer signal of the North's growing might was a more and more vigorous export market. For decades it had been said of Kovir that the land's only wealth was sand and seawater. That joke was recalled when production from the Kovirian foundries and salt works virtually monopolised the world's glass and salt markets. But although hundreds of people drank from glasses with the mark of the Kovirian foundries and seasoned their soup with Povis salt, in people's awareness it was still an extremely distant, inaccessible, harsh and hostile land, and above all, foreign. In Redania and Kaidwin, rather than go to hell, people said, get to Povis, 
If you don't like working for me, a master would say to his unruly journeyman, the path's clear to Corvier. We won't have Corvier in order here, shouted a schoolmaster at his disobedient and boisterous pupils. Go mouth off him, Povis, called a farmer to his son, when he was critical of his forefather's ard and swidden agriculture. If anyone doesn't like the old order, the roads open to Covia. The recipients of these statements slowly, very slowly, began to ponder them, and soon noticed that indeed nothing, absolutely nothing, was barring their way to Covia and Povis. A second wave of emigration set off for the north. Just like the previous one, this one mainly consisted of discontented mavericks who were different and wanted things done differently. But this time, they weren't troublemakers and misfits at odds with life. Well, at least not all of them. Scholars who believed in their theories, although they'd been shouted down and called demented, headed north. Technicians and constructors convinced that, contrary to popular opinion, it was possible to build the machines and devices invented by the scholars. Sorcerers, for whom the use of magic to erect breakwaters wasn't a sacrilegious offence. Merchants, for whom the prospect of a growth in turnover was capable of exploding the rigid, static and short-sighted limits of risk. Farmers and stock breeders convinced that one could create fertile fields from even the worst soil, that it was always possible to breed varieties of animals in a given climate. Miners and geologists, for whom the bleakness of Covia's barren mountains and rocks was an infallible signal that if there was such paucity on the surface, there must be wealth beneath, also headed north. For nature loves equilibrium. There was wealth beneath those wastes. A quarter of a century passed, and Covia had extracted as many minerals as Rodania, Adian and Kaidwin taken together. Only Mahakam surpassed Kovir in the extraction and processing of iron ore, but transports full of metal serving the production of alloys went from Kovir to Mahakam. Kovir and Povis accounted for a quarter of the world's yield of silver, nickel, lead, tin and zinc, half of the extraction of copper ore and native copper, three quarters of the yield of manganese, chromium, titanium and tungsten ores, and the same amount of metals occurring only in their native form, platinum, ferroarum, cryobilithium, and dimeritium, and more than 80% of the world's gold production, gold with which Covia and Povis bought what didn't grow or wasn't bred in the north, and what Covia and Povis didn't produce, not because they were unable to or didn't have the expertise, but because it didn't pay. A craftsman from Covia or Povis, the son or grandson of an immigrant who went there with a bindle on his back, now earned fourfold that of his counterpart in Redania or Temeria. Kovir traded and wanted to trade with the whole world on a greater and greater scale. But it couldn't. Radovid III became king of Redania and shared with Radovid the Great, his great-grandfather, the same name as well as the same cunning and miserliness. That king, called the Bold by faunas and hagiographers and Rufus by everybody else, had observed what none before him had wanted to. Why didn't Redania have a single farthing of the gigantic trade engaged in by Kovir? Why, Kovir was just a meaningless county, a fiefdom, a tiny jewel in the Redanian crown. It was time the Kovirian vassal began to serve its suzerain. A wonderful opportunity occurred to do so. Redania had a border dispute with Adian, as usual concerning the Pontar Valley. Radovid III was determined to take up arms and began to prepare for it. He promulgated a special tax for military purposes, called the Pontar Tithe. All of his subjects and vassals were to pay it, without exception, Kovir included. Rufus rubbed his hands. Ten percent of Kovir's income, that was something. Rodanian emissaries made for Pont Vanis, imagined as a small town with a wooden palisade, they communicated astonishing news to Rufus on their return. Pont Vanis wasn't a small town. It was a great city, the summer capital of Kovia, whose ruler, King Jedovius, sent King Radovid the following answer. The kingdom of Kovia is no one's vassal. Radania's petitions and claims are groundless and based on the dead letter of a law which never had any force. The kings of Redania have never been the overlords of Kovia, for the rulers of Kovia, as can easily be checked in the annals, have never paid Redania tribute, have never carried out military servitude, and, 
most importantly, have never been invited to celebrations of state holidays or any others. Therefore, the King of Kovir informed the emissaries, with regret, that he could not recognize King Radovid as his seigneur or suzerain, much less pay him a tithe. Nor could any of the Kovirin vassals or Arriere vassals, which were subject exclusively to the Kovirin suzerainty. In short, let Redania mind its own business and not stick its nose into the affairs of Kovir, a sovereign kingdom. Cold fury welled up in Rufus. A sovereign kingdom? A foreign land? Very well. We shall deal with Kovir as we would any foreign province. Redania, along with Kaidwen and Temeria, incited by Rufus, applied against Kovir a retaliatory tax and ruthless right of storage. A merchant from Kovir, heading southward, had to, whether he liked it or not, put all his goods on sale in one of Redania's cities and sell it or return home. That same constraint faced a merchant from the distant south when making for Kovir. Redania demanded heavy duty on goods which Kovir shipped by sea, even if they were not calling it Redanian or Temerian ports. Kovirian ships naturally didn't want to pay, and only those who didn't manage to escape paid. The game of cat and mouse begun on the sea quickly led to an incident. A Redanian patrol craft tried to arrest a Kovirian merchant. Two Kovirian frigates appeared, the patrol craft went up in flames. There were casualties. The line had been overstepped. Radovid decided to discipline his disobedient vassal. A 4,000-strong Redanian army crossed the River Brea, and an expeditionary force from Kaidwen invaded Cairngorm. After a week, the 2,000 surviving Redanians crossed the Brea the other way, and the poorly-equipped survivors of the Kaidwenian corps trudged home across the passes of the Kestrel Mountains. This had revealed a further purpose which the Northern Gold served. Kovir's permanent army consisted of 25,000 professionals seasoned by combat and banditry, as well as mercenaries drafted from the far corners of the world, unreservedly loyal to the Kovirian crown for their exceptionally generous pay and a pension guaranteed by contract, prepared for any risk for the exceptionally generous bonuses paid out after every victorious battle. Further, these wealthy soldiers were led in battle by experienced, able, and now extremely wealthy, commanders, whom Rufus and King Benda of Kaidwen knew very well. They were the same ones who not long before had served in their armies, but had unexpectedly retired and gone abroad. Rufus was no fool and could learn from his mistakes. He quelled his swaggering remaining generals who were demanding a crusade. Ignored the merchants calling for a starvation blockade and mollified Benda of Kaidwen, who was greedy for blood and revenge for the extermination of his elite unit. Rufus initiated negotiations, unrestrained by the prospect of humiliation, by the bitter pill he had to swallow. Kovir agreed to talks, but on their territory, in Lan Exeter, he had to eat humble pie. They sailed to Lan Exeter like petitioners, thought Dykstra, wrapping himself in his cloak, like humble supplicants, quite like me today. The Redanian squadron sailed into the Gulf of Praxida and headed towards the Kovirian coast. From the deck of the flagship Alata, Radovid, Bender of Kaidwen, and the hierarch of Novigrad, accompanying them in the role of mediator, observed in astonishment the breakwaters extending into the sea, above which rose the walls and sturdy bastions of the fortress guarding access to the city of Pont Vanis. And sailing north from Pont Vanis towards the mouth of the river Targo, the kings saw port alongside port, shipyard beside shipyard, harbour by harbour. They saw a forest of masts and the blinding white of sails. Kovir, it turned out, was prepared for blockades, embargoes and duty wars. Kovir was clearly ready to dominate the seas. Alata sailed into the broad mouth of the Targo and dropped anchor in the stony jaws of the outport. But, to the king's astonishment, one more trip by water awaited them. The city of Lan Exeter didn't have streets, but canals. The Great Canal, leading from the harbour straight to the royal residence, was the main artery and axis of the metropolis. The kings transferred to galleys decorated in scarlet and gold garlands and a coat of arms on which Rufus and Bender, recognised in amazement, 
the Radanian eagle and the Kaidwanian unicorn. As they travelled along the great canal, the kings and their retinues looked around and kept silent. Actually, it ought to be said they were rendered speechless. They'd been wrong to think they knew what wealth and splendour were, that they couldn't be astonished by manifestations of affluence or any display of luxury. They went down the great canal, passing the impressive admiralty building and the merchant's guild. They floated alongside promenades, packed with colourful and finely attired crowds. They travelled between avenues of magnificent aristocratic residences and merchants' townhouses, reflecting in the canal's water a spectrum of splendidly embellished but exceptionally narrow facades. In Lan Exeter, tax was paid on a house's frontage. The wider the frontage, the higher the tax. On the steps leading down to the canal of Ensenada Palace, the royal winter residence, the only building with a wide frontage, was already waiting for them a welcoming committee and the royal couple, Jidovius, the king of Covia, and his wife, Gemma. The couple welcomed the new arrivals courteously, politely, and uncharacteristically. Dear uncle, Jidovius greeted Radovid. Darling grandfather, Gemma smiled to Bender. Jidovius was a Troydonid, after all. Gemma, however, it turned out, was descended from the rebellious Aideen, in whose veins flowed the blood of the kings of Ard Karek, who had fled from Kaidwen. The proven consanguinity improved the mood and evoked affection, but didn't help in the negotiations. By and large, what followed were not negotiations. The children briefly stated their demands. Their grandfathers heard them out, and then signed a document which posterity called the First Exeter Treaty, to distinguish it from those entered into later. The First Treaty also bears a name in keeping with the first words of its preamble, Mare Liberum Apertum. The sea is free and open. Trade is free. Profit is sacred. Love the trade and profit of your neighbour like your own. To hinder someone's trading and profiting is to break the laws of nature. And Kovir is no one's vassal. It's a sovereign, autonomous, and neutral kingdom. It didn't look as if Jidovius and Gemma wanted, even say in the name of politeness, to make a single concession, even the slightest, nothing that would have rescued Radovid and Bender's honour. Nonetheless, they did. They agreed for Radovid, during his lifetime, to use, in official documents, the title of King of Kovir and Povis, and Bender, during his lifetime, the title of King of Cairngorm and Maliore. Of course, with the proviso, De non preio di cando. Didovius and Gemma reigned for twenty-five years. The royal branch of the Troydonids ended with their son, Gerard. Esteril Tyson ascended to the Coviran throne and founded the House of Tyson. The kings of Covir were soon after bound by blood ties to all the other dynasties of the world, and they all steadfastly abided by the Exeter Treaties. They never interfered with their neighbours' affairs. They never raised the issue of foreign succession, though often historical turbulence meant that the king or prince of Covir had all possible grounds to judge himself the rightful successor to the throne of Redania, Adian, Kaidwen, Sidaris, or even Verden or Rivia. The mighty Covir didn't attempt territorial annexations or conquests, nor did it send gunboats armed with catapults and ballistae into foreign waters. It never seized the privilege of ruling the waves. Mare liberum apertum, a sea free and open for trade, was sufficient for Covir. Covir believed in the sanctity of trade and profit, and in absolute unswerving neutrality. Dykstra put up the beaver collar of his cloak, protecting his nape from the wind and the lashing rain. He looked around, shaken from his contemplations. The water in the great canal looked black. In the drizzle and fog, even the Admiralty building, the boast of Lan Exeter, looked like a barracks. Even the merchants' townhouses had lost their usual sumptuousness, and their narrow frontages seemed narrower than normal. Perhaps they are sodding narrower, thought Dykstra. If King Esterat has raised the tax, the sly householders may have narrowed their houses. Has the weather been so plague-stricken for long, Your Excellency? he asked, just to interrupt the annoying silence. 
Since the middle of September, Count, answered the ambassador. Since the full moon. It looks as though winter will come early. It has already snowed in Talgar. I thought, said Dykstra, the snow never melted in Talgar. The ambassador glanced at him, as if to make sure it was a joke and not ignorance. In Talgar, now he showed off his wit, the winter begins in September and ends in May. The remaining seasons are spring and autumn. There's also the summer. It usually falls on the first Tuesday after the August new moon and lasts until Wednesday morning. Dykstra didn't laugh. But even there, the ambassador turned gloomy. Snow at the end of October is a sensation. The ambassador, like most of Redania's aristocracy, couldn't stand Dykstra. He considered the need to receive and entertain the arch-spy as a personal affront, and the fact that the Regency Council had charged Dykstra and not him with negotiations with Kovir as a mortal insult. It sickened him that he, de Reuter, of the most celebrated branch of the de Reuter family, graphs for nine generations, should have to address a churl and upstart as count. But, as an experienced diplomat, he concealed his resentment masterfully. The oars rose and fell rhythmically, and the boat glided swiftly along the canal. They had just passed the bijou, but extremely tasteful, palace of culture and art. Do we sail to Ensenada? Yes, Count, confirmed the ambassador. The Minister of Foreign Affairs stressed emphatically that he wished to see you immediately on arrival, which is why I am taking you directly to Ensenada. In the evening I shall send a boat to the palace, for I would like to entertain you over supper. Your Excellency will deign to forgive me, Dykstra interrupted, but my duties won't allow me to take you up on it. I have a prodigious amount of matters to deal with, and little time, so I must manage them at the cost of pleasure. We shall sup another day, in happier, more peaceful times. The ambassador bowed and furtively sighed with relief. He entered Ensenada, naturally by a rear entrance, for which he was very glad. An impressive but damned long staircase of white marble led straight from the Great Canal to the main entrance of the Royal Winter Residence, beneath a magnificent frontage supported on slender columns. The stairs leading to one of the numerous rear entrances were incomparably less spectacular, but far easier to negotiate. In spite of that, Dykstra, as he walked, bit his lip and swore softly under his breath so that the major domo, lackeys and guardsmen escorting him wouldn't hear. More stairs and more climbing awaited him inside the palace. Dykstra cursed again sotto voce. Probably the damp, cold and uncomfortable position in the boat was why his leg, with its smashed and magically healed ankle, had begun to make itself known with a dull, nagging pain and a nasty memory. Dykstra ground his teeth. He knew that the witcher, the man responsible for his suffering, had also had his bones broken. He had profound hopes that they also pained the Witcher and wished in his heart of hearts that would pain him as long and as severely as possible. Dusk had already fallen outside and Ensenada's corridors were dark. The route Dykstra was taking behind a silent major domo was, nonetheless, lit by a sparse row of lackeys with candlesticks and outside the doors of the chamber to which the major domo was leading him stood guardsmen with halberds, so erect it seemed spare halberds had been stuck up their backsides. The lackeys with candles stood more densely there, so the luminance was blinding. Dykstra was somewhat astonished by the pomp with which he was being received. He entered the chamber and immediately stopped being astonished. He bowed low. Greetings to you, Dykstra, said Esterad Tyson, King of Kovir, Povis, Narok, Velhad, and Talgar. Don't stand by the door. Come closer. Put etiquette aside. It's an unofficial audience. Your Majesty. Esterad's wife, Queen Zuleika, responded to Dykstra's reverential bow with a slightly absent-minded nod, not interrupting her crocheting for a moment. There wasn't a soul in the chamber apart from the royal couple. Precisely. Esterad had noticed his glance. Just the two of us will chat. I beg your pardon, just the three of us, for something tells me it'll be better this way. Dykstra sat down on the scissors chair indicated, opposite Esterad. The king was wearing a crimson ermine-trimmed cape and a matching velvet chapeau. 
Like all the men of the Tyson clan, he was tall, powerfully built, and devilishly handsome. He always looked robust and healthy, like a sailor just returned from the sea. One could almost smell the seawater and cold, salt wind coming from him. As with all the Tysons, it was difficult to determine his exact age. Judging by his hair, skin, and hands, the features which most clearly express one's age, Esterad might have passed for forty-five. Dykstra knew the king was fifty-six. Zuleika. The king leaned over towards his wife. Look at him. If you didn't know he was a spy, would you give credence to it? Queen Zuleika was short, quite stout and pleasantly plain. She dressed in quite a typical way for women of her looks, which was based on selecting elements of attire so that no one would guess she wasn't her own grandmother. Zuleika achieved this effect by wearing loose-fitting gowns, dull of cut and grey-brown of tone. On her head, she wore a bonnet inherited from her ancestors. She didn't use any makeup and didn't wear any jewellery. The good book, she spoke in a quiet and sweet little voice, teaches us circumspection in judging our neighbours, for one day they will judge us too. Let's hope not on the basis of appearance. Esther and Tyson favoured his wife with a warm look. It was widely known that he loved her boundlessly, with a love which, for twenty-nine years of marriage, hadn't dimmed a jot. On the contrary, as the years passed, it blazed brighter and hotter. Esterad, it was claimed, had never betrayed Zuleika. Dykstra couldn't really believe in anything so unlikely, but himself had tried three times to plant on, or virtually place under, the king, stunning female agents, candidates for favourites, superb sources of information. Nothing had come of it. I like to speak bluntly, said the king. Therefore, I shall reveal at once, Dykstra, why I've decided to talk to you personally. There are several reasons. Firstly, I know you won't shrink from bribery. I'm certain, by and large, of my ministers, but why put them to the test, lead them into temptation? What kind of bribe did you intend to offer the Minister of Foreign Affairs? A thousand Novigradian crowns the spy responded without batting an eyelid. Were he to haggle, I'd have gone up to a thousand five hundred. And that's why I like you, Esther Tyson said, after a moment's silence. You're a dreadful horson. You remind me of my youth. I look at you and see myself at your age. Dykstra thanked him with a bow. He was just eight years younger than the king. He was convinced that Esterad was well aware of it. You're a dreadful horson the king repeated, growing serious, but a respectable and decent one, and that's a rarity in these rotten times. Dykstra bowed once more. You see, Esterad continued, in every country one may encounter people who are blind fanatics for the idea of social order, people committed to an idea, prepared to do anything for it, including crime, for to them, the aim justifies the means and changes the meaning of concepts. They don't murder, they rescue order. They don't torture, they don't blackmail. They safeguard the national interest and fight for order. For such people, the life of an individual, should that individual violate the dogma of the established order, is not worth a farthing or a shrug. People like that don't acknowledge the fact that the society they serve is made up of individuals. People like that are availed of the so-called broad view, and such a view is the most certain way of not noticing other people. Nicodemus de Boot, Dykstra blurted out. Close, but wide of the mark. The king of Covia bared his alabaster white teeth. It was Visigotter of Corvo, a lesser-known but also able ethicist and philosopher, Read him, I recommend it. Perhaps one of his books has survived in Redania. Perhaps you didn't burn them all. Come, come, let's get to the point. You, Dykstra, are also unscrupulous in your use of intrigue, bribery, blackmail and torture. You don't bat an eyelid when condemning someone to death or ordering an assassination. That fact you do it for the kingdom you faithfully serve does not excuse you 
or make you any more pleasant in my eyes. Not in the slightest. Be aware of that. The spy nodded as a sign that he was. You are, though, Estorad continued, as it's been said before, a horse son of upright character. And that's why I like and respect you, why I have granted you a private audience. For you, Dykstra, having had a million opportunities, have never done anything for private gain or stolen so much as a halfpenny from the state coffers, not even a farthing. Zuleika, look, is he blushing, or am I deceived? The queen raised her head from her crocheting. Their righteousness shall be known from their modesty. She quoted a passage from the good book, although she must have seen that not even a trace of a blush had appeared on the spy's features. Very well, Esterad said. To business. Time to move to state affairs. He, Zuleika, crossed the sea motivated by his patriotic duty. Redania, his fatherland, is threatened. Chaos rages there, following the tragic death of King Vizimir. Redania is now governed by a band of aristocratic idiots calling themselves the Regency Council. That band, my Zuleika, will do nothing for Redania. In the face of danger, it will either bolt or begin obsequiously to grovel before the pearl-trimmed slippers of the Nilfgaardian Emperor. That band despises Dykstra, for he's a spy, a murderer, an upstart and a boor. But Dykstra crossed the sea to save his country, demonstrating who really cares about Redania. Esterad Tyson fell silent, exhaled loudly, wearied by his speech, and adjusted his crimson chapeau, which had slipped down slightly over his nose. Well, Dykstra, he continued, what ails your kingdom, aside from a shortage of money, naturally? Aside from a shortage of money? The spy's face was inscrutable. All are well, thank you. Ah, the king nodded. His chapeau once more slipped down over his nose and had to be adjusted again. Aha, I comprehend. I comprehend, he continued, and I applaud the idea. When one has money, one may purchase medicaments for every affliction. The crux is to have the money, which you do not. If you did, you wouldn't be here. Do I understand correctly? Impeccably. And... How much do you need, I wonder? Not much. A million Byzants. Not much. Estherad Tyson grasped his chapeau in both hands in an exaggerated gesture. You call that not much? Oh, my. But for your royal highness, the spy mumbled, such a sum is a trifle. A trifle? The king released his chapeau and raised his hands towards the ceiling. Oh, my! A million Byzants is a trifle. Do you hear, Zuleika, what he's saying? And do you know, Dykstra, that to have a million and not to have a million is two million together? I understand. I comprehend that you and Philippa Eilhart are looking desperately and feverishly for an idea to defend yourselves against Nilfgaard. But what do you want? Do you plan to buy the whole of Nilfgaard? Dykstra did not reply. Zuleika crocheted on. For a moment, Esterad pretended to be admiring the nude nymphs on the ceiling. Come along. He suddenly rose and nodded to the spy. They walked over to a huge painting portraying King Jadovius sitting astride a grey horse, pointing out something which wasn't included on the canvas, to the army with his scepter, probably indicating the right direction. Esterad fished a tiny gilded wand from his pocket, tapped the frame of the picture with it, and murmured a spell in hushed tones. Jadovius and his grey horse vanished, and a relief map of the known world appeared. The king touched a silver button in the corner of the map with his wand and magically transformed the scale, narrowing the visible sweep of the world to the Yaruga Valley and the Four Kingdoms. The blue is Nilfgaard, he explained. The red is you. What are you gawping at? Look, here. Dykstra tore his gaze away from the other paintings, chiefly nudes and seascapes. 
He wondered which was the magical camouflage for another notorious map of Esterads, the one which depicted Kovia's military and trade intelligence service, an entire network of bribed informers and blackmailed individuals, agents, operational contacts, saboteurs, hired killers, moles and active resident spies. He knew such a map existed. He had been trying unsuccessfully for many years to gain access to it. The red is you, Ezra Tyson repeated. Looks pretty hopeless, doesn't it? Yep, pretty hopeless, Dykstra admitted to himself. Lately, he had been continuously looking at strategic maps, but now on Esterad's relief map, the situation seemed even worse. The blue squares formed themselves into the shape of terrible dragon's jaws, liable at any moment to snatch and crush the small, miserable red squares in its great teeth. Esterad Tyson looked around for something that might serve as a pointer for the map, finally drawing a decorative rapier from the nearest panoply. Nilfgaard, he began his lecture, pointing appropriately with the rapier, has attacked Lyria and Adian, declaring an assault on the border fort Glevitzingen as a causes belli. I'm not going to investigate who really attacked Glevitzingen wearing which disguise. It's also senseless to speculate how many days or hours Emir's armed operation occurred before the analogical undertakings by Adian and Temeria. I shall leave that to the historians. I'm more interested in the situation today and what it will be tomorrow. At this very moment, Nilfgaard is in Dol Angra and Adian, shielded by a buffer in the shape of the elven dominium in Dol Blatana bordering with that part of Adian, which King Henselt of Caedwen, speaking vividly, tore from Emir's teeth and himself devoured. Dykstra made no comment. I shall also leave a moral judgment of King Henselt's campaign to the historians, Estrad continued, but a single glance at the map is sufficient to see that, by annexing the northern marches, Henselt barred Emir's way to the Pontar Valley. He secured Temeria's flank, and yours, the Redanians, you ought to thank him. I did, Dykstra muttered, but quietly. King Demavend of Idian is our guest in Traitagor, and Demavend has quite a precise moral judgment of Henselt's deed. He customarily expresses it in blunt and ringing words. I can imagine, the King of Kovia nodded. Let's leave it for now and glance at the south, at the River Yeruga. Attacking in Dol Angra, Emir simultaneously secured his flank by concluding a separatist treaty with Fultest of Temeria. But immediately after the end of the military operations in Adian, the emperor broke the pact without further ado and struck Brugge and Sodden. Through his cowardly negotiations, Fultest gained two weeks of peace. Sixteen days, to be precise, and it's the 26th of October today. It is. Thus... The situation on the 26th of October is as follows. Brugge and Sodden occupied. The strongholds of Ratzvan and Maena fallen. Temeria's army defeated in the Battle of Maribor and repulsed northwards. Maribor besieged. This morning it was still holding out, but it's already late evening, Dykstra. Maribor will hold out. The Elf Guardians didn't manage to seal it off. True, they advanced too far, they overextended their supply lines, they're imprudently exposing their flanks. They will call off the siege before the winter, withdrawing towards the Yaruga, shortening the front. But what will happen in the spring, Dykstra? What will happen when the grass peeps out from under the snow? Come closer, look at the map. Dykstra looked. Look at the map, the king repeated, and I shall tell you, what Emir of Emris will do in the spring. They will begin an offensive on an unparalleled scale, announced Katia van Kanten, adjusting her golden curls in front of the looking glass. Oh, I know that information isn't sensational in itself. Old women enliven their laundry at every town well with stories about the spring offensive. Azira var Anahid was unusually tetchy and impatient today but nonetheless managed not to ask why, in that case, she was bothering her with such unsensational information. But she knew Cantarella, and if Cantarella started talking about something, she had her reasons, and she usually finished her statements with conclusions. I know a little more than the Hoi Polloi, however, Cantarella continued. 
Vatier told me everything about the entire council with the emperor, and in addition brought me a whole briefcase of maps. When he fell asleep, I examined them. Shall I go on? But of course, my dear, Azira squinted. The thrust of the main strike is, of course, Temeria, the border of the river Ponta along the line novigrad vitsima elanda A force of the Central Army under the command of Meno Kohorn will strike. A force of the Eastern Army will secure the flank, striking the Pontar Valley and Kaidwen from Aetian. Kaidwen? Azire raised an eyebrow. Is that the end of the fragile friendship struck up during the sharing of spoils? Kaidwen is threatening the right flank. Katia van Kantin pouted slightly with her full lips. Her doll-like face was in striking contrast to the strategic grasp she was demonstrating. The strike is of a preventative character. Assigned units of a group from the Eastern Army are to bind King Hensel's army to remove any thoughts of helping Temeria. The Verden Special Operations Group will strike in the West, the blonde woman continued, with the task of capturing Sidaris and tightly sealing off the blockade of Novigrad, Gorsvelen and Vitsima, for the general staff is taking into account the necessity of besieging those three strongholds. You didn't name the two armies commanders. The eastern group, Ardal Abdai, Cantarella smiled slightly. The Veden group, Joachim de Wet. Azire raised her eyebrows. How interesting, she said. Two princes offended by the removal of their daughters from Emir's matrimonial plans. Our emperor is either very naive or very cunning. If Emir knows anything about a plot by the princes, said Cantarella, it's not from Vatier. Vatier told him nothing. Go on. The offensive will be on an unprecedented scale. Taken together, including frontline units, reserves, auxiliary and rear services, over 300,000 men will be taking part in the operation, and elves, naturally. Schedule start date? Not yet said. Supplies are a key issue. Supplies means clear roads, and no one can predict when the winter will finish. What else did Vatier speak of? He was complaining, poor thing. Cantarella flashed her little teeth, complaining that the emperor had abused and reprimanded him again, publicly. The reason again was the mysterious disappearance of Stefan Skellen and his entire unit. Emir publicly called Vatier a clot, said he was a head of a department which, rather than making people disappear without trace, are surprised by such disappearances. He constructed on the subject a malicious equivoque which Vatier sadly, wasn't able to repeat exactly. Then the emperor asked Vatier in jest if his failure meant some other secret organization had been set up, kept confidential even from him. Our imperator is sharp. He's close to the target. He is, Azire murmured. What else, Cartier? The agent Vatier had in Skellen's unit, who also vanished, was called Neratin Tseka. Vatier must have thought very highly of him because he's extremely dejected over his disappearance. I, thought Aziri, am also left dejected by the disappearance of Jediah Mekesa. But I, unlike Vatier de Rido, will find out what happened. And Ryans, has Vatier met him again? No, he didn't mention it. They were both briefly silent. The cat in Azire's lap purred loudly. Madame Azire? Yes, Cartier? Will I have to play the role of the foolish lover much longer? I'd like to return to my studies, devote myself to scholarly work. Uh, soon, Azire interrupted. Just a little longer. Hold on, my child. Cantarella sighed. They finished their conversation and bade each other farewell. Azire va Anahid shooed the cat from the armchair and reread the letter from Fringila Vigo, who was residing in Tucson. She fell into pensive mood, for the letter had troubled her. It bore some message between the lines which Azire sensed but couldn't grasp. It was after midnight when Azira va Anahid, the Nilfgaardian sorceress, started up the megascope and established telecommunication with Monte Calvo Castle in Redania.
Philippa Eilhart was in a skimpy nightdress with very thin straps and had lipstick traces on her cheek and cleavage. Azire made an immense effort of will to suppress a grimace of distaste. Never, ever will I be capable of understanding it, she thought, and I don't want to understand it. May we talk freely? Philippa made a sweeping hand movement, encircling herself in a sphere of discretion. We can now. I have information, Azire began dryly. It isn't sensational in that of itself. Even old women at Wells are talking about it. Nonetheless. The whole of Redania, said Esterat Tyson, looking at his map, can at this moment field 35,000 frontline troops, of whom 4,000 are heavy armoured cavalry, reckoning roughly, of course. Dykstra nodded. The arithmetic was absolutely precise. Demavend and Maeve had a similar army. Emir annihilated it in twenty-six days. The same thing will happen to the armies of Redania and Temeria if you don't reinforce them. I support your idea, Dykstra, yours and Philippa Eilhart's. You're in need of troops. You require valorous, well-drilled and well-equipped cavalry. You need the kind of cavalry that costs around a million Byzants. The spy nodded, confirming that this calculation couldn't be faulted either. As you no doubt know, the king continued dryly, Kovir has always been, is, and will be neutral. We are bound by a treaty with the Nilfgaardian Empire, signed by my grandfather, Esteril Tyson, and the Imperator Fergus Va Emris. The letter of that treaty does not permit Kovir to support the enemies of Nilfgaard with military aid, nor with money for troops. When Emir Va Emris throttles Timeria and Redania, coughed Dykstra, he'll look to the north. Emir won't be satisfied. It may turn out that your treaty won't be worth a hill of beans. A moment ago, the talk was of Faltest of Temeria, who managed by negotiations to buy himself a mere sixteen days of peace with Nilfgaard. Oh, my dear, Esterad snapped. One cannot argue like that. Treaties are like marriage. They aren't ended into with a thought of betrayal, and once they're concluded, one shouldn't be suspicious, and if that doesn't suit somebody, they shouldn't get married. Because you can't become a cuckold without being a husband, but you'll admit that fear of wearing the horns is a pitiful and quite ridiculous justification for enforced celibacy. And cuckolds aren't a subject for discussion in a marriage. As long as one doesn't wear horns, that subject isn't mentioned, and if one's already wearing them, then there's nothing to say. And since we're talking about horns, how is the husband of the fair Marie, the Marquise de Mercier, the Redanian Minister of Finances? Your Majesty, Dykstra bowed stiffly, has enviable informants. Indeed I do, the King conceded. You'd be astonished how many and how enviable. But you too can't be ashamed of your own. Those you have at my courts here and in Pont Vanis. Oh, I'll wager each of them deserves top marks. Dykstra didn't even blink. Emir va Emris, Esterad continued, looking at the nymphs on the ceiling, also has a few good and well-placed agents, which is why, I repeat, Covier's raison d'etat is neutrality and the principle of pacta sunt servanda. Covier doesn't break treaties not even in anticipation of the other side breaking a contract. May I observe, Dykstra said, that Redania isn't urging Kovia to break pacts. Redania is by no means seeking an alliance or military aid against Nilfgaard. Redania wishes to borrow a small sum which we shall return. I can just see you returning it, the king interrupted. But these are academic deliberations, for I shan't loan you a farthing. And don't ply me with duplicitous causes, Tree Dykstra. It suits you like a bib suits a wolf. Do you have any other serious, intelligent, and apposite arguments? I do not. You were lucky, Esther Tyson said after a moment's silence, that you became a spy. You'd never have made a career in commerce. The length and breadth of the world, all royal couples had separate bedchambers. The kings, 
with extremely varying frequency, visited the Queen's bedchambers, and it also happened that Queens paid unexpected visits to the King's bedchambers. Afterwards, the spouses returned to their own chambers and beds. The royal couple of Kovir were an exception in this respect too. Estrad Tyson and Zuleika always slept together, in one bedchamber on an immense bed with an immense canopy. Before falling asleep, Zuleika, after putting on her spectacles, in which she was ashamed to appear before her subjects, customarily read her good book. Estherad Tyson usually talked. That night was no different. Estherad put on his nightcap and picked up his scepter. He liked to hold his scepter and play with it. He didn't do it officially, for he feared his subjects would accuse him of being pretentious. You know, Zuleika, he said, lately I've been having queer dreams. I've dreamed of that witch, my mother. I don't know how many times. She stands over me and repeats, I have a wife for Tancred, I have a wife for Tancred. And she shows me a pretty but very young girl. And do you know, Zuleika, who that girl is? It's Siri, Calanthe's granddaughter. Do you remember Calanthe, Zuleika? I do, my husband. Siri, Estrad went on, playing with the scepter, is the one Emiava Emrys reputedly wants to marry. A bizarre marriage. Astonishing. How, damn it, ought she to be a wife for Tancred? Tancred. Zuleika's voice faintly altered, as it did whenever she spoke of her son. Could do with a wife. Perhaps he would settle down. Perhaps, Estherad sighed, though I doubt it, but perhaps. In any case, matrimony is some sort of chance. Hmm. Siri. Ha! Huh. Kovir and Sintra. The Aruga Estuary. Doesn't sound at all bad. Not at all bad. An alliance would be fine. A nice little coalition. Well, but if Emir has his eye on the filly, but why is she appearing in my dreams? And why the hell am I dreaming that sort of nonsense? At the equinox, do you recall, when I woke you? Brr, what a nightmare that was. I'm glad I can't remember the details. Hmm. Perhaps we ought to summon an astrologer. A soothsayer? A, a medium? Madame Sheila de Tankerville is in Lanexeter? No, the king grimaced. I don't want that witch. Too clever. A second Philippa Eilhart is springing up under my nose. Power appeals too much to these clever women. One should not encourage them with favours and familiarity. You're right as ever, my husband. Mm, are those dreams. The good book, Zuleika turned over a few leaves, says that when a man falls asleep, the gods open his ears and speak to him, whereas the prophet Libyoda teaches that when gazing on a dream, one either sees great wisdom or great foolishness. The art is in recognising it. A marriage of Tancred with Emir's betrothed is not exactly great wisdom. Esterad sighed. But while we're on the subject of wisdom, I would be immensely pleased if it came to me during my slumbers. It concerns the case with which Dykstra came. It concerns a most trying case. For you see, my dear beloved Zuleika, good sense permits us not to rejoice with Nilfgaard pushing northwards hard and liable any day to seize Novigrad. For from Novigrad everything, including our neutrality, looks different than from the distant south. Thus, it would be good if Redania and Temeria were to hold back Nilfgaard's advance in order to push the invader back across the Yoruga. But would it be good were it done using our money? Are you listening to me, my most beloved wife? I am, husband. And what do you think? All wisdom is contained in the good book. But does your good book say what to do if some dykstra shows up and demands a million from you? The book, Zuleika blinked from over her spectacles, says nothing about base mammon, but in one passage it says, To give is a greater happiness than to receive, and supporting a pauper with arms is noble. It is said, Give away all, and it shall make your soul noble. 
and makes the purse and breadbasket empty, Esther and Tyson muttered. Zuleika, is any wisdom to be found in the book concerning business, apart from passages about noble free distribution and almsgiving? What does the book, for instance, say about equivalent exchange? The queen straightened her spectacles and began to quickly turn over the pages of the incunabulum. Measure for measure, she read. Esterad was silent for a long while. And perhaps, he finally drawled, something more? Zuleika returned to turning the pages of the book. I have found, she suddenly announced, something amongst the wisdom of the prophet Lebioda. Should I read it? If you would. The prophet Lebioda. In sooth, support the pauper with arms, but rather than give the pauper an entire watermelon, give him half a watermelon, for a pauper is liable to lose his wits from happiness. Half a watermelon? Esther Tyson bristled. You mean half a million Byzants? And you know, Zuleika, that to have half a million and not to have half a million is a whole million together. You didn't let me finish. Zuleika scolded her husband with a harsh look over her spectacles. The prophet goes on. Better even is to give the pauper quarter of a watermelon, and it is even better to cause that some else give the pauper a watermelon. For in sooth, I tell you, there will always be someone who has a watermelon and is inclined to share it with the pauper, if not out of nobleness, then out of calculation or on some other pretext. Ha! The king of Covia thumped his scepter down on the bedside table. In sooth, the prophet Lebioda was shrewd. Instead of giving, cause someone else to give. That appeals to me. Those are in sooth flowing words. Study the wisdom of that prophet, my darling Zuleika. I'm certain you will discover among it something that permits me to solve the problem of Redania and the army that Redania wishes to raise using my money. Zuleika leafed through the book for a long time before she finally began to read. A pupil of the prophet Lebioda once spake to him. Teach me, master, how I am to act for my neighbour is desirous of my favourite dog. If I give him my pet, my heart will break from sorrow. If, though, I do not give it, I shall be downhearted, for I shall pain my neighbour through my refusal. What to do? Do you have, asked the prophet, something you love less than your pet dog? I have, master, the pupil replied, an impish cat, a tiresome pest, and I love him not at all. And thus spake the prophet Lebioda, Take that impish cat, that tiresome pest, and give it to your neighbour. Then you will know happiness. You will be rid of the cat and will delight your neighbour. For most often it is so that our neighbour does not desire a gift, but to be given. Esterad was silent for some time, and his brow was knitted. Zuleika? he finally asked. Was that really the same prophet? Take that impish cat. I heard it the first time, the king yelled, but immediately restrained himself. Uh, forgive me, most beloved. The point is, I don't understand what cats have to do with... He fell silent and pondered deeply. After eighty-five years, when the situation had changed enough to allow talk about certain issues and persons, Guiscar Vemwellen, Duke of Creighton, grandson of Esterad Tyson and son of his oldest daughter, Gaudemunda, spoke. Duke Guiscar was then a venerable old man, but he clearly remembered the events he had witnessed. It was Duke Guiscar who revealed where the million Byzants came from, the million with which Redania equipped its cavalry for the war against Nilfgaard. That million didn't come, as had been thought, from Kovia's treasury, but from the hierarch of Novigrad. Esterad Tyson, Guiscard disclosed, obtained the Novigradian money from his shares in the maritime trade companies being set up. The paradox was that those companies were set up with the active cooperation of Nilfgaardian merchants. Thus it appeared that Nilfgaard itself, to some degree, had financed the fielding of the Redanian army. Grandpapa! Guiscar Vemwellen recalled, 
said something about watermelons, smiling roguishly. He said somebody always wants to give to a pauper, even if out of calculation. He also said that since Nilfgaard itself was contributing to increasing the strength and military capabilities of the Redanian army, they couldn't blame others for doing the same. Later, though, the old man went on, Grandpapa summoned my father, who was at that time the chief of intelligence and the minister of internal affairs. When they learned what orders they were to execute, they fell into a panic. They were concerned about releasing more than 3,000 people from prisons, internment camps and exile. House arrest was to be withdrawn from more than a hundred. No, it didn't only apply to bandits, common criminals and hired mercenaries. The pardons were mostly for dissidents. Among the pardoned were henchmen of the deposed King Reed and people of the usurper Edi, their virulent partisans. And not only those who had supported in word, most were in prison for sabotage, assassination attempts and armed revolts. The Minister of Internal Affairs was horrified and Papa extremely worried. While Grandpapa, the Duke went on, was laughing as though it were a first-rate joke. And then he continued, I remember every word. It's a great pity, gentlemen, that you don't read the good book before going to sleep. If you did, you would understand the ideas of your monarch. As it is, you'll be carrying out orders without understanding them. But don't worry, your monarch knows what he's doing. No. Oh. Go and release all my impish cats, those tiresome pests. That's just what he said. Impish cats, pests. And he meant, which no one then could have known, subsequent heroes, commanders covered in glory and fame. Those cats of grandpapa's became the celebrated condottieri, Adam Adieu Pangrat, Lorenzo Mola, Juan Frontino Gutierrez, and Julia Abatamarco, who became famous in Rodania as Pretty Kitty. You youngsters won't remember it, but when I was a boy, when we played at war, every lad wanted to be Adieu Pangrat, and every girl Julia Pretty Kitty. But to Grandpapa, they were mischievous cats. Later, though, mumbled Wiesgar Van Wellen. Grandpapa took me by the hand and led me out onto the terrace, where Grandmama Zuleika was feeding the seagulls. Grandpapa said to her, said, uh, uh. The old man slowly and with great effort tried to recall the words which, eighty-five years ago, King Esterad Tyson had said to his wife, Queen Zuleika, on the terrace of Ensenada Palace, towering over the Great Canal. Do you know, my most beloved wife, that I have spotted one more piece of wisdom among the words of the prophet Lebioda? One that shows me yet another benefit of giving Redania those mischievous cats. Cats, my Zuleika, come home. Cats always come home. Well, and when my cats return, when they bring their pay, their spoils, their riches, I shall tax them. When King Esterad Tyson spoke to Dykstra for the last time, it was in private, without even Zuleika. Admittedly, a more or less ten-year-old boy was playing on the floor of the gigantic chamber, but he didn't count and furthermore was so busy with his lead soldiers that he paid no attention to the two men talking. That is Guiscard, Esther had explained, nodding towards the boy. My grandson, the son of Gaudemunda and that ne'er-do-well Prince Vermuelen. But that little boy is Covier's only hope, should Tancred Tyson turn out to be... should anything happen to Tancred. Dykstra was aware of Covier's problem, and Esterad's personal problem. He knew that something had already happened to Tancred. The lad, if he had any makings of a king, would only be a bad one. 
Your matter, Esther had said, is already by and large sorted out. You may now start to ponder on the most effective way of using the million bysants, which will soon end up in the Redanian coffers. He bent down and surreptitiously picked up one of Guiscard's brightly painted lead soldiers, a cavalryman with a raised broadsword. Take that and conceal it well. Whoever shows you another such identical soldier will be my emissary, even if he doesn't look like it, even though you have no faith that he is my man or is aware of the issue of our million. Anyone else will be an agent provocateur. Redania, Dykstra bowed, will not forget this, your majesty. I, however, speaking for myself, would like to assure you of my personal gratitude. Do not do so. Give me that thousand with which you hoped to gain my minister's favour. Why, isn't the king's favour deserving of a bribe? Your royal highness is stooping. We are, we are. Hand over the money, Dykstra. To have a thousand and not to have a thousand. He adds up to two thousand, I know. In a distant wing of Ensenada, in a chamber of much more modest size, the sorceress Sheila de Tancaville listened to the account of Queen Zuleika with concentration and earnestness. Excellent, she nodded. Excellent, your royal highness. I did everything as instructed, Lady Sheila. Thank you for doing so, and I assure you one more time we were acting in a good cause for the good of the country and dynasty. Queen Zuleika coughed softly, and her voice changed a little. And, and, Tancred, Lady Sheila? I gave my word, Sheila de Tancaville said coldly. I gave my word that I would reciprocate for the help with help. Your Royal Highness may sleep serenely. I desire that greatly, Zuleika sighed. Greatly. While we're on the subject of sleep, the king begins to suspect something. Those dreams are amazing him, and when something amazes him, he grows suspicious. I shall then stop sending the king dreams for some time, the sorceress promised. Returning, however, to your majesty's dream, I repeat, he can be confident. Prince Tancred will bid farewell to that bad company. He will not linger at the Baron of Socrates's castle, nor at Lady de Lissimore's residence, nor at the Redardian ambassador's wife's. He will no longer visit those personages? Never. Those personages? Sheila de Tancaville's dark eyes lit up with a strange glint. Will no longer dare to trifle with Prince Tancred, for they shall be made aware of the consequences. I vouch for what I say. I vouch for the fact that Prince Tancred will take up his studies again and be a diligent scholar, a serious and level-headed young man. He shall also stop chasing skirts. He shall lose his ardour. Until the moment we introduce him to Cyrilla, Princess of Sintra. Oh, if only I could believe that. Zuleika wrung her hands and raised her eyes. If only I could believe that. It is sometimes difficult. Sheila de Tancaville smiled unexpectedly, even for herself. To believe in the power of magic, your royal highness. And actually, so it should be. Philippa Eilhart adjusted the gossamer thin strap of her sheer nightdress and wiped the rest of the lipstick smudges from her cleavage. Such a smart woman, thought Shayla de Tankerville with slight distaste, and she can't keep her hormones in check. May we talk? Philippa surrounded herself with a sphere of discretion. We can now. Everything has been sorted out in Covia, positively. Thank you. Has Dykstra said so? Not yet. Why does he delay? He conducts long conversations with Esther Tyson, Shreela de Tankerville grimaced. They've taken an uncommon liking for each other, the king and the spy. Do you know the jokes about our weather, Dykstra? 
that there are only two seasons in Covia, winter and August, I do. And do you know how to tell if summer has reached Covia? No. How? The rain becomes a little warmer. Ha <laughs> ha! Joking aside, Esther and Tyson said gravely, it worries me somewhat that the winters come earlier and earlier and last longer and longer. It was prophesied. You've read, I presume, Eithlina's prophecy. It said there that decades of unending winter will come. Some claim it's some kind of allegory. But I'm a little afraid. In Govia, we once had four summers of cold, rainy weather and poor harvests. Were it not for the tremendous import of food from Nilfgaard, people would have begun to die of starvation in droves. Can you imagine? To be honest, I can't. Well, I can. The cooling climate may starve us all to death. Famine is a foe that is bloody hard to fight. The spy nodded, lost in thought. Dykstra? Your Majesty? Is there peace inside the country now? I wouldn't say so, but I'm doing my best. I know. Everyone's talking about it. Of the traitors on Thaneth, only Vilgefortz remains alive. After the death of Yennefer, yes. Did you know, O King, that Yennefer met her death? She perished on the last day of August in mysterious circumstances over the infamous Sedna Trench between the Isles of Skellige and Cape Paisa de Mar. Yennefer of Wengerberg, Esterad said slowly, was not a traitor. She was not an accomplice of Vilgefortz. If you wish, I shall supply proof. I do not, Dykstra responded after a moment's silence. Or perhaps I will, but not right now. Now she's more convenient to me as a traitor. I understand. Don't trust sorceresses, Dykstra. Philippa in particular. I've never trusted her, but we must cooperate. Without us, Rudania would plunge into chaos and perish. That is true. But if I may advise you, loosen your grip a little. You know of what I speak. Scaffolds and torture chambers throughout the land, atrocities perpetrated against elves, and that dreadful fort, Drakenborg. I know you do it out of patriotism, but you are building yourself an evil legend. In it, you're a werewolf, lapping up innocent blood. Someone has to do it and someone has to bear the consequences. I know you endeavor to be just, but you can't avoid mistakes, can you? For they can't be avoided. Neither can you remain clean when you're slopping around in blood. I know you've never harmed anybody for self-interest, but who will believe that? Who'll want to believe that? The day that fate turns, they'll attribute the murder of innocent people to you, and worse, claim you profited from it and lying sticks to a fellow like Tar. I know. They won't give you a chance to defend yourself. People like you aren't given chances. They'll tar you. But later, after the fact, beware, Dykstra. I shall. They won't get me. They got your king, Visimir, with a dagger plunged up to the guard in his flank, I heard. It's easier to stab a king than a spy. They won't get me. They'll never get me. And they ought not to. Do you know why, Dykstra? For there ought to be some sort of fucking justice in this world. The day was to come when they would recall that conversation. Both of them. The king and the spy. Dykstra recalled Esterad's words in Traitorgore as he listened closely to the steps of the assassins approaching from all directions along all the corridors of the castle. Esterad recalled Dykstra's words on the splendid marble staircase leading from Ensenada to the Great Canal. He could have fought back. The misty, unseeing eyes of Guisgard Vermuelen gazed into the abyss of his recollections. There were only three assassins, and Grandpapa was a powerful man. He could have fought, defended himself until the guards arrived. He could have simply fled. But Grandmama Zuleika was there. Grandpapa shielded 
and protected Zuleika. Only Zuleika. He didn't care about himself. When help finally arrived, Zuleika wasn't even grazed. Esterad had been stabbed more than twenty times. He died three hours later without regaining consciousness. Have you ever read the good book, Dykstra? No, Your Majesty, but I know what is written in it. I, can you believe it, opened it at random yesterday, and I came across this sentence. On the way to eternity, everyone will tread their own stairway, shouldering their own burden. What do you think about that? Time I went, King Esterad. Time to shoulder my burden. Farewell, O oh spy. Farewell, O oh king. We trekked perhaps four hundred furlongs southwards from the ancient and far-famed city of Asengard to a land called Kentloch. When one looks on that land from the hills, one sees numerous lakes arranged artificially in manifold dispositions. Our guide, the elf Avalach, ordered us to seek among those dispositions one calling to mind a clover leaf. And in truth, we espied one such. Moreover, it came out that there were not three but four lakes, for one, somewhat elongated, stretching from south to north, is, as it were, the stem of the leaf. That lake, known as Tarn Mira, is ringed by a black forest. Meanwhile, the mysterious tower of the swallow in the elven tongue Tor Zirel was said to rise up at its northern margin. At first, nonetheless, we saw nothing save fog. I was readying myself to ask the elf Avalach about the tower when he gestured me to be silent and spoke these words. Await and hope. Hope shall return with the light and a good omen. Gaze at the endless waters. There you shall discern the envoys of good tidings. Boivid Backhuisen Peregrinations Along Magic Trails and Places The book is humbug from beginning to end. The ruins by Tarn Mira Lake have been examined many and oft. They are not magical. Contrary to the enunciations of B. Backhuisen, they cannot thus be the remains of the legendary Tower of the Swallow. Ars Magica, 14th edition Chapter 9 they're coming! They're coming! Yennefer held her wet, windswept hair in both hands and stopped by the railing of the steps, getting out of the way of the women running to the wharf. Pushed by a west wind, a breaker crashed against the shore and white plumes of foam kept gushing from clefts in the rocks. They're coming! They're coming! Almost the entire archipelago could be seen from the upper terraces of Caer Trolda Citadel. Ard Skellig's main stronghold. Directly ahead, beyond the strait, lay Anskellig, its southern part, low and flat, its hidden northern side precipitous and scored by fjords. Far away to the left, tall, green, mountainous Spikarug, its peaks shrouded in cloud, broke up the waves with the sharp fangs of its reefs. To the right, Undvik Island's steep cliffs could be seen, teeming with gulls, petrels, cormorants and gannets. From behind Unvik emerged the forested cone of Hindusfjall, the archipelago's smallest island. If, though, you were to climb to the very top of one of Ker Trolde's towers and look southwards, you would see the solitary island of Faro, far from the others, jutting from the water like the back of a huge fish washed up at low tide. Yennefer went down to the lower terrace, stopping by a group of women whose pride and social status prevented them from rushing pell-mell to the quayside to jostle with the excited rabble. Down below, beneath them, lay the harbour town, black and shapeless like some great marine crustacean spat out by the waves. Longship after longship sailed out of the strait between Anskellig and Spikarug. Their sails blazed white and red in the sun, and brass bosses shone on the shields suspended from their sides. Ringhorn is coming first, said one of the women, followed by Fenris. Trila, an excited speaker, caught sight of another. Drak follows. Half-fru is behind them. Angira, 
ተማረር ታሪያ ኑ ኢትስ ኮርፒነ ታሪያ ኢዝ ኖት ዴር ታሪያ ኢዝ ኖት ዴር a young heavily pregnant woman with a thick fair plait cradling her belly groaned softly paled and fainted collapsing on the flags of the terrace like a curtain torn from its rings yenifer leapt forward at once dropping to one knee placed her fingers on the woman's abdomen and shouted a spell to suppress the spasms and contractions powerfully and securely binding the placenta which was in danger of detaching to the womb just to be certain she cast another soothing and protective spell on the baby whose kicks she could feel under her palm she brought the woman around by slapping her face in order not to waste magical energy take her away carefully foolish girl said one of the old women a close thing hysterical her niece may still be alive he may be on another long ship thank you for your help madam witch take her away he never repeated getting to her feet that she stifled a curse on discovering her dress had burst at the seams when she'd knelt down she went down to an even lower terrace the long ships were pulling into the quay one after another and the warriors going ashore heavily armed bearded berserkers from skeliga bandages shone white on many of them and many had to be helped to walk by their comrades some had to be carried the women of skeliga crowded on the quay side were looking out for their men whooping and crying for joy if they were fortunate if not they fainted or walked away slowly quietly without a word of complaint occasionally they looked back hoping that the white and red of daria's sails would glint in the sound there was no sign of daria yenifer caught sight of the ruddy mane of krach and krate the yarl askeliga one of the last to disembark from ringhorn's deck towering above the other heads the yarl was yelling orders giving instructions checking taking care of things two women with their eyes fixed on him one fair and the other dark were weeping with joy the yarl finally certain he had seen to and made sure of everything walked over to the women it braced them both in a bear hug and kissed them and then raised his head and saw yenifer his eyes blazed and his weather-beaten face hardened like the stone of a reef like a brass shield boss he knows thought the sorceress news spreads quickly even while still on board ship the yarl found out about my being caught in a net in the sound beyond spikerook he knew he'd find me and care trolled magic or carrier pigeons he walked unhurriedly towards her he smelled of the sea of salt tar and exhaustion she looked into his bright eyes and immediately the war cries of the berserkers the banging of shields and the clanging of swords and battle axes resounded in her ears the screaming of men being killed the screaming of men jumping into the sea from the burning daria yin fara vengeberg krach an krit jalas geliege she bowed slightly before him he didn't return the bow not good she thought he immediately saw the bruise a souvenir of a blow with an oar his face hardened again and his lips twitched revealing his teeth for a second whoever struck you will answer for it no one struck me i tripped on the stairs he considered her intently and then shrugged if you don't want to tell tales that's your business i have no time to launch an inquiry now listen carefully because these will be the only words i shall utter to you very well tomorrow you'll be put on a long ship and shipped to novigrad you'll be handed over to the town authorities there and afterwards to the temerian or radanian authorities whichever comes forward first and i know that both desire you just as ardently is that everything almost just one more clarification which you in truth deserve skelliger has quite often given refuge to people being hunted by the law there is no shortage of opportunities and occasions on the isles to atone for one's guilt through hard work fortitude sacrifice and blood but not in your case yenifer i shall not give you refuge if you counted on it then you must calculate it i detest people like you 
I detest people who stir up trouble in order to gain power, who are driven by self-interest, who plot with the enemy and betray those to whom they owe not only obedience but also gratitude. I detest you, Yennefer. At the very moment you and your rebel comrades began inciting the rebellion on Thaneth at the instigation of Nilfgaard, my longships were fighting in Atari. My boys were coming to the aid of the insurrectionists there. Three hundred of my boys squared up to two thousand black cloaks. Valour and fidelity must be rewarded, just as wickedness and treachery must be punished. How am I to reward those who fail? With cenotaphs? With inscriptions carved into obelisks? No, I shall reward and honour the fallen differently. Your blood, Yennefer, will trickle between the planks of the scaffold in exchange for their blood which soaked into the dunes of Atri. I'm not guilty. I didn't participate in Vilgefort's plot. You will present proof of that to the judges. I will not judge you. You already have. You've even pronounced sentence. Enough talk. I've spoken. Tomorrow at dawn, you'll sail in manacles to Novigrad to stand before the royal court to receive a just punishment. And now, give me your word you won't try to use magic. And if I don't? Marquard, our sorcerer, died on Thaneth. We no longer have a mage who could get you under control. But know this. You will be under the permanent observation of Skellige's finest bowmen. If you so much as move a hand suspiciously, you'll be shot. Very well, she nodded. Then I give my word. Splendid. Thank you. Farewell, Yennefer. I shall not be escorting you tomorrow. Crach, he turned on his heel. Yes. I don't have the slightest intention of boarding a ship to Novigrad. I don't have the time to prove my innocence to Dykstra. I can't risk discovering they've already fabricated proof of my guilt. I can't risk dying of a sudden cerebral hemorrhage or committing suicide in my cell in some spectacular way soon after my arrest. I can't waste time or take such a risk. Nor may I explain to you why it is so risky for me. I shan't sail to Novigrad. He gazed long at her. You won't sail, he restated. What permits you to think like that? Is it that we once shared love's delights? Don't count on that, Yennefer. Let bygones be bygones. I know, and I'm not counting on it. I shan't sail to Novigrad Jarl because I must go and help someone I vowed never to leave alone and helpless. And you, Krach and Krait, Jarl of Skellige, will help me in my undertaking because you took a similar vow. Ten years ago, right here on the wharf where we stand, to the same person, to Ciri, the granddaughter of Calanthe, the lion cub of Sintra. I... Yennefer of Wengerberg regards Siri as my daughter, which is why I demand on her behalf that you keep your vow. Keep it, Krach and Krait, Jarl of Skellige. Really? Krach and Krait made sure once again. You won't even try them. None of these dainties. Really? The Jarl did not insist, but took a lobster from the dish laid it on a board and split it lengthwise with a powerful, though extremely accurate, blow with a cleaver. After sprinkling it liberally with lemon juice and garlic sauce, he began eating the flesh straight from the shell with his fingers. Yennefer ate in a dignified manner, using a silver knife and fork, but it was a mutton chop with spinach specially prepared for her by the astonished and probably slightly offended cook. Because the sorceress didn't want oysters, or mussels, or salmon marinated in its own juice, or gurnard and cockle soup, or stewed monkfish tail, or roast swordfish, or fried moray eel, or octopus, or crab, or lobster, or sea urchin, or, especially, fresh seaweed. She associated everything that even faintly smelled of the sea with Fringilla Vigo and Philippa Eilhart, 
with the insanely dangerous teleportation, the fall into the sea, the seawater she had swallowed, and the net which had been thrown over her, to which, incidentally, had been stuck seaweed and algae identical to that on the dish. Seaweed and algae smashed against her head and shoulders, along with the excruciatingly painful blows from a pine oar. So then, Krach resumed the conversation, sucking the flesh from the legs of the lobster after cracking open the joints. I've decided to put my faith in you, Yennefer. I'm not doing it for you, though. Be aware of that. Blood, Gaius, the blood oath I gave Calanthe, does indeed tie my hands. So, if your intention to go to Ciri's aid is genuine and heartfelt, and I presume it is, I have no choice. I must help you with your scheme. Thank you. But rid yourself of that pompous tone, please. I repeat, I didn't take part in the plot on Thaneth. Believe me. Is it really so important what I believe? He flared up. You ought rather to begin with the kings, with Dykstra, whose agents are tracking you the length and breadth of the world, with Philippa Eilhart and the sorcerers loyal to the kings, from whom, as you yourself admitted, you fled here to Skellige. You ought to present them with proof. I have no proof, she interrupted angrily stabbing her fork into a Brussels sprout the offended cook had boiled to go with the mutton chop. But if I had, they wouldn't let me present it. I can't explain it to you. I'm forbidden from speaking. Take my word for it, Krach. Please. I said, I know, she interrupted. You pledged your help. Thank you. But you still don't believe in my innocence. Believe me. Krach threw aside the sucked-out lobster's shell and drew a bowl of mussels closer. He rummaged around, rattling them, taking out the bigger ones. Very well, he finally said, wiping his hands on the tablecloth. I believe you, because I want to believe. But I shall not give you refuge or protection. I cannot. You may, though, leave Skelliger whenever you wish and make for wherever you wish. I'd advise haste. You came here, so to speak, on the wings of magic. Others may follow you. They can also work magic. I'm not looking for a refuge or a safe hideaway, Jarl. I must go and rescue Siri. Siri, he repeated, lost in thought. The lion cub. She was a queer child. Was? Oh, he flared up again. I expressed myself badly. Was, because she is no longer a child. That's all I meant. That's all. Cyrilla, the lion cub of Sintra. She spent her summers and winters on Skellige. She was often mischievous. She was a young devil, not a lion cub. Oh, damn it, I said was a second time. Yennefer, rumours find their way here from the mainland. Some say Ciri is in Nilfgaard. She's not in Nilfgaard. Others that the girl is dead. Yennefer said nothing biting her lip. But I reject the second rumour, the Jarl said firmly. Ciri's alive, I'm certain. There have been no signs. She's alive. Yennefer raised her eyebrows, but didn't ask any questions. They were silent for a long time, listening intently to the roar of the waves crashing against the rocks of Ardskelik. Yennefer, Krach said, after another moment's silence. Yet more tidings have reached us from the continent. I know that your witcher, who hid in Brokelon after the affray on Thaned, set off from there with the aim of reaching Nilfgaard and freeing Ciri. I repeat, Ciri is not in Nilfgaard. I know not what my witcher, as you choose to describe him, is planning. But he... Krach, it's no secret that I... I'm fond of him, but I know he won't rescue Siri. He won't achieve anything. I know him. He'll become entangled in something, get lost, start philosophizing and feeling sorrow for himself. Then he'll vent his rage, hacking whatever and whoever he can to pieces with his sword. Afterwards, to atone for it, he'll carry out some noble but senseless feat. Then finally, he'll be killed foolishly senselessly, probably by a stab in the back. They say, 
Crack quickly interjected, alarmed by the sorceress's ominously changing, strangely trembling voice. They say Siri is bound to him by destiny. I saw it myself back in Sintra during Pavetta's betrothal. Destiny, Yennefer interrupted sharply, can be interpreted in many, many different ways. Anyway, let's not waste time on digressions. I repeat, I don't know what Geralt's plans are or even whether he has any. I mean to get down to work myself, using my own methods, and actively, Krach, actively. I'm not accustomed to sitting and weeping, holding my head in both hands. I act. The Jarl raised his eyebrows, but said nothing. I shall take action, the sorceress repeated. I've already devised a plan, and you, Krach, will assist me with it, in accordance with your vow. I'm ready, he announced firmly, for anything. The longships are moored in the harbour. Give the order, Yennefer. She couldn't stifle a snort of laughter. Always the same. No, Krach, no demonstrations of bravery and manliness. It won't be necessary to sail to Nilfgaard and plunge a battle-axe into the lock of the city of the Golden Towers. I need less spectacular but more tangible help. What's the state of your treasury? I beg your pardon. Jarl, Krach and Crate. The help I need is expressible in cash. It began the next day, at dawn. A frantic commotion broke out in the chambers put at Yennefer's disposal, which Seneschal Guthlaf, who had been assigned to the sorceress, was having great difficulty controlling. Yennefer was sitting at a table, almost not raising her head from various papers. She was counting, totting up columns and doing calculations, which were immediately rushed to the treasury and the island branch of Chianfianelli's bank. She was making drawings and charts, which immediately ended up in the hands of craftsmen, alchemists, goldsmiths, glaziers and jewellers. Everything went smoothly for a while, and then the problems began. I'm sorry, my lady, Seneschal Guthlaf said slowly, but if there isn't any, there isn't any. We gave you everything we had. We can't make magic or do miracles. And I'll take the liberty of observing that what's lying before you, madam, are diamonds with a combined value of... What do I care about their combined value? She snorted. I need one, but a suitably large one. How large, Master Jeweler? The lapidary looked again at the drawing. In order to make that cut and those facets, a minimum of thirty carats. There's no such stone, Guthlaf stated categorically, on the whole of Skelliger. That's not true, the jeweller contradicted. There is. How do you imagine this playing out, Yennefer? Krachan Hreit frowned. I'm to send armed men to storm and then plunder the temple, and to threaten the priestesses with my wrath if they don't give up the diamond. It's out of the question. I'm not especially religious, but a temple's a temple, and priestesses are priestesses. I can only ask politely. Hint at how much it matters to me, and how great my gratitude will be. But it will still only be a request, a humble supplication. That may be denied? Indeed, but there's no harm in trying. What are we risking? Let's sail to Hindusfjall together, and present the supplication. I'll give the priestesses to understand what's needed, but then everything will be in your hands. Negotiate. Present your arguments. Try bribery. Pique the ambition. Appeal to higher reasons. Despair, weep, sob, beg for mercy. Call on all the sea devils. Must I teach you, Yennefer? It'll all be for nothing, Krach. A sorceress will never reach agreement with priestesses. Certain differences of our outlook are too marked. And when it comes to permitting a sorceress to use a sacred relic or artifact, no, we'd better forget it. There's no chance. What do you actually need that diamond for? To build a window. I mean a telecommunicational megascope. I have to talk to several people. Magically? At a distance? If it was enough to climb to the top of Care Trolder and shout loudly, I wouldn't be bothering you. 
The gulls and petrels circling above the water clamoured. The red-beaked oyster-catchers nestling on the steep rocks and reefs of Hindusfjall squealed shrilly, and yellow-headed gannets screeched hoarsely and gaggled. The glistening green eyes of black-crested cormorants watched attentively as the launch sailed past. That large rock suspended above the water, pointed out Krach and Crate, leaning on the rail, is Keir Hemdal, Hemdal's watchtower. Hemdal is our mythical hero. Legend has it that with the coming of Teth de Reith, the time of the end, the time of white frost and the wolfish blizzard, Hemdal will face the evil powers from the land of Morherhu, the phantoms, demons and spectres of chaos. He will stand on the rainbow bridge and blow his horn to signal that it is time to take up arms and fall into battle array for Ragnarok, the last battle, which will decide if night is to fall or dawn to break. The launch skipped nimbly over the waves, entering the calmer waters of the bay between Hemdall's watchtower and another rock of similarly fantastic contours. That smaller rock is Kambi, the Jarl explained. In Ur myths, the name Kambi is borne by a magical golden cock whose crowing will warn Hemdall of the approach of Naglfar, the hellish longboat carrying the army of darkness, the demons and phantoms of Moherhu. Naglfar is built from corpses' fingernails. You wouldn't believe it, Yennefer, but there are still people on Skelliger who cut the nails of the dead before burial so as not to supply the spectres of Moherhu with building materials. I would. I know the power of legend. The fjord protected them a little from the wind, and the sail fluttered. Sound the horn, Krach ordered his crew. We're reaching the shore. We ought to inform the pious ladies that were paying them a visit. The building, located at the head of a long stone staircase, looked like a gigantic hedgehog, so overgrown was it by moss, ivy and bushes. Yennefer observed that not just bushes, but even small trees were growing on the roof. This is the temple, Krach confirmed. The grove surrounding it is called Hindar and is also a place of worship. It's here that people gather the sacred mistletoe, and on Skelliger, as you know, people garnish and decorate everything with it, from a newborn's cradle to a grave. Have a care, the steps are slippery. The moss <laughs> is almost choking religion. Let me take your arm. As ever, that same perfume. Oh, Yena, Krach, please, let bygones be bygones. I beg your pardon. Let's go on. Several silent young priestesses were waiting outside the temple. The Jarl greeted them courteously and expressed a wish to talk to their superior, whom he called Modrum Sigurdrifer. They went inside to a space lit by shafts of light shining from stained glass windows set high up. One of them was shining on the altar. By a hundred sea devils, Krach and Krait muttered. I'd forgotten how large Brzingerman was. I haven't been here since I was a child. You could probably buy all the shipyards in Sedaris with it, along with the labourers and the annual output. The Jarl was exaggerating, but not by much. A statue of Modron Freya, the great mother, in her typical maternal aspect, a woman in flowing robes revealing her advanced state of pregnancy, which the sculptor had accented inordinately, towered above the modest marble altar, above figures of cats and falcons, above a stone basin for votive offerings. She stood with bowed head and facial features hidden by a scarf. Over the goddess's arms, which were folded on her chest, was a diamond one element of a gold necklace. The diamond was tinged slightly blue, like the clearest water. It was large, a hundred and fifty carats or so. It wouldn't even need cutting, Yennefer whispered. It's a rosette, exactly what I need. Facets, perfect for diffracting light. That means we're lucky. I doubt it. The priestesses will soon appear, and I, being a heathen, will be sworn at and ejected. Are you exaggerating? Not in the slightest. Welcome, Jarl, to the temple of the mother. And I welcome you too, 
O Honourable Yennefer of Fingerberg. Crach and Crate bowed. Greetings, esteemed Mother Sigurdrifer. The priestess was tall, almost as tall as Crach, which meant she was a head taller than Yennefer. She had fair hair and pale eyes, and an oval, none too pretty and none too feminine face. I've seen her somewhere before, thought Yennefer. Not so long ago. Where? On the steps of Kjertrolder, leading to the harbour, the priestess recalled with a smile. When the longboats were coming in from the sound, I stood over you as you helped a pregnant woman who was about to miscarry. On your knees, worrying not at all about your very costly camlet dress. I saw it, and I shall never more pay heed to tales of cold-hearted and calculated sorceresses. Yennefer coughed softly and lowered her head in a bow. You are standing before the altar of the mother, Yennefer. May her grace fall on you. Esteemed mother, I... I wish... Humbly to ask you, say nothing. Jarl, you are no doubt very busy. Leave us alone here on Hindusfjall. We will manage to come to an agreement. We are women. It is unimportant what we are engaged in or who we are. We always serve she who is the virgin, the mother and the crone. Kneel beside me, Yennefer. Lower your head before the mother. Take Brisingaman from the goddess's neck, Sigurdrifa repeated, and there was more disbelief than righteous indignation in her voice. No, Yennefer, it is quite impossible. The point is not even that I would not dare. Even if I did, Brisingaman cannot be removed. The necklace has no clasp. It is permanently bonded to the statue. Yennefer, stayed silent for a long while, calmly eyeing up the priestess. Had I known, she said coldly, I would have set sail at once for Ardskelig with the Jarl. No, no, by no means do I regard the time spent talking to you as wasted. But I have very little of it, very little indeed. Your kindness and warmth beguiled me somewhat, I confess. I am well disposed towards you. Sigurdrifa interrupted unemotionally. I also support your plans with all my heart. I knew Siri. I liked the child, and her fate moves me. I admire you for the determination with which you hope to go to the girl's rescue. I shall grant your every wish, but not Brisingaman, Yennefer. Not Brisingaman. Do not ask for that. Sigurdrifa, in order to go to Ciri's rescue, I urgently need some information. Without it, I'll be helpless. I can only acquire the knowledge I need through telecommunication. In order to communicate at a distance, I must construct a magical artifact, a, a megascope, using magic. A device something like your notorious crystal balls. Considerably more complex. Crystal balls only permit telecommunication with another correlated crystal ball. Even the local Dwarven Bank has a crystal ball for talking to another at headquarters. A megascope has somewhat greater capabilities. But why theorise? Without the diamond, nothing will come of it anyhow. Well, I shall say farewell. Don't hurry so. Sigurdrifa stood up and passed through the nave, stopping before the altar and the statue of Modron Freya. The goddess, she said, is also the patron of soothsayers, clairvoyants, telepaths, as symbolised by her sacred animals, the cat, which sees and hears, itself unseen, and the falcon, which sees from above. And by the jewel of the goddess, Brisingaman, the necklace of clairvoyance. Why build some looking and listening device, Yennefer? Wouldn't it be simpler? to ask the goddess for help. Yennefer stopped herself from swearing at the last moment. After all, it was a place of worship. The time for evening prayers is approaching, Sigurdrifa continued. I shall devote myself to meditation along with the other priestesses. I shall ask the goddess for help for Siri. 
for Siri, who was here many times in this temple, and looked at Brisingamon around the neck of the great mother many times. Sacrifice one more hour or two of your precious time, Yennefer. Stay here with us for the time of worship. Support me as I pray, with your thoughts and presence. Sigurdrifa, please, do it for me and for Siri. The jewel Brisingamon on the goddess's neck. She stifled a yawn. Had there only been some singing, she thought, some incantation, some mystery, some mystic folklore. It would have been less boring. She wouldn't be feeling so drowsy. But they were simply kneeling with bowed heads, motionless, soundless. But they're capable, when they want to, of using the power, at times just as well as we sorceresses. It's still a mystery how they do it, without any preparations, any learning, any studies, just prayer and meditation. Divination? Some kind of auto-hypnosis. That's what Desire de Vries claims. They absorb energy unconsciously in a trance, and they acquire the ability to transform it into something like our spells. They transform energy, treating it as a gift and favour of the Godhead. Faith gives them strength. Why have we sorceresses never succeeded with anything like that? Ought I to try? Using the atmosphere and aura of this place? I could enter a trance myself, couldn't I? If only by gazing at the diamond. Prisingamon. Intensively thinking about how marvellously it would function in my megascope. Brisingamon, shining like the morning star, there in the gloom, in the smoke of incense and smouldering candles. Yennefer? She jerked her head up. It was dark in the temple. It smelled strongly of smoke. Did I fall asleep? Forgive me. There's nothing to forgive. Come with me. Outside, the night sky burned with a twinkling luminosity that changed like the colours in a kaleidoscope. The northern lights? Yennefer rubbed her eyes in amazement. The Aurora Borealis? In August? How much are you capable of sacrificing, Yennefer? I beg your pardon? Are you prepared to sacrifice yourself, your priceless magic? Sigurdrifa, she said with anger, don't try your sublime tricks on me. I'm ninety-four years old, but treat that, please, as a confessional secret. I'm only confiding in you so you'll understand I can't be treated like a child. You didn't answer my question. And I don't mean to, for it's the mysticism I don't accept. I fell asleep during your worship. It wearied and bored me, because I don't believe in your goddess. Sigurdrifa turned away, and Jennifer took a very deep breath in spite of herself. Your disbelief is not very flattering to me, said a woman with eyes filled with molten gold. But does your disbelief change anything? All Jennifer could do was to breathe out. The time will come, said the golden-eyed woman when absolutely no one, including children, will believe in sorceresses. I tell you that with deliberate spite, by way of revenge. Let us leave. No, Yennefer finally managed. No, I won't go anywhere. Enough of this. It's an enthrallment or, or hypnosis, an illusion, a trance. I have developed defense mechanisms, I can dispel all this with one charm, just like that. Damn it! The golden-eyed woman came closer. The diamond in her necklace burned like the morning star. Your speech is slowly ceasing to serve as communication, she said. It is becoming art for art's sake. The more incomprehensible it is, the more profound and wise it is considered. 
In sooth, I preferred you when you could only say ug and oo. Come. This is an illusion, a trance. I won't go anywhere. I don't want to force you. It would be a disgrace, for you're an intelligent and proud girl. You have character. A plain, a sea of grass, a moor, a boulder jutting from the heather like the back of a crouching predator. You desired my jewel, Yennefer. I cannot give it to you without first making sure of a few things. I want to check what is deep inside you. Therefore, I have brought you here, to this place of power and might from time immemorial. Your priceless magic is apparently everywhere. Apparently, it's sufficient to merely hold out one's hand. Are you afraid to hold it out? Yennefer couldn't utter a sound from her tight throat. Are then chaos, art and learning, said the woman, whose name could not be uttered. According to you, the powers capable of changing the world? A curse, a blessing and progress? And aren't they, by any chance, faith, love, sacrifice? Do you hear? The cock, Camby, is crowing. The waves are breaking against the shore. Waves pushed by Naglafar's prow. The horn of Hemdol sounds as he stands facing his enemies on the rainbow-coloured arch of Bifrost. The white frost is nigh. A gale and a blizzard are nigh. The earth trembles from the writhing movements of the serpent. The wolf devours the sun. The moon turns black. There is only coldness and darkness. Hatred, vengeance, and blood. Whose side will you be on, Yennefer? Will you be on the east or the west side of Bifrost? Will you be with Hemdall or against him? The cock can be is growing. Decide, Yennefer. Choose. Only for this reason were you restored to life, that you might make a choice at the right moment. Light or darkness? Good and evil, light and darkness, order and chaos, they are but symbols. In reality, no such polarity exists. Brightness and gloom are in each of us, a little of one and a little of the other. This conversation is pointless, pointless. I will not come over to mysticism. To you and Sigurdrifa, the wolf is devouring the sun. To me, it's an eclipse. And may it remain that way. Remain? What? She felt her head spinning, felt some horrendous force twisting her arms, wrenching the joints in her shoulders and elbows, racking her vertebrae as though she were being tortured. She screamed in pain, thrashed around and opened her eyes. No, it wasn't a dream. It couldn't be a dream. She was on a tree, hanging arms akimbo from the boughs of a gigantic ash. High above her, a falcon circled. Below her, on the ground, in the gloom, she heard the hiss of snakes, the rustling of scales rubbing against each other. Something moved beside her. A squirrel ran across her tautened and aching shoulders. Are you ready? asked the squirrel. Are you ready to offer your sacrifice? What are you prepared to sacrifice? I... Have nothing. The pain blinded and paralyzed her. And even if I had, I don't believe in such a sacrifice. I don't want to suffer for millions. I don't want to suffer at all. For no one and in no one's stead. No one wants to suffer. But yet it is our lot. And some suffer more. Not necessarily by choice. The point is not the bearing of suffering. 
The point is how it is born. Yanka, dear Yanka. Take this hunchbacked monstrosity from me. I don't want to look at it. She's your daughter as much as she is mine. Indeed, the children I have sired are normal. How dare you? How dare you suggest? It was in your elven family that there were witches. It was you that aborted your first pregnancy. It was because of that. You have tainted elven blood and a tainted womb, woman. That's why you give birth to monsters. It is an ill-fated child. Such was the will of the gods. She's your daughter as much as she is mine. What was I to do? Smother her? Not tie the birth cord? What am I to do now? Take her to the forest and leave her? What do you want from me by the gods? Daddy! Mummy! Get away, you freak! How dare you? How dare you strike a child? Stop! Where are you going? Where? To her, are you? To her? Yes, woman. I'm a man. I'm free to sate my lust where and when I want, as is my natural right. And I loathe you. You and the fruit of your degenerate womb. Don't wait with supper. I won't be back tonight. M mummy Why are you weeping? Why are you beating me and pushing me away? I was good, wasn't I? Mummy. Dear Mummy. Are you capable of forgiveness? I forgave long ago, having first satisfied your lust for vengeance. Yes? Do you regret it? No. Pain. Searing pain in her mutilated hands and fingers. Yes, I'm guilty. Is that what you want to hear? A confession and remorse? You want to hear Yennefer of Vengerberg grovel and abase herself? No, I won't give you that pleasure. I admit my guilt and await my punishment, but you will not hear my remorse. The pain reached the limits of what a person can withstand. You blame me for the betrayed. The deceived, the abused, you blame me for those who died. Because of me, from their own hand, from my hand. For once having raised a hand against myself, you could see I had my reasons. And I regret nothing. Even if I could take back time, I regret nothing. The falcon alighted on her shoulder. The Tower of the Swallow. The Tower of the Swallow. Hurry to the Tower of the Swallow. Oh, daughter. The cock can be crows. Siri on a black mare at a gallop. Her ashen hair tousled by the wind. Blood sprays from her face, a vivid, intense red. The black mare soars like a bird, smoothly gliding over the top rail of a high gate. Siri sways in the saddle, but doesn't fall off. Siri amidst the night, amidst a stony, sandy wilderness with a raised arm. A glowing ball explodes from her hand. A unicorn churning up gravel with its hoof. Many unicorns. Fire. Fire. Geralt on a bridge. In combat, amidst fire, a flame reflected in his blade. Fringilla Vigo, her green eyes wide open in sexual ecstasy, her close-cropped head on an open book on the frontispiece. Part of the title is visible. Remarks on inevitable death. Geralt's eyes reflected in Fringilla's. A chasm, smoke, steps leading downwards, steps that must be descended. Something is ending. Ted Dareth, the time of the end is nigh. Darkness, dampness, the dreadful cold of stone walls, the cold of iron on wrists, on ankles, 
pain pulsing in mutilated hands, shooting down crushed fingers. Siri takes her by the hand. A long, dark corridor. Stone columns, perhaps statues. Darkness. In it. Whispers, soft as the soughing of the wind. A door. Endless doors with gigantic, heavy leaves open before them without a murmur. And finally, in the impenetrable darkness, a door which does not open by itself, which it is forbidden to open. If you are afraid, turn back. It is forbidden to open this door. You know that. I do. But yet you are leading me there. If you are afraid, turn back. There is still time to turn back. It is not yet too late. And you? For me it is. The cock can be is growing. Ted Dyreath has come. The Aurora Borealis. Dawn. Yennefer, wake up. She jerked her head up. She glanced down at her hands. She had both of them, intact. Sigurdrifa, I fell asleep. Come. Where to? She whispered. Where to this time? I beg your pardon. I don't understand. Come, you must see it. Something has happened. Something strange. None of us knows how to explain it. But I can guess. Grace. The goddess has bestowed her grace on you, Yennefer. What do you mean, Sigurdrifa? Look. She looked and sighed aloud. Brisingerman. The sacred jewel of Modron Freya was no longer hanging around the goddess's neck. It was lying at her feet. Did I hear that correctly? Krachan Krait asked. You're moving to Hindusfjall with your magical workshop. The priestesses will make the sacred diamond available to you. They'll let you use it in your infernal machine. Yes. Well, well, Yennefer. Have you perhaps had a conversion? What happened on the island? Never you mind. I'm returning to the temple, and that's that. And the financial resources you asked for, will they still be necessary? I'd say so. The Seneschal Guthlaf will carry out each of your relevant instructions. But, Yennefer, issue them quickly. Make haste. I've received fresh tidings. Damn it. I was afraid of that. Do they know where I am? No, not yet. I was warned, though that you may appear on Skelliger, and was ordered to imprison you immediately. I was also ordered to take prisoners on my expeditions and extract information from them, even if it was only scraps concerning you and your sojourn in Nilfgaard or in the provinces. Yennefer, hurry. If they tracked you and caught you here on Skelliger, I would find myself in a somewhat difficult situation. I'll do everything in my power, including whatever it takes to avoid compromising you. Don't worry. Krach grinned. I said somewhat. I'm not afraid of them. Not of kings, nor of sorcerers. They can't do anything to me because they need me. And I was bound to help you by a feudal oath. Yes, yes, you heard right. I'm still formally a vassal of the Sintran crown, and Cyrilla has formal rights to that crown. By representing Cyrilla... By being her sole guardian, you have the formal right to give me orders, demand obedience and servitudes. Causistic sophistries. Well, certainly, he snorted. I will shout as much myself in a booming voice, if in spite of everything it turns out, Emir Var Emris really has forced the girl to marry. Also, if, by the help of some legal loopholes and flourishes, Siri has been deprived of the right to the throne, and someone else has been named as a substitute heir, including that lummox Visigerd, then I'll announce my obedience and declare my feudal oath forthwith. But if, Yennefer squinted, in spite of everything, it turns out that Siri is dead, 
She's alive, Krach said firmly. I know that for certain. How? You won't want to give it credence. Try me. The blood of the queens of Sintra, Krach began, is uncannily bound to the sea. When one of the women of that blood dies, the sea falls into sheer madness. It's said that Ardskalig bewails the daughters of Rhiannon, for the storm is so strong then that the waves striking from the west squeeze through crevices and caverns to the east side, and suddenly salt brooks gush from the rock, and the entire island shudders. Simple folk say, see how Ardskalig sobs. Someone has died again. Rhiannon's blood has died. The elder blood. Yennefer was silent. It's not a fairy tale, Krach continued. I've seen it for myself, with my own eyes. Three times, following the death of Adalia, the soothsayer, following the death of Calanthe, and following the death of Pavetta, Ciri's mother. Pavetta, Yennefer observed, actually perished during a storm, so it's hard to speak. Pavetta, Krach interrupted, still deep in thought, did not perish during a storm. The storm began after her death. The sea reacted as it always does to the death of one of the Sintran bloodline. I've investigated that matter long enough and am certain of what I know. Meaning what? The ship Pavetta and Duni were sailing on vanished over the infamous Sedner Abyss. It wasn't the first ship to vanish there. You no doubt know that. Fairy tales. Ships meet with disasters. It's a natural thing. On Skelliger, he interrupted quite firmly. We know enough about ships and sealing to be able to distinguish between natural and unnatural disasters. Ships go down unnaturally over the Sedna Abyss, and not accidentally. That includes the ship Pavetta and Duni were sailing on. I'm not arguing, the sorceress sighed. Anyway, does that have any meaning to us, after almost fifteen years? It does to me. The Jarl pursed his lips. I shall unravel the case. That's only a matter of time. I'll find out. I'll find an explanation. I'll find an explanation to all the enigmas, including the one from the slaughter of Sintra. What enigma would that be? When the Nilfgaardians invaded Sintra, he muttered, looking her in the eyes. Calanthe ordered Ciri, spirited out of the town. But the town was already aflame. Black cloaks were everywhere. The chances of getting out of the siege were faint. The queen was advised against such a risky business, and it was suggested that Ciri formally capitulate before the hetmans of Nilfgaard, thus saving her life and the Sintran state. In the blazing streets, she would surely and senselessly have died at the hands of the soldierly mob. But the lioness... Do you know what, according to eyewitnesses, she said? No. It would be better for the girl's blood to flow over the cobbles of Sintra than for it to be defiled. Defiled by what? Marriage to Emperor Emir, a filthy Nilfgaardian. Jarl, it's late. I begin tomorrow at dawn. I shall inform you of my progress. I'm counting on it. Good night, Yenna. Hmm. What, Krach? You wouldn't, by any chance, mm, fancy. No, Jarl. Let bygones be bygones. Good night. Well, well. Krach and Krait received his guest with a tilt of his head. Triss Merigold in person. What a stunning dress, and the fur. Chinchilla, isn't it? I would ask what brings you to Skaliger, if I didn't know, but I do. Wonderful. Triss smiled seductively and neatened her gorgeous chestnut hair. It's wonderful that you know, Jarl. It will save us the introduction and the preliminary explanations, and allow us to get to business right away. What business? Krach crossed his arms on his chest and glared at the sorceress. What ought to precede introductions? What explanations are you counting on? Who do you represent, Triss? In whose name have you come here? 
King Voltest, whom you served, released you from service with banishment. Although you weren't at fault, he banished you from Tameria. Philippa Eilhart, I've heard, who, along with Dykstra, is presently ruling de facto in Redania, has taken you under her wing. I see that you're repaying for the asylum as well as you can. You don't even flinch at assuming the role of secret agent in order to track down your old friend. You wrong me, Jarl. I humbly beg your pardon, if I'm in error. Am I? They were silent for a long while, eyeing each other up mistrustfully. Triss finally snorted, swore and stamped a high heel. Oh, to hell with it! Let's stop leading each other by the nose! What difference does it make now? Who's serving whom? Who's siding with whom? Who's keeping faith with whom and with what motives? Yennefer's dead. It's still not known where or in whose grasp Siri is. What's the point of playing at secrets? I didn't sail here as a spy crack. I came on my own initiative as a private individual, driven by concern for Siri. Everyone is concerned about Siri. Lucky girl. Triss's eyes flashed. I wouldn't sneer at that, particularly in your place. I beg your pardon? They said nothing, looking out of the window at the red sun setting beyond the wooded peaks of Spikarug. Tris Merigold. Yes, O oh Jarl? I invite you to supper. Ah, the cook told me to ask if all sorceresses disdain finely cooked seafood. Tris did not disdain seafood. On the contrary, she ate twice as much as she had intended and now began to worry about her waistline, about the twenty-two inches she was so proud of. She decided to ease her digestion with some white wine, the celebrated Est Est of Toussaint. Like Krach, she drank from a horn. And so, she took up the conversation, Yennefer showed up here on the 19th of August, falling spectacularly from the sky into some fishing nets, you, as a faithful vassal of Sintra, granted her asylum, helped her to build a megascope, with whom and about what she talked, you, of course, don't know. Krach and Krait drank deeply from the horn and suppressed a burp. I don't know, he smiled craftily. Of course I don't know. How could I, a poor and simple sailor, know anything about the doings of mighty sorceresses? Sigurdrifa, the priestess of Modern Freya, let her head drop low, as though Krach and Krait's question had burdened her with a thousand-pound weight. She trusted me, Jarl, she muttered barely audibly. She didn't demand of me the swearing of an oath of silence, but she naturally cared about discretion. I really don't know whether... Modern Sigurdrifa, Krach and Krait interrupted gravely. I'm not asking you to act as an informer. Like you, I support Yennefer. Like you, I desire to find and rescue Siri. Why? I took blood gaius, a blood oath. Whereas, regarding Yennefer, concern for her motivates me. She's an extremely proud woman. Even when taking a very great risk, she doesn't stoop to making requests. Therefore, it will be necessary, I can't rule it out, to come to her aid unasked. In order to do that, I need information. Sigurdrifa cleared her throat. She wore an uneasy expression, and when she began to speak, her voice slightly quavered. She built that machine of hers. In essence, it's not a machine at all, because there's no mechanism. Just two looking glasses, a black velvet curtain, a box, two lenses, four lamps. Well, and Brisingaman, of course. When she utters the spell... The light from the two lamps falls. Let's leave out the details. Who did she communicate with? She spoke to several persons. With sorcerers. Jarl, I didn't hear everything, but what I heard. Among them are truly wicked people. None wanted to help disinterestedly. They demanded money. They all demanded money. I know, Krach muttered. The bank informed me of the money orders she issued. A pretty, oh, a pretty penny my oath is costing me. But money comes and goes. What I spent on Yennefer and Siri, I shall make good in the Nilfgaardian provinces. But go on, O oh Mother Sigurdrifa. Yennefer, the priestess lowered her head. 
blackmailed some of them. She gave them to understand she was in possession of compromising information, and in the event of cooperation being declined, she would reveal it to the whole world. Jarl, she's a clever and essentially good woman, but she doesn't have any scruples. She is ruthless and merciless. Indeed, as I know. But I don't want to know the details of the blackmail, and I advise you to forget about them as quickly as you can. It's dangerous knowledge. Outsiders shouldn't meddle with fire like that. I know, Jarl. I owe you obedience, and I believe that your ends justify your means. No one shall learn anything from me, neither a friend in a convivial chat nor a foe torturing me. Good, Mordor and Zagadrifer. Very good. What did Yennefer's questions concern, do you recall? I didn't always overhear nor understand everything, Jarl. They were using jargon that was difficult to grasp. There was often talk of a Vilgerfotz. Of course. Krach audibly ground his teeth. The priestess glanced at him fearfully. They also spoke a lot about elves and about knowing ones, she continued, and about magical portals. There was also mention of the Sednar Abyss, but mainly, it seems to me, it concerned towers. Towers? Yes, two, the Tower of the Gull and the Tower of the Swallow. As I supposed, Triss said, Yennefer began by obtaining the secret report of Radcliffe's commission, which investigated the case of the events on Thanev. I don't know what news of this affair has reached you here on Skalika. Have you heard of the teleporter in the Tower of the Seagull? And about Radcliffe's commission? Krach and Crate glanced suspiciously at the sorceress. Neither politics nor culture reach the islands, he grimaced. We are backward. The Radcliffe commission... Triss did not deign to pay attention either to his tone nor his expression. Examined in detail, teleportational trails leading from Thaneth. The portal on the island Torlara, while it existed, negated all teleportational magic within a considerable radius. But as you certainly know, the Tower of the Gull exploded and disintegrated, making teleportation possible. Most of the participants in the events on Thaneth got off the island using portals they opened. As a matter of fact, the Jarl smiled. You, for example, flew straight to Brooklyn with the Witcher on your back. Well, I never. Triss looked him in the eye. Politics don't reach here. Culture doesn't reach here, but rumours do. But let's leave that for now. We'll return to the work of the Radcliffe Commission. The Commission's task was to determine precisely who teleported from Thaneth and whence. They used so-called synopses, spells capable of reconstructing an image of past events, and then collated the uncovered teleportational tracks with the directions they led to, as a result, ascribing them to the specific individuals who had opened the portals. They were successful in practically all cases, save one. One teleportational trail led nowhere. To be precise, into the sea. To the Sedna Abyss. Someone, the Jarl guessed at once, teleported onto a ship waiting in a previously agreed location. I just wonder why they went so far. And to such a notorious place. Well, what if a battle axe is hovering over your neck? Exactly. The Commission also thought of that, and voiced the following conclusion. It was Vilgefortz, who, having captured Ciri and having his other escape route cut off, took advantage of a reserve exit. He teleported with the girl to the Sedan Abyss, onto a Nilfgaardian ship waiting there. That, according to the Commission, explains the fact that Ciri was presented at the Imperial Court in Loch Grimm on the 10th of July, barely ten days after the events on Thaneth. Well, yes, the Jarl squinted. That would explain a lot, on condition, naturally, that the Commission wasn't mistaken. Indeed. The sorceress withstood his gaze and even afforded herself a mocking smirk. Naturally, a double, and not the real Siri, could just as easily have been presented in Loch Grimm. That may also explain a lot. It doesn't, though, explain one occurrence that the Radcliffe Commission established. 
so bizarre that, in the report's first version, it was passed over as too improbable. In the report's second and strictly confidential version, that occurrence was nonetheless presented as a hypothesis. I've been all ears for some time, Triss. The Commission's hypothesis reads, The teleporter in the Tower of the Gull was active, was functioning. Someone passed through it, and the energy of the passage was so powerful, the teleporter exploded and was destroyed. Yennefer, Triss continued a moment later, must have found out about it, what the Radcliffe Commission uncovered, what was included in the confidential report. That is, there's a chance, the slightest chance, that Ciri managed to pass safely through the Tor Lara portal, that she eluded Nilfgaard and Vilgefortz. Where is she then? I'd like to know that too. It was dreadfully dark. The moon, hidden behind banks of cloud, gave no light at all. But in comparison to the previous nights, there was almost no wind, and for that reason it was not so cold. The dugout only rocked gently on the slightly rippling water. It smelled like a swamp of decaying weed and eel slime. Somewhere by the bank, a beaver slapped its tail on the water, startling both of them. Siri was certain that Visogotta had been dozing and the beaver had woken him. Go on with the story, she said, wiping her nose with a clean part of her sleeve, not yet covered in slime. Don't sleep. When you doze off, my eyelids droop too. Then the current will take us and we'll wake up on the sea. Go on about these teleporters. When you escaped from Thanith, the hermit continued, you passed through the portal of the Tower of the Gull, Tor Lara, and Geoffrey Monk, probably the greatest authority in the field of teleportation, the author of the work entitled The Magic of the Elder Folk, which is the opus magnum of knowledge about elven teleporters, writes that the Tor Lara portal leads to the Tower of the Swallow, Tor Zirael. The teleport from Thaneth was warped, Siri interrupted. Perhaps long ago, before it broke, it led to some swallow or other. But now it leads to a desert. That's what we call a chaotic portal. I learned about it. I, just imagine, did too, the old man snorted. I recall much of that wisdom, which is why your story amazes me so much. Some parts of it, particularly the ones that concern teleportation. Could you speak more plainly? I could, Siri. I could. But now it's high time we hold in the net. It's sure to be full of eels. Ready? Ready. Siri spat on her hands and took hold of the gaff. Visogotta grasped the cord, speeding past in the water. Let's haul it in. One, two, three. Into the boat. Grab them, Siri. Grab them. Into the basket before they escape. It was the second night they had rowed the dugout to the river's boggy tributary, set nets and traps for the eels heading in great numbers towards the sea. They returned to the cottage well after midnight, smeared in slime from head to toe, wet and tired as hell. But they didn't go to bed at once. The hall earmarked for barter had to be put in crates and sealed securely. Should the eels find the smallest crack, there wouldn't be a single one left the next morning. After the work was done, Visagotta skinned two or three fat eels, chopped them into steaks, coated them in flour, and fried them in a huge frying pan. Then they ate and talked. You see, Siri, one thing still nags at me. I can't forget that right after your recovery, we couldn't agree about the dates, even though the wound on your cheek constituted the most precise of possible calendars. The cut couldn't have been more than ten hours old, while you insisted that they'd wounded you four days earlier. Though I was certain it came down to a simple mistake, I couldn't stop thinking about it. I kept asking myself the question, what happened to those four lost days? So, what do you think happened to them? I don't know. Well, that's marvellous. The cat made a long leap, and the mouse it pinned with its claws squeaked shrilly. The tomcat unhurriedly bit through its neck, 
disemboweled it, and began to eat it with relish. Siri watched it impassively. The Tower of the Gull teleporter, Visigotta began again, leads to the Tower of the Swallow. And the Tower of the Swallow... The cat ate the entire mouse, leaving the tail for dessert. The tall Lara teleporter, said Siri, yawning widely, is warped and leads to a desert. I've probably told you that a hundred times. That's not the point. I'm talking about something else, that there's a connection between the two teleporters. The tall Lara portal was warped, I agree, but there is also the Torzirail teleporter. If you could reach the Tower of the Swallow, you could teleport back to the Isle of Thanith. You would be far from the danger threatening you, out of reach of your enemies. Ah, oh, that would suit me. There's just one little snag. I have no idea where the Tower of the Swallow is. Perhaps I'll find a remedy for that. Do you know, Siri, what university studies give a person? No. What? The ability to make use of sources. I knew I'd find it, Visigotta said proudly. I searched and searched and... Oh, bugger! The armful of heavy tomes slipped through his fingers. Grimoires tumbled onto the threshing floor. Leaves fell from their decayed bindings and were strewn around haphazardly. What have you found? Siri kneeled beside him and helped him gather up the scattered pages. The Tower of the Swallow! The hermit drove away the tomcat, which had impudently settled on one of the leaves. Tor Zirel, help me. How dusty it is, and sticky. Visigotta, what's this? Here in this picture, that man hanging from a tree. This? Visigotta examined the loose leaf. A scene from the legend of Hemdal. The hero, Hemdal, hung from the ash of the worlds for nine days and nights to gain knowledge and power through sacrifice and pain. I've dreamed of something like that several times. Siri wiped her forehead. A man hanging from a tree. The engraving fell out of this book here. If you like, you can read more later. But now, the more important thing is... Ah, I have it at last. Peregrinations Along Trails and Magical Places by Boyvid Backhuysen, a book regarded by some as an apocryphal work. You mean it's poppycock? Something like that. But there were also those who valued the book. Here, listen. Ah, pox on it. How dark it is. There's enough light. You're going blind from old age, said Siri, with a detached cruelty befitting her age. Hand it over. I'll read it. Where from? Uh, from here, he pointed with a bony finger. Uh, read it aloud. That old boyvid wrote in weird language. I think Asengard was some castle or other, if I'm not mistaken. But what's this land? Kentlock? I've never heard of any such place. And what's Trefoil? Clover. And I'll tell you about Asengard and the Hundred Lakes when you finish reading. For the life of me, barely had the elf Avalach uttered those words than did hurry out from beneath the lake's waters those meagre black birds that had sheltered from the frost the whole winter at the bottom of the depths. For the swallow, as learned men know, does not fly south for the winter in the manner of other birds and return in the spring, but binds itself with its claws in great swarms and sinks to the bottom of the waters, there to spend the whole winter season, and only in the spring does it fly out de profundis from beneath the waters. Howbeit, that bird is not only the symbol of spring and hope, but also the model of unblemished purity, since it never alights on the ground, nor with earthly dirt and filth have any commerce. Let us, though, return to our lake. You would have said that the circling avians dispersed the fog with their wings, for tandem, a marvellous occult tower unexpectedly emerged from the vapour. And we sighed in awe with one voice, because it seemed to be a tower woven from mist, having fog as its fundamentum, and its top was crowned with the gleam of the aurora, an enchanted aurora borealis. Indeed, 
that tower must have been erected using powerful occult arts beyond human ken. The elf, Avalach, marked our oar and speak. This is Tor Zirel, the Tower of the Swallow. This is the Gate of Worlds and the Threshold of Time. Feast your eyes on this sight, man, for not to everyone nor always is it given. But when asked if we might approach and from proximity gaze on the tower or propria mano touch it, Avalach laughed. Tor Zirel, he spake, is for you a reverie, and reveries may not be touched. And a good thing it is, he added, for the tower serves only the few chosen, for whom the threshold of time is a gate of hope and rebirth. But for the profane, it is the portal of nightmare. Barely had he uttered those words than the fog fell once more and denied our eyes that enchanted prospect. The land of a hundred lakes, once called Kentloch, Visigotter explained, is called Mill Tractor today. It's a very vast lakeland, bisected by the river Yelena in the northern part of Metina, close to the border with Nazaire and Magturga. Boivid Backhuysen writes that they walked towards the lake from the north, from Asingard. But today, Asingard is no more. The only ruins remain, and the nearest town is Neunruith. Boivid counted four hundred furlongs from Asingard. Various furlongs have been used, but we'll accept the most popular reckoning, according to which four hundred and twenty furlongs gives around fifty miles. South of Asengard, which is about three hundred and fifty miles from us here in Periplut. In other words, there are more or less three hundred miles between you and the Tower of the Swallow, Siri. That's some two weeks riding on your Kelpie, in the spring, of course, not now, when the frosts may be upon us in a day or two. Asengard, which I was reading about, is a ruin today. Siri murmured, wrinkling her nose pensively. But I've seen the elven town of Sherawedh in Kaidwen with my own eyes. I've been there. People prized out and pillaged everything. They only left bare stone. I bet only stones remain of your Tower of the Swallow. The larger ones, because the smaller ones have probably been stolen. If there was a portal there as well. Tor Zirel was magical, not visible to everybody. And teleporters are never visible. True, she admitted and pondered. The one on Thaneth wasn't. It suddenly appeared on a bare wall. Actually, it appeared just in time because that mage who was chasing me was close by. I could hear him. And then the portal materialised as though I'd summoned it. I'm certain, Visigotta said softly, that if you reached Tor Zirel, that teleporter would also appear to you. Even in the ruins, amidst the bare stones. I'm certain you'd managed to find and activate it. And it, I'm certain, would obey your order. For I think, Siri, that you are the Chosen One. Your hair, Triss, is like fire in the candlelight, and your eyes are like lapis lazuli. Your lips are like coral. Stop that crack. Are you drunk or what? Pour me some more wine and talk. What about exactly? Come off it. About how Yennefer decided to sail to the Sedna Abyss. How goes it? Tell me, Yennefer. First of all, you answer my question. Who are the two women I invariably counter when I come to you, and who always give me looks usually reserved for cat shit on the carpet? Who are they? Are you interested in their formal and legal or actual status? The latter. In that case, they're my wives. I understand. Explain to them, when you get the chance, that bygones are bygones. I have. But women are women. Never mind. Speak, Yennefer. I'm interested in how your work is progressing. Unfortunately, the sorceress bit her lip. There's scant progress. And time's running out. It is, the owl nodded, and constantly supplying new sensations. 
I received news from the continent I'd ought to interest you. It comes from Visegerd's corps. You know, I hope, who Visegerd is. The general from Sintra? The marshal. He commands a corps made up of Sintran emigrants and volunteers within the Temerian army. Enough volunteers from the islands serve there for me to have first-hand news. And what do you have? You arrived here in Skelliger on the 19th of August, two days after the full moon. The same day, the 19th, I mean, Visegerd's corps picked up a group of fugitives during fighting by the Einar. Among them were Geralt and that troubadour friend of his, Dandelion. Quite. Visegerd accused both of spying, imprisoned and perhaps meant to execute them, but the two prisoners ran away and sent some Nilfgaardians, with whom they were reputedly in league, after Visegerd. Nonsense. I thought so too, but I can't get it out of my head that the Witcher, in spite of what you think is perhaps carrying out some cunning plan, wanting to rescue Ciri, he's worming his way into Nilfgaard's good graces. Ciri's not in Nilfgaard. And Geralt isn't carrying out any plans. Planning isn't his strong point. Let's leave it. What's important is that it's already the 26th of August, and I still know too little. Too little to undertake anything. Unless I was to... She fell silent, staring out of the window, playing with the obsidian star fastened to a black velvet ribbon. Where to what? Krach and Crate burst out. Rather than mocking Geralt, to try using his methods. I don't understand. One could try sacrifice, Jarl. Apparently, readiness to make sacrifices can pay off, produce favourable results, if only in the form of the grace of the goddess, who likes and esteems people who sacrifice themselves and suffer for a cause. I still don't understand, he said, wrinkling his brow. But I don't like what you're saying, Yennefer. I know. Neither do I. But still, I've gone too far. The tiger may already have heard the kids bleating. That's what I was afraid of, Triss whispered. That's precisely what I was afraid of. Which means I understood correctly. The muscles of Krach and Krait's jaw worked vigorously. Yennefer knew someone would eavesdrop on the conversations she was conducting using that infernal machine, or that one of her interlocutors would basely betray her, or the one and the other. She knew. Krach ground his teeth, but carried on regardless, because it was meant to be bait. Did she intend to be bait herself? Did she pretend to know more than she did in order to provoke the enemy? And she sailed to the Sedna Abyss. Throwing down the challenge. Provoking. She was taking an awful risk, Krach. I know. She didn't want to expose any of us to danger, apart from volunteers. So she asked for two longships. I have the two longships you asked for, Alkione and Tamara, and their crews, naturally. Alkiona will be commanded by Guthlaf, son of Svein. He asked for the honour, as he's taking a liking to you, Yennefer. Tamara will be commanded by Asa Tiazi, a captain in whom I have absolute faith. Aha, uh -huh, I almost forgot. Uh, my son, Hjalmar Rymouth, will also be in Tamara's crew. Your son? How old is he? Nineteen. You started early. That's the pot calling the kettle black. Hjalmar asked to be added to the crew for personal reasons. I couldn't turn him down. For personal reasons? You really don't know that story? No. Tell me. Krach and Krait drank from the horn and laughed at his recollections. Youngsters from Art Skellig, he began, love playing on skates during the winter. They can't wait for the icy weather. The first of them go out in the ice when the lake is barely icebound, so thin it wouldn't support adults. Races are the favourite spot, naturally, to gather speed and hurtle as fast as they can from one side of the lake to the other. Other boys compete at the so-called salmon leap. 
they have to jump in their skates over lakeside rocks sticking up from the ice like shark's teeth, like salmon leaping up waterfalls. You choose a suitably long row of rocks like that to get run up. Ha! <laughs> I'd jump like that when I was a scrawny kid. Crach and Crate fell into a reverie and smiled slightly. Oh, of course, he continued. Whoever jumps the longest row of rocks wins the competition and then struts around like a peacock. In my day, Yennefer, that honour often fell to your humble servant and present interlocutor. <laughs> During the time that interests us most, my son, Hjalmar, was the champion. He jumped over stones that none of the other boys dared to and paraded around with his nose in the air, challenging anyone to try and defeat him. And the challenge was taken up by Siri, daughter of Pavetta of Sintra. Not even an islander, though she thought of herself as one, since she'd spent more time here than there. Even after Pavetta's accident? I thought Calanthe had forbidden her from coming here. You know about that? He glanced at her keenly. Indeed, yes. You know a great deal, Yennefer. A great deal. Calanthe's rage and ban didn't last more than six months, and then Siri began to spend her summers and winters here again. She skated like a demon, but to compete at the salmon leap with the lads and challenge Shalmar, that was unbelievable. She leapt, the sorceress guessed. Yes, she did. The little Sintran half-devil leaped. A real lion cub from the lioness's blood. And Hjalmar, so as not to expose himself to ridicule, had to risk a jump over an even longer row of stones, which he did. He broke a leg, broke an arm, broke four ribs and smashed his face up. He'll have a scar for the rest of his life. Hjalmar Rymouth and his famous betrothed. Ha! <laughs> betrothed? Didn't you know about that? You know so much, but not that. She visited him when he was lying in bed recovering after his famous leap. She read to him, told him stories, held his little hand. And when someone entered the chamber, they both blushed like poppies. Well, finally, Hjalmar informed me they were betrothed. I almost had an attack of apoplexy. I'll teach you, you rascal. I'll give you a betrothal, but with a rawhide whip. And I was a bit anxious, for I'd seen that the lion cub was hot-headed, that everything about her was reckless, for she was a daredevil, not to say a little maniac. Fortunately, Hjalmar was covered in splints and bandages, so they couldn't do anything stupid. How old were they then? He was fifteen, she almost fifteen. I think your fears were a little exaggerated. Perhaps a little, but Calanthe whom I had to inform about everything, by no means made light of the matter. I knew she had marriage plans regarding Siri. I think it concerned the young Tancred Tyson of Kovir, and perhaps the Radanian, Radovid. I can't be certain. But rumours might have harmed the marriage plans, even rumours about innocent kisses or half-innocent caresses. Calanthe took Siri back to Sintra without a moment's delay. The girl kicked up a row, yelled and sobbed, but nothing helped. There was no arguing with the lioness of Sintra. Uh, afterwards, Hjalmar lay for two days with his face turned to the wall and didn't say a word to anyone. As soon as he had recovered, he planned to steal a skiff and sail to Sintra by himself. For that, he was strapped, and he put it behind him. But later... Krach and Krait went silent, fell into a reverie. Later, the summer came, then the autumn, and the entire Nilfgaardian might struck Sintra's southern wall through the Marnadal stairs, and Hjalmar found another opportunity to become a man. In Marnadal, at the Battle of Sintra and later at the Battle of Sodden, he faced the Black Cloaks valiantly. Later, too, when the longships sailed for the Nilfgaardian coasts, Hjalmar avenged his make-believe betrothed with sword in hand, even though people thought she was dead by then. I didn't believe it, because those phenomena I told you about didn't occur. Well, and now, when Hjalmar learned of the possible rescue expedition, he volunteered. Thanks for the story, Krach. It was restful for me to listen. I could forget about... my cares. When do you set off, Yennefer? 
In the coming days. Perhaps even tomorrow. It remains to me to perform one more final telecommunication. Krach and Krait's eyes were like a hawk's. They bored deeply to the very core. You don't by any chance know Triss Merigold, who Yennefer spoke to that last time before disassembling the infernal machine on the night of the 27th of August? With whom? Or about what? Triss hid her eyes behind her eyelashes. The beam of light diffracted by the diamond animated the surface of the looking glass with a flash. Yennefer extended both hands and intoned a spell. The blinding reflection transformed into a swirl of fog and an image quickly began to emerge from it. The image of a chamber whose walls were draped with a colourful tapestry. A movement in the window and an anxious voice. Who is it? Who's there? It's me, Tris. Yennefer, is that you? Oh, gods! How? Where are you? It isn't important where I am. Don't block for the image is flickering, and take away the candlestick, it's blinding me. I I've done it, of course. Though the hour was late, Triss Merigold was not in a negligee or in working clothes. She was wearing an evening gown, as usual, buttoned all the way up to the neck. May we talk freely? Of course. Are you alone? Yes. You're lying. Yennefer, don't trick me, girl. I know that expression. I've seen more than enough of it. You had one like that when you started sleeping with Geralt behind my back. You put on the identical innocent whorish little mask then that I see on your face now, and it means the same now as it did then. Triss blushed, and beside her in the window appeared Philippa Eilhart, dressed in a dark blue men's doublet with silver embroidery. Bravo, she said. Sharp as usual, acute as usual. As usual, difficult to comprehend and fathom. I'm glad to see you in good health, Yennefer. I'm glad that the crazy teleportation from Monte Calvo didn't end tragically. Let's assume you are indeed glad, Yennefer grimaced, although that's a most bold assumption. But we'll leave it. Who betrayed me? Is it important? Philippa shrugged. You've now been communicating for four days with traitors, with traitors to whom venality and treachery are second nature, and traitors whom you have forced to betray others in turn. One of them has betrayed you. That's the usual course of events. Don't tell me you didn't expect it. Of course I did, Yennefer snorted. I proved that by contacting you. I didn't have to, did I? You didn't. Which means you stand to gain from it. Bravo. Sharp as usual, acute as usual. I'm contacting you to assure you that the secret of your lodge is safe with me. I won't betray you. Philippa looked at her from beneath lowered eyelashes. If you expected, she said finally, to buy yourself time, peace and safety with that declaration, you miscalculated. Let's not kid ourselves, Yennefer. By fleeing Monte Calvo, you made a choice. You threw in your lot with one side of the barricade. Whoever's not with the lodge is against it. Now you're trying to beat us to Siri, and the motives driving you are counter to ours. You're acting against us. You don't want to allow us to use Siri to serve our political ends. Know then that we shall do everything to prevent you using the girl to serve your own sentimental ones. So it's war then? Competition? Philippa smiled venomously. Only competition, Yennefer. Fair and honourable? You must be joking. Naturally. Nonetheless, I'd like to present one matter honestly and unambiguously. Banking, of course, on gaining something from it. By all means. In the course of the next few days, perhaps even tomorrow, events will occur whose outcome I'm unable to predict. It may turn out that our competition and rivalry will suddenly cease to have any meaning. For a simple reason. There won't be a rival any longer. Philippa Eilhart narrowed her eyes, which were accented with light blue eyeshadow. I understand. Ensure, then, that I posthumously regain my reputation and good name, that I won't be thought of as a traitor and an accomplice of Vilgefortz. I ask that of the Lodge. I ask you personally. Philippa was briefly silent. 
I decline your request, she said finally. I'm sorry, but your rehabilitation is not in the interests of the Lodge. Should you die, you die a traitor. To Siri, you shall be a traitor and a criminal, for then it will be easier to manipulate the maid. Before you undertake anything that may prove fatal, Tris suddenly said, leave us something. A will? Something that will allow us to... to continue, to follow in your footsteps and find Siri. Surely it's in Siri's interests, after all. It's about her life. Yennefer, Dykstra has found... some tracks. If it's Vilgefortz who has Siri, a terrible death awaits the girl. Be quiet, Triss, Philippa Eilhart barked sharply. There won't be any bargaining or horse trading here. I'll leave you directions, Yennefer said slowly. I'll leave you information about what I found out and what I've undertaken. I'll leave a trail you'll be able to follow, but not for nothing. If you don't want to rehabilitate me in the world's eyes, then to hell with you and the world. But at least rehabilitate me in the eyes of one witcher. No, Philippa retorted almost immediately. That isn't in the interests of the Lodge either. You shall remain a traitor and a dishonourable sorceress to your witcher too. It isn't in the Lodge's interests to stir up trouble, looking for revenge, and if they have contempt for you, they won't want revenge. Besides, he's probably dead, or will die any day. Information, Yennefer said hollowly, in exchange for his life. Save him, Philippa. No, Yennefer for it isn't in the interests of the Lodge. Purple fire flashed in the sorceress's eyes. Did you hear, Triss? This is your Lodge. This is its true countenance. These its true concerns. What do you say to that? You are the maid's mentor, almost an older sister, as you yourself said. And Geralt, don't beguile Triss with romance, Yennefer. Now Philippa's eyes blazed in turn. We'll find the maid and rescue her without your help. And if you succeed, thanks a million. You'll help us. You'll save us the bother. You'll snatch her from Vilgefortz's hands. We'll snatch her from yours. And Geralt? Who is Geralt? Did you hear, Triss? Forgive me, Triss Merigold said hollowly. Forgive me, Yennefer. Oh, no, Triss. Never. Triss looked at the floor. Krach and Krait's eyes were like a hawk's. The day after the last secret communication, the Jarl of the Isles of Skellige said, one you, Triss Merigold, know nothing about. Yennefer left Skellige, setting a course for the Sedna Abyss. When asked why exactly she was heading there, she looked me in the eye and replied that she intended to find out how natural disasters differ from unnatural ones. She set off with two longships, Tamara and Alcione, with crews made up entirely of volunteers. That was the 28th of August, two weeks ago. I haven't seen her since. When did you find out? Five days later, he interrupted quite bluntly. Three days after the September new moon. Captain Asa Thiazzi, who was sitting behind the Jarl, was anxious. He licked his lips, shifted around on the bench, and wrung his hands so hard the knuckles cracked. The red sun, finally emerging from the clouds covering the sky, sank slowly over Spikaruch. Speak, Asa, Krach and Krait ordered. Asa Thiazzi cleared his throat noisily. We were making good way, he began. The wind behind us. We were doing a good twelve knots. Then, on the night of the twenty-ninth, we espied the lighthouse at Pesha de Mar. We struck out a little westwards so as not to chance on any Nilfgaardians. And at dawn, one day before the September new moon, we reached the region of the Sedna Abyss. Then, the sorceress summoned myself and Guthlaf. I need volunteers, Yennefer said. Only volunteers. No more than is necessary to steer a longship for a short time. I don't know how many men are needed for that. I'm not an expert. But please, don't leave even one man more on Alcione than is absolutely necessary. And I repeat, 
only volunteers. What I plan to do is... is very dangerous. More so than a sea battle. I understand, the old seneschal nodded. And I volunteer first. I, Guthlav, son of Svein, request that honour, madam. Yennefer looked him long in the eyes. Very well, she said. And I too am honoured. I also volunteered, said Asa Thiazzi. But Guthlaf disagreed. Someone, he said, must keep command on Tamara. Consequently, fifteen men volunteered, including Hjalmar Jarl. Krach and Kreet raised his eyebrows. How many are needed, Guthlaf? the sorceress repeated. How many are essential? Please reckon it exactly. The seneschal was silent for some time as he added up. Eight of us can cope, he said finally. If it's not for long, why, but everyone here is a volunteer. No one's being forced. Select eight from that fifteen, she interrupted sharply. Choose them yourself, and order those selected to transfer to Alcione. The rest are staying on Tamara. Ah, I shall choose one of those who stays. Helma? No, madam, you can't do that to me. I volunteered and will be at your side. I want to be... Be silent. You're staying on Tamara. That's an order. One more word and I'll have you tied to the mast. Go on, Issa. The witch, Guthlaf, and those eight volunteers boarded Alcione and sailed for the abyss. We on Tamara hung back according to our orders, but not too far away. But some devilry began with the weather, which had been wonderfully favourable till then. Aye, I speak truly that it was devilry, for the power was sinister, Jarl. May I be keelhauled if I lie? Go on. Where we were, I mean Tamara, the sea was calm, though the wind whistled some and clouds darkened the horizon, so day almost became night. But where Alcione was, all hell suddenly broke loose. Hell indeed. Alcione's sail suddenly fluttered so violently that they heard the flapping in spite of the distance separating the longships. The sky turned black and the clouds swirled. The sea, which seemed completely calm around Tamara, churned up and foamed white by Alcione's sides. Someone suddenly yelled, Someone chimed in, and a moment later, everybody was yelling. A cone of black clouds was striking Alcione, making it bob on the waves like a cork. The ship twisted, spun, its bow and stern rising and falling into the waves. At times, the longship almost completely vanished from sight. At times, they could only see the striped sail. It's magic, bawled someone behind Ace's back. It's devil magic. The whirlpool spun Alcione around faster and faster. Shields, torn from the sides by centrifugal force, whirred in the air like discs, and splintered oars flew in all directions. Reef the sail! yelled Asa Thiazzi. To the oars! Row, boys! To the rescue! But it was already too late. The sky above Alcione turned black and the blackness suddenly exploded in zigzags of lightning, which entwined the longship like a Medusa's tentacles. The clouds, swirling in fantastic shapes, writhed up into a horrendous funnel. The longship spun around with incredible speed. The mast snapped like a match. The torn sail dashed over the breakers like a huge albatross. Row, men! Over their own yells, over the all-deafening roar of the elements, they nonetheless heard the cries of the men from Alcione. Cries so extraordinary they made their hair stand on end. And these were old sea dogs, bloodied berserkers, mariners who had seen and heard many things. They dropped the oars, aware of their impotence. They were dumbfounded. They even stopped yelling. Alcione, still whirling, slowly rose above the waves and rose higher and higher. They saw the keel, dripping water, covered in shellfish and algae. They saw a black shape, a figure falling into the sea. Then a second, and a third. They're jumping, Asa Thiazzi roared. Row, men, don't stop with all your might. We must row to their aid. 
Alcyone was now a good hundred cubits above the boiling surface of the water. It continued to whirl, an immense spindle dripping with water, entwined in a cobweb of lightning, being dragged into the swirling clouds by an unseen force. Suddenly, an ear-splitting explosion rent the air. Although fifteen pairs of oars were pushing Tamara forwards, she suddenly leapt up and flew backwards as if rammed. The deck flew from under Thiazzi's feet. He fell over, banging his forehead on the side. He couldn't stand up by himself. He had to be lifted to his feet. He was dazed. He twisted and shook his head, staggering and mumbling incoherently. The screams of the crew seemed muffled. He went over to the side, tottering like a drunkard, and clung onto the rail. The wind had dropped, and the sea was calm, but the sky was still black from the billowing clouds. There wasn't a single trace of Alcione. Not even a trace was left, Jarl. Well, tiny pieces of rigging, some rags, nothing more. Asa Thiazzi interrupted his tale, watching the sun vanishing beyond Spikarug's wooded peaks. Krach and Krait, lost in thought, didn't hurry him. We know not, Asa Thiazzi finally continued. How many managed to jump before Alcyone was sucked into that devilish cloud? But no matter how many jumped, none survived. And we, though we spared neither time nor strength, fished out but two bodies. Two bodies born on the water. Only two. Was the sorceress? The Jarl asked in an altered voice. Not among them. No. Krach and Krait was silent a long while. The sun was completely hidden behind Spikaroch. Old Guthlaf, son of Sven, is lost. Asa Thiazzi spoke again. The crabs on the bottom of the abyss have surely ate him till the last little bone. And the witch is certainly lost. Jarl, folk are beginning to talk that it's all her fault and punishment for her crimes. Foolish nonsense. She's perished, Asa muttered, in the Sedner abyss, in the same place as Pavetta and Duni did back then. It was an accident. It was no accident, Krachan Krait said with conviction. It was certainly no accident then, and nor was it now. It is proper for a hapless one to suffer. His pain and humiliation result from the laws of nature, and to carry out the aims of nature, both the existence of the suffering one is necessary, as is that of those who, causing him suffering, enjoy their successes. That very truth ought to stifle the pang of conscience in the heart of a tyrant or malefactor. He must not bridle himself. He ought to commit all the deeds that arise in his imagination, since it is the voice of nature which suggests them. If the secret inspirations of nature lead us to evil, it is evidently essential to nature. Donatien, Alphonse, François de Sade Chapter 10 The clank and thud of the cell door first opening and then closing awoke the younger of the two Skara sisters. The elder was sitting at a table, busy scraping dried porridge from the bottom of a tin bowl. Well, I was it in court, Kenna? Without a word, Joanna Selborne, also known as Kenna, sat down on her plank bed with her elbows resting on her knees and her forehead on her hands. The younger Skara yawned, belched and farted loudly. Kerwood, crouching on the opposite bed, muttered something indistinct and turned his head away. He was furious at Kenna, the sisters and the whole world. In normal jails, the inmates were still traditionally separated according to sex. In military citadels, it was different. Emperor Fergus Var Emrys, confirming women's equality in the imperial army by special decree, had already ruled that if it was to be emancipation, then let it be emancipation. Equality ought to be complete and outright, without any exceptions or special privileges for either sex. Since then, 
inmates had been serving time in mixed cells in the strongholds and citadels. Well, the older Scara repeated, are they letting you out? Like hell they are, said Kenna bitterly, head still resting on her hands. I'll be lucky if they don't hang me. Sod it. I told the truth, hid nothing. Well, you know, almost nothing. But when those horses started grilling me, first they made a fool out of me in front of everyone. Then it turned out I wasn't a credible person, but a criminal element. And right at the end, they brought out my complicity in a plot aimed at subversion with the aim of an insurrection. Subversion? The older Scara nodded, as though she understood exactly what it was about. Ah, if it's subversion, then you're in the shit, Kenner. As if I didn't know that. The younger Scara stretched, yawned like a leopard, widely and noisily, jumped down from the upper bunk, vigorously kicked away Kohut's stool which was blocking her way, and spat on the floor beside it. Kohut growled, but didn't dare do anything more. Kohut was mortally offended by Kenna, but was afraid of the sisters. When Kenna had been assigned to the cell three days earlier, it soon turned out that Kohut, if he tolerated the emancipation and equality of women at all, had his own views on the subject. He had thrown a blanket over Kenna's upper half in the middle of the night and intended to avail himself of the lower half, which he certainly would have done, but for the fact that he had happened upon a teleempathic. Kenna penetrated his brain so deeply that Gord howled like a werewolf and cavorted around the cell as though bitten by a tarantula. Then, out of pure vindictiveness, Kenna telepathically forced him to go down on all fours and bang his head rhythmically against the metal-plated cell door. When the warders, alarmed by the dreadful thumping, opened the door, Kohut butted one of them, for which he received five lashes with a metal-tipped truncheon and as many kicks. Summing up, Kohut didn't get the gratification he'd been hoping for and took offence at Kenna. He didn't even dare to take his revenge because the next day the Skara sisters joined them in the cell. The fair sex thus formed the majority and furthermore it soon turned out that the sisters' views on equality were similar to Kohut's, if completely the other way around concerning the roles ascribed to the sexes. The younger Skara looked at the man lasciviously and made explicit comments, while the older cackled and rubbed her hands together. As a result, Coat slept with a stool with which he planned to defend his honour. Nonetheless, his chances and prospects were meagre. Both Skaras had served on the front line and were veterans of numerous battles, so would not have been daunted by the stool. Had they wanted to rape him, they would have, even if the man had been armed with a battle axe. Kenner, though, was certain the sisters were only joking. Well, almost certain. The Skara sisters were in the slammer for assaulting an officer, while in the case of Kohut, who had served as a quartermaster, an investigation was ongoing into a notorious major scandal regarding the theft of army bows, which was creating ever-widening ripples. In the shit, Kenner, the older Skara repeated. You've got yourself in a fine pickle, or rather, they got you into it. How come you never bloody caught on it was a political game? Humph. Scarra glanced at her, not quite knowing how to interpret her monosyllabic response. Kenna looked away. I'm not going to tell you something I kept quiet about in front of the judges, am I? She thought. That I knew what kind of game I was getting tangled up in, or when and how I found out. You've landed yourself in a sorry mess, said the younger Scarra solemnly. She was the much more dull-witted one, who, Kenna was certain, understood nothing of what it was about. And what finally happened with that Sintran princess? The older Skara kept probing. I mean, you finally nabbed her, didn't you? We did, if you could call it that. What's the date today? September the 22nd. It's the equinox tomorrow. Ah, well, that's a queer coincidence. Tomorrow, it'll be a year to the day since those events. A year already. Kenna stretched out on her pallet, hands clasped behind her head. The sisters remained silent, hoping it had been an introduction to a story. Nothing doing, sisters, dear, thought Kenna, looking at the obscene drawings and even more obscene comments scrawled on the planks of the upper bunk. There won't be any story. It's not even that that bastard coat smells like a bloody narc. I just don't feel like talking about it. I don't feel like remembering it. What happened a year ago, after Bonnard gave us the slip in Claremont? We'd arrived there two days too late, she recalled. The trail had already gone cold. 
No one knew where the bounty hunter had gone. No one apart from the merchant, Hoovenagel, that is. But Hoovenagel didn't want to talk to Skellen or even have him in the house. He communicated through his servants that he had no time and wouldn't grant them an audience. Tawny Owl was cross and indignant, but what could he do? It was ebbing. He didn't have the necessary jurisdiction. And we could do nothing about Hoovenagel any other way. I mean, our way. For he had a private army down in Claremont, and we couldn't exactly declare war. Boreas Munn sniffed around. Dacre Siliphant and Ola Harshine tried bribery. Till Ekrada, elven magic. I used telepathy and listened to his thoughts, but it wasn't much use. All we learned was that Barnard had left the town through the southern gate. But before he left... In Claremont, there was a tiny little temple with larches by the southern gate and the small marketplace. Before leaving Claremont, Barnard had cruelly beaten Falca with a knout in the square in front of the temple. Before everybody's eyes, including the temple priests. He yelled that he'd prove to her who her lord and master was that he was flogging her with a knout as he wished, and if he so wished, he'd flog her to death, because no one would stand up for her. No one would come to her aid. Neither people, nor gods. The younger Skara was looking out of the window, hanging onto the grating. The older one was eating porridge from the bowl. Coat took the stool, lay down, and covered himself with a blanket. The bell in the guardhouse tolled. The guards on the walls yelled out their presence. Kenna, turned her face to the wall. We met several days later, she thought. Me and Bonnard, face to face. I looked into his inhuman fish-like eyes, thinking only of one thing, how he'd beaten the girl. And I looked into his thoughts, for a moment, and it was like sticking my head into a dug-up grave. That was at the equinox. And the day before, the 22nd of September, I'd realised that an invisible spy had wormed his way among us. Stefan Skellen, the imperial coroner, listened without interrupting, but Kenner saw his face changing. Again, Selborn, he drawled. Say it again, for I don't believe my own ears. Cautiously, my lord coroner, she murmured, pretend to be angry that I come to you with a request and you won't grant it. For the sake of appearances, I mean. I'm not mistaken, I'm certain. An unseen guest has been hanging around us for two days. An invisible spy. Tawny Owl, to give him his due, was clever and understood at once. No, Selborn, I refuse, he said loudly, but without over-dramatizing his tone or expression. Discipline applies to everyone. There are no exceptions. Please, at least listen, Lord Coroner. Kenner didn't have Tawny Owl's talent, failed to avoid awkwardness, but in the scene being played out, awkwardness and embarrassment by the petitioner were permissible. Please, at least say fit as to listen. Speak, Selborn, but be brief and to the point. He's been spying on us for two days, she muttered, pretending she was humbly presenting her argument. Since Claremont, he has to ride behind us secretively, and when we're camped, he approaches unseen, moves around among people, and listens. He listens, the sodding spy. Skillen didn't have to pretend to be stern and angry. The fury was trembling in his voice. How did you uncover him? Yesterday, when you were giving Lord Silifan his orders outside the tavern, the tomcat, sleeping on the bench, hissed and flattened its ears. It seemed suspicious to me because there wasn't anyone on that side. And then I picked up something. A thought, kind of. An unfamiliar thought and will. When there are familiar, ordinary thoughts all around, an unfamiliar thought like that, Lord Coroner, is as if someone were shouting. I started taking heed intensely. I doubled my efforts, and now I can sense him. Can you always sense him? No, not always. He has some kind of magical protection. I only sense him from very close, and even then, not every time. So I have to be vigilant because I never know if he's not hiding nearby. Just don't scare him away, Tony Owl muttered. Don't scare him away. I want him alive, Selborn. What do you suggest? We'll give him the pancake treatment. The pancake treatment? Quiet, Lord Coroner. But, oh, never mind. Very well. I'm giving you a free hand. 
Tomorrow, make sure we stop and bill it in some village or other. I'll sort out the rest. And now, for the sake of appearances, give me a dressing down and I'll go away. I can't, really. He smiled at her with his eyes and winked slightly, immediately assuming the overbearing air of a stern commander. For I'm pleased with you, Miss Selborne. He said Miss. Miss Selborne as though to an officer. He winked again. No, he said, and brandished an arm, playing his role splendidly. Request denied. Dismissed. Yes, sir. The next day in the late afternoon, Skelen ordered his soldiers to make camp in a village by the River Leet. The village was prosperous, ringed by a palisade, and they rode in through a fine gate of freshly cut pine palings. The name of the village was Unicorn, and it took its name from its small stone temple, inside which there was a straw effigy of a unicorn. I remember, Kenner recalled, how we laughed at that straw idol, and the village headman gravely explained that the sacred unicorn which looked after the village had many years before been made of gold, then silver, then copper. There were several versions in bone and several in hardwood, but all of them had been stolen. People came from far away to rob or steal it. Things had only been peaceful since the unicorn had been made of straw. We set up camp in the village. As agreed, Skelen occupied the headman's hall. Less than an hour later, we'd given the spy the pancake treatment in classic textbook fashion. Please come closer, Tony Owl ordered loudly. Please come closer and take a look at this document. Hold on. Is everybody here? so I won't have to explain twice. Ola Harsheim, who had just taken a sip of cream somewhat watered down with sour milk from a milking pail, licked the creamy moustache from his lips, put down the vessel, looked around and counted. Dacre Siliphant, Bert Brigden, Niratin Seika, Till Ikrada, Joanna Selborne. Defeat so he's not here. Summon him. Creel? Duffy Creel? To the commander for the briefing to receive important orders, and a double. Dufisi Creel ran into the hall out of breath. Everybody's here, Lord Coroner, Ola Harsheim reported. Leave the window open. We could expire from the smell of garlic in here. Open the door, too. Make a draft. Brigden and Creel obediently opened the window and the door. Kenner, meanwhile, thought once again that Tony Owl would make a really splendid actor. Please, step this way, gentlemen. I've received this document from the Emperor, confidential and of extraordinary gravity. Your attention, please. Now! yelled Kenner, sending a powerful directional impulse, whose effect on the senses was similar to being struck by lightning. Ola Harsheim and Dacre Siliphant picked up the milk pail and simultaneously flung the cream in the direction Kenner was indicating. Till Ikrada vigorously emptied a flour barrel which had been hidden under the table. A creamy, flowery shape, Amorphous at first, appeared on the floor of the chamber. But Bert Brigden was alert. Correctly judging where the pancake's head might be, he whacked it as hard as he could with a cast-iron frying pan. Then everybody threw themselves at the spy, who was plastered all over with cream and flour, tore the hat of invisibility from his head and seized his arms and legs. After upturning the table, they tied the captive's limbs to the legs. They pulled off his boots and foot traps and stuffed one of them into his mouth, which was open and ready to shout. In order to crown their work, Dufizi Creel kicked the captive hard in the ribs and the others took pleasure in watching the spy's eyes bulge out of their sockets. Magnificent work, commented Tawny Owl, who hadn't moved during the entire brief incident, but had stood with his arms crossed on his chest. Bravo! Congratulations! Above all to you, Miss Selborne. Bloody hell, thought Kenner. If it carries on like this, I really am liable to end up an officer. Uh, Mr. Brigden, Stefan Skelen said coldly, standing over the prisoner, spread out between the table legs. Put the irons in the coals, please. Uh, Mr. Ekrada, please make sure no children are hanging around outside. He leaned over and looked into the bound man's eyes. You haven't shown your face for ages, Ryans, he said. I was beginning to think some misfortune had befallen you. The bell in the guardhouse, the signal for the changing of the guard, struck. The Skara sisters snored euphoniously. Kohut, hugging the stool, smacked his lips in his sleep. 
He played the hero, Kenner recalled, pretending to be brave, that foolhardy Ryans. The sorcerer, Ryans, given the pancake treatment and tied to the legs of a table with his bare feet sticking up. He was playing the hero, but wasn't fooling anybody, least of all me. Tawny Al warned us he was a sorcerer, so I scrambled his thoughts to stop him casting spells or sending for magical help, and read his thoughts while I was about it. He was blocking my way in, but when he caught a whiff of the smoke from the coal of the brazier where the irons were heating up, his magical protection and blockades burst along all their seams like old britches, and I was able to read him freely. His thoughts didn't differ from those of other people I've read in like situations. The thoughts of people who are about to be tortured. Chaotic, trembling thoughts full of fear and despair. Cold, slimy, wet, foul-smelling thoughts like a corpse's entrails. In spite of that, when the gag was removed, the sorcerer Ryans tried to play the hero. Well, well, Skellen, you've caught me, you win. Congratulations. A deep bow to your technique, expertise and professionalism. Splendidly trained operatives. Truly, it's enviable. And now please release me from this unseemly position. Tony Owl drew up a chair and straddled it resting his clasped fingers and chin on the backrest. He looked down at the captive and said nothing. Have me released, Skellen, Ryons repeated, and then order your subordinates to leave. What I have to say is meant for your ears only. Mr. Brigden, Tawny Owl said, without turning his head, what colour are the irons? A bit longer, sir. Miss Selborne? I'm having difficulty reading him now, Kenna shrugged. He's too afraid. The fear's drowning out all other thoughts, and there are lots of those thoughts, including a few he's trying to hide, behind magical screens. But it's not hard. I can... That won't be necessary. We'll try the classic method, a red-hot iron. Bloody hell, the spy howled. Skillen, you surely don't mean... Tawny Owl leaned over, his face a little changed. First, it's Mr. Skellen, he hissed. Secondly, yes... Absolutely. I plan to order your soul scorched, Ryans. I shall do it with the utmost satisfaction, for I shall treat it as an expression of historical justice. I'll wager you don't understand. Ryans remained silent, so Skelen continued. You see, Ryans, I advised Vatier de Rideau to scorch your heels back then, seven years ago when you were fawning to the Imperial Intelligence Service like a cur, begging for mercy and the privilege to be a traitor and a double agent. I repeated that advice four years ago when you shamelessly kissed Emir's ass, mediating in contacts with Vilgefortz. When, during the hunt for the Sintran wench, you were promoted from a humble little turncoat to being virtually first resident spy, I wagered Vatia that when burned, you'd say who you serve. No... I've got that wrong. That you'd name everyone you serve, and everyone you betray. And then I said, you'll see, you'll be astonished, Vatier, how many points on the two lists correspond. But well, Vatier de Rideau didn't listen to me, and now surely regrets it. But nothing's lost. I'll only toast you a little, and when I know what I want to know, I shall leave you to Vatier's disposal and he'll flay you, slowly, one piece at a time. Tawny Owl removed a handkerchief and a vial of perfume from his pocket. He sprinkled the perfume liberally on the handkerchief and pressed it to his nose. The perfume smelled pleasant, but nonetheless, Kenner felt like vomiting. The iron, Mr. Brigden. I I'm tracking you on Vilgafort's orders, Ryans roared. It concerns the girl. By tracking your troop, I hope to get ahead of you, reach that bounty hunter before you did. I was going to try to negotiate the wench away from him, from him, not from you, because you want to kill her and Vilgefortz needs her alive. What else do you want to know? I'll tell you, I'll tell you everything. Whoa there, Tony Owl called. Not so fast. Why, a fellow's head could ache from such a racket and mass of information. Can you imagine, gentlemen, what will happen when we burn him? He'll scream us to death. Creel and Siliphant cackled raucously. Kenna and Naratin Saker didn't join in the merriment. Neither did Bert Brigden, who had just then removed the iron from the coals and was examining it critically. 
The iron was so hot it seemed to be transparent, as though it wasn't iron, but a glass tube full of molten fire. Ryans saw it and shrieked. I know how to find the bounty hunter and the girl, he yelled. I know, I'll tell you. I'm certain of that. Kenna, still trying to read his thoughts, grimaced, picking up a wave of desperate, impotent fury. Something snapped in Ryans's brain, yet another partition. He'll say something out of fear, thought Kenna. Something he meant to keep until the end as a trump card, an ace, which would have beaten all the other aces in a last deciding hand for the highest stakes. Now he'll discard that ace out of a banal, revolting fear of pain. Suddenly, something popped in her head, and she felt heat in her temples, and then suddenly cold. And she knew. She knew Ryans's hidden thought. By the gods, she thought. What a pickle I'm in. I'll talk, howled the sorcerer, reddening and staring goggle-eyed in the coroner's face. I'll tell you something genuinely important, Skelen. That yet a rideau. Kenna suddenly heard another thought, belonging to someone else. She saw Nalat in Seika, with a hand on his dagger, moving towards the door. Boots pounded, and Boreas Munn rushed into the headman's hall. My lord coroner, quickly, sir, you'll never believe who's here. Skelen gestured to Brigden, who was bending over towards the spy's heels with the iron to stop. You ought to play the lottery, Ryans, he said, looking out of the window. I've never met anyone in my life with such luck. Through the window, they could see a crowd and two people on horseback in the midst of it. Kenna knew at once who it was. She knew who the bony giant was with the pale fish-like eyes riding a powerful bay, and who the ashen-haired girl on the splendid black mare was, with hands bound and a collar around her neck and a bruise on her swollen cheek. Visogotta returned to his cottage in a foul mood, dejected, taciturn, even angry. The reason was a conversation with a peasant who had rowed over in a dugout canoe to collect some pelts. Perhaps for the last time before the spring, said the peasant. The weather is getting worse by the day. The rain and wind are so bad I'm afraid to venture onto the water. Ice on the puddles in the morning, blizzards are nigh, and after that frosts. The river will rise in the flood at any time. Then it's away with the dugout and out with the sleigh. But even a sleigh's no use on periplot, nor but bogs as far as the eye can see. The peasant was right. Towards the evening, it became overcast, and white flakes fell from the dark blue sky. A stiff easterly wind flattened the dry reeds, whipping up white crests over the surface of the wetland. It had become piercingly, bitterly cold. The day after tomorrow, thought Visigotta, is the Feast of Samhain. According to the elven calendar, it'll be the new year in three days. According to the human calendar, we'll have to wait another two months. Kelpie, Ciri's black mare, stamped and snorted in the barn. When he entered the cottage, he found Ciri rummaging around in his chests. He let her, even encouraged her. Firstly, it was quite a new activity, after riding Kelpie and leafing through books. Secondly, there were plenty of his daughter's things in the chests, and the girl needed warm clothing. Several changes of clothing, for in the cold and damp it took many days before the laundry finally dried. Siri was selecting, trying on, putting aside and discarding various items of clothing. Visagotta was sitting at the table. He ate two boiled potatoes and a chicken wing, in silence. Good workmanship. She showed him some objects he hadn't seen in years and had even forgotten he had. Did these also belong to your daughter? Was it a hobby of hers? Yes, she loved it. She couldn't wait for the winter. Can I take them? Take what you want, he shrugged. They're of no use to me. If they'll come in handy, and if the boots fit. But are you packing, Siri? Are you preparing to go? She fixed her eyes on the pile of clothing. Yes, Visagotta, she said after a brief silence. I've decided. Because you see... There's no time to lose. Your dreams. Yes, she admitted a moment later. I saw very unpleasant things in my dreams. I'm not certain if they've taken place or are yet to happen. I have no idea if I can prevent it. But I must go. You see, once I felt aggrieved that the people closest to me didn't come to my aid, left me at the mercy of fate. But now I think 
They're the ones that need my help. I have to go. Winter's coming. That's precisely why I must go. If I stay, I'll be stuck here until spring. Until the spring, I'll be fretting in idleness and uncertainty, plagued by nightmares. I have to go right now to try to find the Tower of the Swallow, that teleporter. You worked out it'll take me a fortnight to reach the lake. I'd be there before the November full moon. You can't leave your hideout now, he said with effort. Not now. They'll capture you. Siri, your pursuers, they are very close. You cannot now. She threw a blouse down onto the floor and sprang up. You've learned something, she said sharply. From the peasant who took the pelts. Tell me. Siri, tell me, please. He told her. He was later to regret it. The devil must have sent them good Sir Hermit, mumbled the peasant, breaking off from counting the pelts. Must have been the devil. They've been galloping through the forest since the equinox, searching for some maid. Frightening folk, yelling and threatening, but always riding on, never tarrying long enough to do too much harm. But now they've thought up some at new. In some villages and settlements, they've left some. What were it? Scent trees? They ain't no trees, good sir. Scent or otherwise, just simply three or four good-for-nothing scoundrels. Naught but trouble. They say they're going to lie in wait the whole winter to see if the maid they're hunting doesn't creep out of some hidey hole and venture into the village. Then that tree's supposed to nab her. Are they in your village too? The peasant's face darkened and he ground his teeth. Not in our village. We was lucky. But in Dundara... Half a day from us, there's four. They're quartered in the inn. Scoundrels, good Sir Hermit. Damned scoundrels. Rogues. They took their pleasure with the village wenches, and when the menfolk stood up to them, they killed them, good sir, without mercy. Killed them, dead. They killed people, two, the headman and one other. And is there a punishment for such ne'er-do-wells, good sir? And is there a law? There's no punishment or law. A carter who came to Dundara with his wife and daughter, he said that years ago there used to be witches in the world, so they say. They dealt with every kind of villainy. We ought to send a witcher to Dundara. He'd give those rascals short shrift. Witches killed monsters, not people. They're knaves, good Sir Hermit, not people. Naught but knaves from hell. A witch is what's needed for them, no more, no less. Well... Time I were going, good Sir Hermit. Ooh, winter's coming. Soon it'll be away with a dugout and out with a sleigh. And what them knaves from Dundara need, good sir, is a witcher. Oh, that's right, Siri repeated through clenched teeth. Oh, absolutely right. A witcher's what they need. Or a witcher girl. Four, is it? In Dundara, they say. And where is bloody Dundara? Upstream? Would I get there across the tussocks? By the God, Siri, Visagotta said in terror. You can't seriously be thinking. Don't swear by the gods if you don't believe in them. And I know you don't. Let's leave my views out of this. Siri, what infernal ideas are you hatching? How can you even... Now you leave my convictions alone, Visagotta. I know what I have to do. I'm a witcher. You're an unstable young person he exploded. You're a child who's been through traumatic experiences, a damaged child on the verge of a nervous breakdown. And more than that, you're sick with a craving for revenge, blinded by a lust for retribution. Don't you understand that? I understand it better than you, she yelled, because you have no idea what it means to be hurt. You have no idea about revenge, for no one has ever truly wronged you. She rushed out of the cottage, a bitterly cold draught briefly blew through the hallway and the main room before she slammed the door shut. Soon after, he heard neighing and the pounding of hooves. Agitated, he banged the plate down onto the table. Let her go, he thought angrily. Let her shake off the anger. It wasn't as if he was afraid for her. She'd ridden often enough among the bogs by day and night. She knew the paths, causeways, tussocks and meadows. If, though, she did get lost... She'd only have to let go of the reins. Her black kelpie knew the way home to the goat's barn. Some time after, when it was already very dark, he went out and hung the lantern on a post. He stood by the fence and listened out for the clatter of hooves or the splash of water.
but the wind and the rustling of the reeds muffled all sound. The lantern on the post swayed crazily until it finally went out. And then he heard it. From far away. No, not from the direction Siri had ridden towards, but on the other side, from the bogs. A savage, inhuman, long-drawn-out, plaintive cry. A howl. A moment of silence. And again. A banshee. An elven phantom. The harbinger of death. Visagotta trembled from cold and from fear. He quickly headed back towards the cottage, muttering and humming under his breath, so as not to hear it, not to hear it at all, because he must not hear it. Kelpie emerged from the darkness before he managed to relight the lantern. Go into the cottage, Siri said gently and softly, and don't leave. It's a foul night. They bickered again over supper. You seem to know a great deal about the problems of good and evil, because I do, and not from scholarly books either. No, of course, you know it all from experience, from practice, for you've acquired plenty of experience in your long sixteen years of life. I've gained enough, quite enough. Congratulations, my learned friend. You can sneer, she clenched her teeth, without having any idea how much evil you've done to the world. You aged scholars, you theoreticians with your books, with your centuries-old experience of reading moral treatises so diligently, you didn't even have time to look out of the window to see what the world was really like. You philosophers, artificially shoring up artificial philosophies in order to earn salaries at universities. And since not a soul would pay you for the ugly truth about the world, you invented ethics and morality. Nice, optimistic sciences. Except they're fallacious and deceitful. There's nothing more deceitful than a half-baked judgment miss, than a hasty and incautious conclusion. You didn't find a remedy for evil. But I, a callow witcher, have an infallible remedy. He didn't respond, but his face must have betrayed him because Siri leapt up from the table. Do you think I'm talking nonsense, making wild claims? I think, he calmly replied, you're speaking in anger. I think you're planning your revenge in anger. And I strongly urge you to calm down. I am calm. And revenge? Answer me. Why not? Why should I eschew revenge? In the name of what? Higher reasons. And what's higher than an order of things where evil deeds are punished? To you, O oh philosopher and ethicist, revenge is an improper deed, reprehensible, unethical, and ultimately unlawful. And I ask, where is the punishment for evil? Who should attest it, adjudge it, and inflict it? The gods you don't believe in? The great demiurge creator you've decided to replace the gods with? Or perhaps the law? Perhaps Nilfgaardian justice, imperial judgments, prefects? You naive old man. And so it's an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, blood for blood, and for that blood, more blood, a sea of blood. Do you want to drown the world in blood, oh naive, damaged girl? Is that how you mean to fight evil, little witcher? Yes, just like that, for I know what evil fears. Not your ethics, Visigotta, not sermons, not moral treatises about a worthy life. Evil fears pain, impairment, suffering, death, the end. When wounded, evil howls with pain like a dog. It rolls around on the floor and squeals, watching the blood spurt from its veins and arteries, seeing its bones stick out of stumps, seeing its guts crawl from its belly, sensing that with the cold, death is approaching. Then, and only then, does evil's hair stand on end and evil finally yell, Mercy! I repent of my sins! I'll be good and decent now, I swear! Just save me! Staunch the blood! Don't let me perish ignominiously! Yes, O oh hermit, that's how you fight evil. If evil wants to do you harm, inflict pain on you, anticipate it, ideally when evil isn't expecting it. If, though, you didn't manage to anticipate evil. If you were harmed by evil, then pay it back. Catch it. Ideally, when it has forgotten, when it feels safe. Pay it back twofold, threefold. An eye for an eye. No, 
both eyes for an eye. A tooth for a tooth? No. All its teeth for a tooth. Pay evil back. Make it howl with pain so its eyeballs burst from its howling. And then, looking down at the floor, you may confidently say, what's lying there won't harm anybody any longer. It won't threaten anyone. For how can it threaten anyone without any eyes? If it has no hands. How can it do any harm when its guts are trailing over the sand and the gore is soaking into it? And you, the hermit said slowly, stand with your bloodied sword in hand and look at the blood soaking into the sand. And you have the audacity to think that the age-old dilemma has been solved. The philosopher's dream has been attained. You think the nature of evil has been transformed? I do, she said defiantly, because what's lying on the ground with blood gushing from it is no longer evil. Perhaps it isn't yet good, but it certainly isn't evil anymore. They say, Visigotha said slowly, that nature abhors a vacuum. Whatever is lying on the ground, bleeding profusely, whatever died from your sword, is no longer evil. What is it, then? Have you ever thought about that? No, I'm a witcher. When they were teaching me, I swore I would act against evil, always, and without thinking. Because when you start thinking, she added hollowly, killing stops making sense. Revenge stops making sense. And you can't let that happen. He shook his head, but she gestured to him to stop arguing. It's time I finished my story, Visigotha. I've been unfolding it for you for thirty nights, from the equinox to Samhain. But I haven't told you everything. Before I leave, you have to learn what happened on the day of the equinox in the village called Unicorn. She groaned when he pulled her from the saddle. The hip he had kicked her in the day before was hurting. He tugged on the chain attached to the collar and pulled her towards a light-coloured building. Several armed men were standing in the doorway, and one tall woman. Bonnard, said one of the men, slim and brown-haired, with a thin face, holding a brass-tipped knout. It has to be said that you are full of surprises. Greetings, Skelen. The man addressed as Skelen looked her straight in the eye for some time. She trembled under his gaze. Well, he addressed Bonnard again. Will you explain at once, or perhaps bit by bit? I don't like explaining things in the courtyard, for you get a mouthful of flies. May we go inside? By all means. Bonhart yanked the chain. Another man was waiting in the main room. He was dishevelled and pale, and was probably the cook, because he was busy cleaning traces of flour and cream from his clothing. His eyes lit up at the sight of Siri. He came closer. He wasn't the cook. She recognised him at once, remembered those hideous eyes and the ugly mark on his face. He was the one who had pursued her on Thaneth with the squirrels. She'd escaped him by jumping out of a window, and he had ordered the elves to jump after her. What had that elf called him? Rents? Well, well, he said mordantly, jabbing a finger hard and painfully into her breast. Miss Siri, we haven't seen each other since Thaneth. I've been looking for you a long, long time, miss, and I finally found you. I don't know, sir, who you are, Bonnard said coldly. But what you claim to find is actually mine, so keep your mitts off if you value your fingers. My name's Ryans. The sorcerer's eyes flashed unpleasantly. Kindly condescend to commit that to memory, Mr. Bounty Hunter, sir, and who I am will soon be revealed. Whom the maid belongs to will also soon be revealed. But let's not get ahead of ourselves. For now, I want to give her my regards and make a pledge. You don't have anything against that, I trust. You are free to trust. Ryance approached Siri and looked into her eyes from close up. Your guardian, the hag Yennefer, he said slowly and scornfully, once fell into disfavor with me. And so when I got my hands on her, I, Ryance, taught her pain. 
with these hands, with these fingers. And I promised her that should you fall into my hands, princess, I would also teach you pain, with these hands, with these fingers. Risky, Bonhart said softly. You are taking a great risk, Mr. Ryons, or whatever your name is, bothering my little girl and threatening her. She is vengeful, liable to hold it against you. I repeat, keep your hands, fingers, and all other parts of your body well away from her. Enough! Skelen cut them off without taking his curious eyes off Siri. Stop it, Bonart, and you too, Ryons. Calm yourself. I've shown you mercy, but I may change my mind and order you bound to the table legs again. Sit down, both of you. Let's talk like cultured people, just the three of us and no one else, for we have, it seems to me, much to talk about. But for now, we'll put the subject of our conversations under guard. Mr. Siliphant? Just guard her well. Bonnart handed Siliphant the end of the chain. Guard her with your life. Kenna stayed on the sidelines. Granted, she wanted to observe the wench whom everybody had recently been talking about, but she felt a strange aversion to pushing in amongst the small crowd surrounding Harshaim and Siliphant, who were taking the mysterious captive over to a post in the courtyard. Everybody was crowding around, jostling, peering. They were even trying to touch her, shove her, pull her. The girl trod stiffly, limping slightly, but held her head high. He's beaten her thought Kenna, but he didn't break her. So she must be Falker. The maid's barely grown. A maid, eh? A cutthroat. I heard she slayed six men, the brute, in the arena in Claremont. And before that, how many others? The she-devil? She-wolf? And the mare. What a mare, look. A horse of marvellous blood. An ear by Bonnot saddle flap. What a sword. Ah, a marvel. Leave it alone, Dacre Siliphant growled. Don't touch. Get your hands off other people's things. Don't touch the girl either. Don't pour her, don't hinder or insult her. Show some charity. We know not that we shan't be executing her before dawn. May she at least know peace until that time. If the wench is to go to her death, grinned Cyprian Fripp the younger, perhaps we could sweeten the remainder of her life and satiate her well, throw her on the hay and bed her. Oi, Cabernet Couturant cackled. We could. Let us join the hell if it's allowed. I tell you, it's not allowed. Dacre cut them off. No else occupies your minds, you damned fornicators. I said, leave the maid in peace. Andres, Stigwood, stand here by her. Don't take your eyes off her or move a foot away and use the lash on any that come close. Sod that, said Fripp. Very well. Makes no difference to us. Let's be off, fellas, to the A-barn and join the villagers. They're roasting a ram and a porker for the banquet. For today is the equinox, a feast, isn't it? While the masters are deliberating, we can make merry. Let's go. Take a damage on from the chest, Dee Dee. We'll take a drink. May we, Mr. Siliphant? Mr. Harshime? It's the feast today, and we shan't be heading anywhere tonight. Ah, oh, what droll designs, Siliphant frowned. They think of naught but feasting and toping. And who will stay here to help guard the wench and wait on Sir Stefan's summons? I shall stay, said Naratin Seka. And I, said Kenna. Dacre Siliphant looked at them attentively. Finally, he gestured his assent. Fripp and company roared their thanks incoherently. But have a care down there at that merrymaking, Ola Harshime warned. Don't molest any wenches, or you might get jabbed in the privates with a pitchfork. So that. Come in with us, Chloe. And you, Kenna, won't you think it over? No, I'm staying. They left me chained to the post with my hands bound. Two of them were guarding me, and the two standing nearby kept glancing over, watching me. The tall, good-looking woman, and a man with slightly feminine looks and bearing, odd in some way. The cat, sitting in the middle of the room, yawned broadly, bored, because the mouse it was tormenting had stopped providing amusement. Visigotha said nothing. Bonart, Ryans, and that, Skelen, Tawny Owl, was still debating in the headman's hall. I didn't know what about. I might have expected the worst, but I was resigned. One more arena? Or would they simply kill me? 
Blow it, I thought. Let it finally be over. Visigotta said nothing. Bonnart sighed. Don't glower, Skellen, he repeated. I simply wanted to make some money. It's time, you notice. I retired to sit on a porch and watch pigeons. You gave me a hundred florins for the she-rat. You badly wanted her dead. That puzzled me. How much could the maid really be worth, I thought. And I worked out that if she were killed or handed over, she would certainly be worth less than if she were kept. An old principle of economics and commerce. Goods like her keep gaining in value. One can always haggle. Tawny Owl wrinkled his nose as though there was a bad smell in the vicinity. You're painfully frank, Bonnat, but get to the point, to the explanations. You fled with a girl through the whole of Ebbing, and all of a sudden you show up and start explaining the laws of economics? Tell me what happened. What is there to explain? Ryan smiled repellently. Mr. Bonnat has simply finally grasped who the wench really is and how much she's worth. Skellen didn't grace him with a glance. He was looking at Bonnard into his fish-like, expressionless eyes. And he pushes this precious girl, this valuable acquisition, meant to guarantee his pension, out into the arena in Claremont, he drawled, and makes her fight to the death, risks her life, though she's allegedly worth so much alive. What's it about, Bonnard? Because something doesn't add up. Had she perished in the arena, Bonnard didn't lower his eyes. It would have meant she wasn't worth anything. I see. Tawny Owl frowned slightly. But rather than taking the wench to another arena, you brought her to me. Why, if I might ask? I repeat, Ryons grimaced. He twigged who she is. You're shrewd, Lord Ryons. Bonnard stretched until his joints creaked. You've guessed right. Yes, it's true that there's one more riddle linked to the witcher girl trained in Kaer Morhen. In Giso, when the noblewoman was robbed, the wench's tongue wagged that she was apparently so important and titled that the baron's daughter was such small beer and so low-ranking she ought to bow down before her. In that case, this Falka, I think to myself, must at least be the daughter of a count. Curious. Firstly, a witcher girl. Are there so many of them? Secondly, in the rat's gang. Thirdly, the imperial coroner is chasing around after her, in person, from Korath to Ebbing, and ordering her killed. And on top of all that, she's a high-born noblewoman. Ah, I think to myself, someone ought to ask that wench who she really is. He was silent for a time. At first, he wiped his nose with his cuff. She wouldn't talk, although I asked. I asked with hand, foot, and whip. I didn't want to cut her, but, as luck would have it, a barber surgeon turned up, with instruments for extracting teeth. I bound her to a chair. Skelen swallowed audibly. Ryons smiled. Bonnard studied a calf. She told me everything before. As soon as she saw the instruments, those toothed pliers and pincers, she became more forthcoming at once. It turns out she's a Sintran princess, said Ryans, looking at Tony Owl. The heiress to the throne, a candidate for marriage to Emperor Emir. Which Lord Skellen didn't deign to tell me, the bounty hunter sneered. He ordered me simply to murder her. He stressed it several times, kill her mercilessly on the spot. Well, Lord Skellen, kill a queen, a emperor's future spouse, with whom, if one is to believe the rumors, the emperor will tie the knot any moment, after which there is to be a general amnesty. Bonnard glared at Skellen as he delivered his oration but the imperial coroner didn't lower his eyes. And so, the hunter continued, out it comes, a delicate situation. Thus, though I regret it, I gave up my plans regarding the witcher girl princess. I brought the whole predicament here to Lord Skellen, 
do talk, to sort things out, for I'd say that this predicament is a little too much for one Bonnard. A very reasonable conclusion, said a harsh voice from Ryans's bosom. Very reasonable, Mr. Bonnard. What you've got, gentlemen, is a little too much for you both. Luckily, you still have me. What's that? Skelen leapt up from his chair. What the bloody hell is that? My master, the saucer of Ilgaports. Ryons drew from his bosom a tiny silver casket. More precisely, my master's voice, coming from this magical device. It's called a xenogloss. Greetings to you all said the casket. Shame, I can only hear you, but urgent business prevents me from using teleprojection or teleportation. That's all we bloody need, Tony Owl snarled, but I might have guessed. Ryons is too stupid to act alone and by himself. I might have guessed you were lurking somewhere in the gloom of Vilgeforts. You lurk in the dark like a fat old spider waiting for your cobweb to quiver. What a vivid comparison. Skelen snorted. And don't try to pull the wool over our eyes, Vilgeforts. You're using Ryans and his casket, not because of the amount of work you have, but from fear of the army of sorcerers, your former comrades in the chapter, who are scanning the whole world in search of traces of magic with your algorithm. Were you to try teleportation, they would locate you in an instant. What impressive knowledge. We haven't been introduced. Bonnard bowed quite theatrically before the silver box. But nevertheless, is the Honorable Ryans promising to torture the girl on your instructions and with your authorization, Master Sorcerer? Am I not mistaken? Upon my word, the girl is becoming more and more important with every moment. It turns out she is necessary to everybody. We haven't been introduced, Vilgefort said from the casket. But I know you. Leo Bonnard, you'd be astonished just how well. And the girl is indeed important. After all, she's the lion cub of Sintra, the elder blood. In keeping with Aethelina's prophecy, her descendants will rule over the world in the future. Why do you need her so much? I only need her placenta, her womb. Once I've removed it, you can take the rest. What do I hear there? Some kind of snorting? Some kind of disgusted sighing and puffing? Whose? Barnard's, who physically and psychologically maltreats the girl every day in intricate ways? Or Stefan Skelens, who intends to kill her on the orders of traitors and plotters? Eh? Are ye eavesdropped on them? recalled Kenna, lying on her pallet with her hands behind her head. I stood around the corner and heard their thoughts. And my hair stood on end over my entire body. All of a sudden, I understood the extent of the predicament I got myself into. Yes, yes, said the voice from the xenogloss. You've betrayed your emperor, Skelen without hesitation, at the first opportunity. Tawny Owl snorted disdainfully. The charge of treachery from the lips of such an arch-traitor as you, Vilgevorts, is indeed a great matter. I'd feel honoured if it didn't smack of a cheap, vulgar joke. I'm not accusing you of treachery, Skellen. I'm mocking your naivety and inability to betray. Who are you betraying your emperor for? For Ardal Epdai and Devet, princelings, their morbid pride piqued, insulted because the emperor rejected their young daughters by planning a marriage with the Sintron, whereas they were hoping that a new dynasty would emerge from their families, that their families would become the first in the empire, that soon they'd rise even higher than the throne. Emir divested them of that hope at one stroke, and then they decided to amend the course of history. They aren't yet ready with an armed rebellion, but they can at least eliminate the girl that Emir chose over their daughters. Of course, they don't feel like sullying their own delicate aristocratic hands. They found a hired thug, 
Stefan Skellen, suffering from an excess of ambition. Was it like that, Skellen? Don't you want to tell us? What for? Tony Owl shouted. And tell whom? As usual, you know everything, don't you, oh great mage? Ryans, as usual, doesn't know anything, and that's as it should be, and Bonart is unconcerned. You, though, as I've already demonstrated, don't have anything to boast about. The princes bought you with promises, but you're too intelligent not to realize that you'll gain nothing with the lordlings. Today, they need you as a tool to eliminate the Sintron. Tomorrow, they'll get rid of you because you're a low-born upstart. Did they offer you Vatier de Rideau's position in the new empire? You surely don't believe that, Skellen. They need Vatier more, since secret services always stay the same, coups or not. They only want to murder using your hands, but they need Vatier to take over the security apparatus. Besides, Vatier is a Viscount, and you're a nobody. Indeed, Tony Owl pouted. I'm too intelligent not to have noticed that. In that case, I ought in turn to betray Adal Abdai and join you, Vilgefortz. Is that what you're driving at? But I'm not a weathercock. If I support the idea of revolution, it's from conviction and principle. Autocratic tyranny ought to be finished, a constitutional monarchy introduced, and after that, democracy. What? The power of the people. A system where the people will rule. The citizenry of all states through the most worthy and honest representatives chosen in an honest election. Ryons roared with laughter. Bonart laughed wildly. The xenogloss of the mage Vilgefortz laughed heartily, if somewhat screechingly. All three of them laughed and guffawed, weeping great tears. Very well, Bonart interrupted the merriment. We haven't gathered here for diversion, but to trade. The girl, for now, doesn't belong to the uh, population of honest citizens of all states. She belongs to me. But I can resell her. What does my lord sorcerer have to offer? Does ruling the world interest you? No. Then I shall let you, Vilgefort said slowly. Be present during what I do to the girl. You'll be able to watch. I know you prefer that kind of voyeurism to all other pleasures. Bonnard's eyes flashed with white flame, but he was composed. And more specifically? And more specifically, I'm prepared to pay your fee twentyfold, two thousand florins. Think, Bonnard. That's a sack of money you won't be able to lift. You're going to need a pack mule. It'll suffice you for your retirement, porch, pigeons, and even for vodka and harlots, if you do it in sensible moderation. Agreed, maid, sir. The hunter laughed, seemingly blithely. You've touched my heart with that vodka and those harlots. Let's strike a deal. But I'd also be interested in that observation you suggested, too. I'd prefer, admittedly, to watch her expire in the arena, but I'd also be glad to take a look at your knife work. Throw it in as a bonus. Done. That didn't take you long, Tony Owl observed sardonically. In sooth, Vilgefortz, you've struck up a partnership with Bonnard swiftly and smoothly, a partnership which indeed is and will be a societes leonina. But might you have forgotten something? The headman's hall where you're sitting and the cintron you're trading are surrounded by two dozen armed soldiers. My soldiers. My dear Skellen, came Vilgefort's voice from the box. You insult me by thinking I plan to disadvantage you in the exchange. On the contrary... I mean to be extremely generous. I can't guarantee you, as you deign to call it, democracy, but I guarantee you material assistance, logistical support, and access to information owing to which you'll stop being a tool and a minion to the conspirators and will become a partner. 
one whose person and opinion, Prince Joachim de Vett, Duke Ardal Eptai, Count Breuner, Count d'Arvi, and all the rest of the blue-blooded plotters will take into account. What if it's a societas leonina? Certainly, if Cyrilla is the loot, then I shall take the lion's share. Deservedly so, it seems to me. Does it pain you? After all, you will make a considerable profit. If you give me the Cintron, Vatier de Rideau's position is yours for the taking. And as the head of the Secret Service, Stefan Skellen, one can enact all sorts of utopias, perhaps even democracy and honest elections. So, as you see, I give you the fulfillment of your life's dreams and ambitions in exchange for one skinny fifteen-year-old. Do you see that? No. Tony Owl shook his head. I only hear it. Ryans? Yes, master. Give Lord Skellen an example of the quality of our information. Tell him what you got out of Vatier. There's a spy in your troop, said Ryans. What? You heard. Vatier de Rido has planted someone here. They know about everything you're doing, why you're doing it, and for whom. Vatier has an agent amongst you. He walked quietly over to her. She almost didn't hear him. Kina. Niratin? You listened in to my thoughts. Over there, in the headman's hall. You know what I was thinking. So you know who I am. Listen, Niratin. No. You listen, Joanna Selborne. Stefan Skellen is betraying his country and his emperor. He's conspiring. Everyone who's with him will end up on the scaffold, will be torn apart by horses in Millennium Square. I don't know anything, Naratin. I carry out my orders. What do you want from me? I serve the coroner. And who do you serve? The Empire, Viscount de Rideau. What do you want from me? To demonstrate good sense. Go away. I won't betray you. I won't tell. But go away. Please, I can't, Naratin. I'm a simple woman. It is too much for my head. I don't know what to do. Skelen said, Miss Selborne, as though to an officer. Who am I serving? Him? The Emperor? The Empire? And how am I to know? Kenna pushed herself away from the corner of the cottage, flourished a withy and growled menacingly to drive away some village children who were curiously watching Falka sitting at the foot of the post. Oh, I've got myself in a fine pickle. Oh, there's a whiff of the noose in the air and horse shit in Millennium Square. I don't know how it will finish, thought Kenna. But I have to go inside her. Enter Falka. Sense her thoughts, if only for a moment. Know what she knows. Understand. She came close said Siri, stroking the cat. She was tall, well-groomed, standing out very much from the rest of that pack, even pretty in her own way, and commanding respect. The two who were guarding me, vulgar oafs, stopped swearing when she approached. Visagotta said nothing. She... Siri went on, leaned over, and looked me in the eyes. I felt something at once. Something strange. It was as though something had crunched at the back of my head. It hurt. There was a, a, a rushing sound in my ears. For a moment, everything went very bright. Something entered me. Something repulsive and slimy. I recognised it. Yennefer had shown it to me in the temple. But I didn't want to allow that woman to do it. So I simply pushed away the thing she'd put into me, pushed it away and expelled it from myself with all the strength I could muster. And the tall woman bent backwards and staggered as though she'd been punched, took two steps backwards, and blood rushed from her nose, from both nostrils. 
Visigotta said nothing. But I, Siri raised her head, understood what had happened. I suddenly felt the power in me. I'd lost it in Korath Desert. I'd renounced it. Later I couldn't draw on it, couldn't make use of it. But she, that woman, had given me the power, had literally shoved the weapon into my hand. It was my chance. Kenna staggered and sat down heavily on the sand, swaying and feeling for the ground as though drunk. Blood was pouring from her nose and down her mouth and chin. What? Andres Vieni leapt up, but all of a sudden seized his head in both hands, opened his mouth and uttered a croak. He stared at Stigwood with eyes wide open, but blood was already dripping from the pirate's nose and ears, and his eyes had clouded over. Andres dropped to his knees, looking at Naratin Seika, who was standing to one side and watching impassively. Naratin, help! Seika didn't move. He was looking at the girl. She turned her eyes on him, and he tottered. It's not necessary, he quickly forestalled. I'm on your side. I, I want to help you. Here, I'll cut through your bones. Take the knife. Cut through the collar yourself. I'll fetch the horses. Seika! Andres Vierni stammered out, joking. You trick! The girl struck him with a gaze, and he fell onto Stigwood, who was lying motionless and curled up in a fetal position. Kenna still couldn't stand up. Sticky drops of blood dripped onto her chest and stomach. Alarm! yelled Chloe Stitz, suddenly appearing from behind the cottages and dropping a mutton rib. Alarm! Siliphant! Skelen! The girl's getting away! Siri was already mounted. She was holding a sword. Yee! Kelpie! Alarm! Kenna was clawing the sand. She couldn't get up. Her legs were totally unresponsive, as though made of wood. A psionic, she thought. I've encountered a super psionic. The girl is about ten times stronger than me. I'm lucky she didn't kill me. How come I'm still conscious? A group was now running from the cottages, led by Ola Harsheim, Bert Brigden, and Tillikrada, and the guards from the gate, Deka Siliphant and Boreas Munn, hurried into the courtyard. Siri wheeled her horse around, yelled and galloped towards the river, but armed men were already running from there. Skelen and Bonart dashed out of the hall, Bonart holding his sword. Neratid Seika yelled, rode his horse at them and knocked them both down. Then he hurled himself straight from the saddle at Bonart and pinned him to the ground. Ryons dashed out onto the threshold and looked on dumbfounded. Seize her, Skelen roared, springing up from the ground. Seize her or kill her. Alive, Ryons howled. Alive! Kenna saw Ciri, driven away from the riverside palisade, rein her mare around and speed towards the gate. She saw Kabanik Turant leap forward and try to drag her from the saddle, saw a sword flash and a crimson outpouring gush from Turant's neck. Didi Vargas and Fripp the Younger also saw it. They decided not to bar the girl's way, but bolted between the shacks. Bonart jumped to his feet, pushed Naratin Seika away with a blow of his sword pommel and smote him terribly, diagonally across his breast, and then raced after Siri. Neratin, slit open and spurting blood, managed to catch him by the legs and only released him when he was skewered to the sand with the point of a sword. But those few seconds of delay were sufficient. The girl spurred her mare, fleeing from Siliphant and Mun. Skelen came up stealthily and wolf-like from the left and swung an arm. Kenna saw something sparkle in flight, saw the girl writhe and sway in the saddle and a fountain of blood erupt from her face. She leaned back so far that for a moment she was lying on the mare's croup. She didn't fall, but straightened up and remained in the saddle, then pressed herself to the horse's neck. The black mare jostled the armed men and raced straight for the gate. Behind her ran Mun, Siliphant, and Chloe Stitz with a crossbow. She won't jump it, she's ours, Mun yelled triumphantly. No horse can clear seven feet. Don't shoot, Chloe. Chloe Stitz didn't hear in the general uproar. She stopped, put the crossbow to her cheek. It was widely known that Chloe never missed. She's dead meat, she cried. Dead meat. Kenna saw a man whose name she didn't know run forward, raise a crossbow and shoot Chloe point blank in the back. The bolt passed right through her in an explosion of blood. Chloe dropped without a sound. The mare reached the gate and drew back its head a little. 
and jumped. It soared and quite simply scaled the gate, gracefully gathered up its forehooves and streamed over it like a black silk ribbon. Its curled hindhooves didn't even brush the upper bar. Ye gods! screamed Dacus Elephant. Ye gods, what a horse! Worth its weight in gold! The mare goes to whoever catches her, Skillen screamed. To horse! Mount up and after her! The search party galloped through the finally open gate, kicking up dust. Von Art and Boreas Mann galloped ahead of everyone. Kenna stood up with effort and immediately staggered and sat down heavily on the sand. Her legs were tingling painfully. Kabenik Turont wasn't moving, but lay in a red puddle with arms and feet splayed apart. Andres Vieni tried hard to lift the still unconscious Stigwood. Chloe Stitz, huddled up on the sand, seemed as tiny as a child. Ola Harsheim and Bert Brigden dragged the short man, the one who'd killed Chloe before Skelen. Tawny Owl was panting and trembling with fury. From the bandolier slung across his chest, he took out another Orion, the same kind of steel star he had wounded the girl's face with a moment earlier. May you rot in hell, Skelen, said the short man. Kenner recalled his name. Makessa, Jediah Makessa, a Jimerian. She had first met him in Rokane. Tawny Owl stooped and swung his arm vigorously. The six-toothed star whined in the air and plunged deeply into Makessa's face, between his eye and nose. He didn't even cry out when hit, but simply began shaking violently and spasmodically in Harsheim and Brigden's grip. He shook for a long time and bared his teeth so ghoulishly that everybody turned their heads away. Everybody except Tawny Owl. Pull my Orion from him, Ulla, said Stefan Skellen when at last the corpse was hanging inertly in the two men's arms. And bury that scum in the muck with that other scum, the hermaphrodite. Not a trace shall remain of those two execrable traitors. The wind suddenly howled and clouds massed. It suddenly became dark. The guards on the citadel walls shouted. The Skara sisters were snoring a duet. Code pissed noisily into the empty bucket. Kenna pulled the blanket up under her chin. She was thinking back. They didn't catch the girl. She vanished. Simply vanished. Boreas Munn, unprecedentedly, lost the black mare's trail after about three miles. Suddenly, without warning, it became dark. The wind flattening trees almost to the ground. The rain lashed down. Nay, even thunder rumbled and lightning flashed. Bonart didn't give up. They returned to Unicorn. They all yelled at one another, interrupting and shouting each other down. Bonart, Tawny Owl, Ryans, and the fourth, mysterious, inhuman, croaking voice. Then they ordered the entire Hansa to mount up, unlike those, like me, who were unable to ride. They banded together peasants with torches and drove them into the forests. They returned just before dawn, with nothing, if you didn't count the horror in their eyes. The tales, Kenna recalled, only began a few days later. In the beginning, everyone was too afraid of Tawny Owl and Bonnard. They were so furious it was better to get out of their way. Even Bert Brigden, an officer, was hit across the head with the handle of a knout for some imprudent word. But later, people talked about what had happened during the chase. About the tiny straw unicorn from the little chapel that suddenly grew to the size of a dragon and scared the horses so much the riders fell from them, only miraculously avoiding breaking their necks. About the cavalcade of fiery-eyed apparitions galloping across the sky on skeleton horses led by a terrible skeleton king, ordering his phantom servants to wipe out the black mare's hoofprints with their ragged cloaks. About the macabre choir of goats at the night jars calling, Liquor of blood! Liquor of blood! about the horrific wailing of the ghastly Bian Shi, the harbinger of death. The wind, rain, clouds, bushes and fantastically shaped trees, and fear, which turns everything into nightmares, commented Boreas Mun, who had been there after all. That's the whole explanation. But the night jars, the night jars were screaming, as night jars always do, he added. And the trail... The hoofprints which suddenly vanish as though the horse had flown up into the heavens? The face of Boreas Munn, 
A tracker able to track down a fish in water stiffened at the question. The wind, he answered. The wind covered the tracks with sand and foliage. There's no other explanation. Some people even believed, Kenner recalled. Some people even believed that they were all natural or predictable phenomena and even laughed at them. But they stopped laughing after Dundara. No one laughed after Dundara. He stepped back involuntarily and sucked in air on seeing her. She had mixed goose lard with soot from the chimney and with the grease paint thus created had blackened her eye sockets and eyelids, extending them with long lines to her ears and temples. She looked like a demon. From the fourth tussock up to the high forest, keeping to the very edge, he repeated the directions. Then along the river until you get to three dead trees, and then due west through a hornbeam woodland. When you see the pines, ride along the edge and count the tracks. Turn into the ninth and don't turn off after that. Then it'll be the Dundari settlement. There's a hamlet on the north side, a few cottages, and beyond them, at the crossroads, a tavern. I remember. I'll make it, don't worry. Be most vigilant at the bends in the river. Beware of places where the reeds thin out, and places covered in knotgrass. And should darkness overtake you before the pine forest, stop and wait until morning. Under no circumstances, ride across the bogs at night. It's almost a new moon now, and the clouds, I know. As far as the lake land goes, head north across the hills. Avoid main roads. The main roads are heaving with soldiers. When you get to a river, a large river, which is called the Silta, you're over halfway. I know. I have the map you drew. Oh, yes, indeed. Siri checked her harness and saddlebags yet again, mechanically, not knowing what to say, putting off what had to be said. It was agreeable to have you to stay, he forestalled her. Truly. Farewell, O oh witcher girl. Farewell, O oh hermit. Thank you for everything. She was already in the saddle, already prepared to click her tongue at Kelpie when he came over and took her arm. Siri, stay. See out the winter. I'll reach the lake before the frosts. But later, if it's as you said, nothing will matter any longer. I'll teleport back to Thaneth, to the school in Aratusa, to Madame Rita. Visigotha, like it used to be. The Tower of the Swallow is a legend. Remember, it's just a legend. I'm just a legend, she said bitterly. Have been since my birth. Zireo, the swallow, the unexpected child, the chosen one, the child of destiny, the child of the elder blood. I'm going, Visigotha. Farewell. Farewell, Siri. The tavern by the crossroads past the hamlet was empty. Cyprian Fripp the Younger and his three companions had forbidden the local people from entering and drove away travellers. They, however, spent their time eating and drinking, never leaving the smoky, gloomy tavern, which smelled as a tavern usually does in winter, when the doors and windows are kept shut, of sweat, cats, mice, foot traps, pine wood, farts, fat, burnt food, and wet, steaming clothing. Sod this rotten place, Centurion Yudz Yanovitz, a Jumerian said, for probably the hundredth time, gesturing towards the serving wenches to bring him vodka. Damn that torn owl, ordering us to hunker down in this mangy hole. I'll sooner be riding through forests with the patrols. Then you must be stupid, replied Didi Vargas. It's bloody freezing outside. I'd rather be here in the warm, with the maid close at hand. He slapped the wench hard on the bottom. She squealed, not very convincingly, and with evident apathy. She was slow-witted to tell the truth. Working in a tavern had only taught her that when they slap or pinch you, you should squeal. Cyprian Fripp and his company had already begun to take advantage of the two serving wenches the day after arriving. The innkeeper was afraid to complain, and the wenches too dim-witted to think about protesting. Life had taught them that if a wench protested, she got hit. It was more judicious, usually, to wait till they get bored. That there Falker, 
Rispat Lapointe, bored, took up another stock topic of their bored evening conversations. Croat somewhere in the forests, I tell you. I saw Skelen slice her face open with the Orion and the blood shooting out in a fountain. She can't have come through that, I tell you. Tawny owl, mister, Yutsyanovitz stated. He barely scratched her with the Orion. Granted, he carved her face up good and proper, saw it for myself. But did it stop the wench jumping a gate? Did she fall from her horse? Not a chance. And we measured the gate afterwards. Seven foot, F in two. And she jumped it. And then what? You couldn't have stuck a knife blade between the saddle and her little ass. Blood was pouring from her, protested Rispa Lapointe. She rode away, I'm telling you. Rode off and then fell and croaked in a hollow somewhere. Wolves and birds at the carcass. Martin's finished it off. And ants. That's the end. Derayath. So, we're sitting here in vain, drinking our money away. Our money it is, for I don't seem to see any pay. It can't be that no traces or sides of a corpse are left, said Didi Vargas with conviction. Something's always left. A skull, pelvis, or one of the bigger bones. Royans, that saucer, will eventually find Falka's remains. Then the matter will be over. And perhaps then they'll drive us so hard we'll recall with delight this idleness and this lousy pigsty. Cyprian Fripp the Younger threw a bored glance at the tavern's walls, on which he already knew every nail and every damp patch. Ain't that poxy booze? I know, too. What smell of onions? And when you rat them, they lie like calves, staring at the ceiling and picking their teeth. Everything's better than this tedium, Yutzyanovitz stated. I feel like howling. Let's fucking do something. Anything. Shall we talk to the village or what? The door creaked. The sound was so unexpected that all four of them leapt up from their seats. Scram, Didi Vargas roared. Get out, old man, beggar, filthy bastard. Get back outside. Leave him. Fripp bored, waved an arm. See, he's lugging some pipes. He's just a beggar. Probably an old soldier who earns a crust by playing and singing in taverns. It's cold and rainy outside. Let him stay. Just well away from us. Yats Yanovitz showed the beggar where to sit. Or we'd be cruel with me lice. I can see from here what specimens are crawling over him. You'd think they were tortoises, not lice. Give him some victuals, landlord. Fripp the younger beckoned imperiously. And asked some hooch. The beggar took off his bulky fur hat and solemnly gave off a stench that filled the room. Thanks be to you, my lord, he said, for today is Salvan's Eve, a holy day. It doesn't befit to drive anyone away on a holy day, to be soaked and frozen in the rain. It befits to regale a body on a holy day. And truth, Rispat Lapointe slapped himself in the forehead. Today is Salvan's Eve, the end of October, a night of witchcraft. The beggar slurped the watery broth he was brought. A night of ghosts and horrors. How, oh, how, oh, said Jutz Janowitz. The old gimmer, he do, is about to divert us with beggarly tiles. Let him divert us, Didi Vargas yawned. Ain't it better than this boredom? Sawing, repeated Cyprian Fripp the Younger. It's already five weeks since Unicorn, and two weeks that we've been here. Two whole weeks, sawing, ha! A night of portents. The beggar licked the spoon, fished something out of the bowl with a finger and ate it. A night of dread and witchcraft. What did I say? Yutzianowitz grinned. We'll have a beggar's tail. The beggar sat up straight, scratched himself and hiccuped. Sarwan Eve, he began with emphasis. The last night before the November new moon is the last night of the old year to the elves, and when the new day dawns, it'll be their new year. Thus, there is among the elves a custom that on the night of sowing, every fire in the homestead and yard should be lit with a single pitch taper, and the rest of the taper stowed well away until May, when Beltani is kindled with the same flame. Then, they say, there will be prosperity. Not only elves do thus, some of our folk do likewise, to protect themselves from evil spirits. Ghosts, yet snorted. Just listen to the old fawn. It's Sarwin night, the beggar said in an excited voice. On this night, spirits walk the earth. The spirits of the dead knock on the windows. Let us in, they moan. Let us in. Then they should be given honey and groats, all sprinkled with vodka. I'd sooner sprinkle my own throat with vodka, Rispat Lapointe chortled. And your ghosts, old man, can kiss me right here. Oh, my lord, don't make fun of ghosts. They're liable to hear, and they're vengeful. Today, it's Sawin Eve, 
a night of dread and witchcraft. Prick up your eyes. Do you hear something rustling and tapping all about? It's the dead coming from the beyond. They want to steal into homesteads, to warm themselves by the fire and eat their fill. There, over the bare stubble fields and leafless forests, rages a gale and a frost. The poor ghosts are chilled, so they head towards homesteads where there's fire and warmth. Then one mustn't forget to put out food for them in a bowl on the step or on the threshing floor, for if the phantoms find nothing there, they go into cottages themselves after midnight to search for... Oh my! One of the serving wenches whispered loudly and immediately squealed as Fripp pinched her behind. Not a bad tale, he said, but a long way off being a good one. Pour the old man a mug of mulled wine, landlord, and perhaps he'll tell a good one. The test of a good ghost story, boys, is when you goose the wenches and they're so engrossed they don't even notice. The men cackled, and the two girls, whose degree of attentiveness was being tested, squealed. The beggar quaffed the mulled wine, slurping loudly and burping. Just don't get drunk or fall asleep here, Dee Dee Vargas warned menacingly. We ain't giving you drink for nothing. Tell a tale, sing, play their pipes. We want merriment. The beggar opened his mouth, where a single tooth stood like a white milepost in a dark step. It, it is Sarwan, my lord. What music? What playing? Tis not allowed. Sarwan's music is the gale outside. It's the howling of werewolves and vampires, the wailing and moaning of vengeful ghosts and ghouls grinding their teeth. The beyond she howls and cries, and whoever hears her cry is destined to die soon. Every evil spirit leaves its hideaway. Witches fly to their last coven before winter. Sawin is a night of frights, of marvels and visions. Don't venture into the forest, or a leshy will maul you to death. Don't pass through the boneyard or a corpse will seize you. Better not to leave your house at all and to be on the safe side, stick a new iron knife into the threshold. No evil will dare to pass over it. Whereas womenfolk must closely guard their children. For on so in night, a Razalker or Weeper may steal her child and replace it with a loathsome changeling. And if any woman is with child, she better not go outside for a night spirit may enchant the fetus in her womb. Instead of a babe, a strigger with iron teeth will be born. Lorks! With iron teeth? First it bites its mother's breast, then her hands, it bites her face. Oh, but now I have a hunger. Have her bone, there's still meat on it. Might be healthy for old people to eat too much, they might choke and peg it. <laughs> oh, all right. Bring him more wine, wench. Well, old man, go on about those ghosts. Sorwin, my lord, is the last night for spectres to make merry. Later, the frost takes their strength away, so they sink into the chasm beneath the earth from where they don't stick their noses out the whole winter. For that reason, from Sorwin right until February to the holy day of Imoloch is the best time for an expedition to haunted places to search for treasure. If, when it's warm, someone pokes around by a white sparrow, for example, the white will awake as sure as eggs as eggs, jump out annoyed and devour the rummager. But from sowing to Imolk, poke and dig around as much as you're able, the white sleeps soundly like an old bear. What has he dreamed up, the old bugger? But I speaks the truth, my lord. Yes, yes. Sorwin is a magical, awful night. But also at once, the best for all kinds of prophecies and predictions. On such a night, it's worth telling fortunes and prophesying from bones and palms and from a white cock, from an onion, from cheese, from a coney's innards, from a rotting flitter mouse. Fripp spat on the ground. The night of Sarwin, a night of frights and phantoms. Better to sit tight at home, with all the family, by the fire. With all the family, Cyprian Fripp repeated suddenly grinning voraciously at his comrades. All a family, see? Along with her, what's been slowly hiding away from us in her bushes. The blacksmith's daughter, Yutz Yanonitz guessed at once. That golden-haired peach. You're cute, Fripp. Perhaps we'll catch her at home today. Well, boys, shall we dart over to the blacksmith's shack? Ooh, why not now? Dee Dee Vargas stretched vigorously. I can see that blacksmith's daughter in front of me now, I tell you. 
Oh, those titties bouncing and her little bottom wiggling. We ought to have taken her then, not wait. But take her Silifan, that stupid stickler. Well, but now Silifan ain't here and the blacksmith's daughter's at home, waiting. We've already hacked down the village headman with a bat lax, Respect grimaced. We butchered the churl who came to help him. Do we need more corpses? The blacksmith and his son are built like oak trees. We won't take them with fear. We need to cut them up. Fripp completed the sentence calmly. Just cut them a little, nothing more. Drink up, we'll get set and ride to the village. We'll have ourselves a sawing. We'll don our sheepskins with the fur on the outside. We'll bellow and clamour. The boars will think it's devils or whites. Shall we fetch the blacksmith's daughter here to our quarters? Or make merry our way, in the Jamerian style, in front of her family? The one doesn't rule out the other. Fripp the younger looked out into the night through the window's oiled parchment. What a blizzard's whipped up, damn it! The poplars are bending right over. Ho, 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 said the beggar from over his mug. That isn't the wind, my lord. That's not a blizzard. It's witches dashing astride their brooms, though some are in stone mortars sweeping over the tracks with their brooms. Who knows when one of them may cross the fellow's path in the forest or steal up from behind? Who knows when she may attack when she has teeth like these? It's children you should be frightened with, witches, beggar. Don't speak, my liege, at the wrong time, for I'll tell you more that the most menacing hags, the countesses and duchesses of the witchly state, ho, 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 they don't ride on brooms or on peels or in mortars. No, those ones gallop on their black cats. <laughs> it be the truth. For on Sarwin Eve, on that one and only night of the year, hags' cats turn into mares as black as pitch. And woe betide he who on a night as black as a pall hears the clatter of hooves and sees a hag on a black mare. He who meets such a witch will not shun death. The witch will twist him around like a leaf blown in the wind and carry him off to the beyond. You can finish when we return and come up with a good tale, you bloody beggar, and make ready your pipes. When we return, there'll be revels here. They'll be dancing and the blacksmith's maid will be dandled. What is it, Respect? Respect Lapointe, who had gone out onto the porch to relieve himself, returned at a run with a face as white as snow. He was gesticulating frantically, pointing at the door. He didn't manage to utter a word, and there was no need. A horse neighed loudly from the courtyard. The black mare, said Fripp, his face almost stuck to the parchment. The same black mare! It's her! A witch! It's Falker, you dolt! It's her ghost! Rispat sucked in air. A phantom! She can't have survived! She died and is returned as a spectre on the night of Sowin! She will come at night like a black pall, muttered the beggar, pressing the empty mug to his belly. And who shall meet her will not avoid death. Weapons! Get your weapons! Fripp said excitedly. Quickly! Cover the door from both sides. Don't you understand? We've struck lucky! Falca doesn't know about us. She's come here to get warm. Cold and hunger have driven her out of her hideout. Straight into our arms. Tawny Owl and Ryance will shower us with gold. Get your weapons. The door creaked. The beggar hunched over the table and squinted. His sight was poor. His eyes were old and ruined, fogged and chronically sore. On top of that, it was gloomy and smoky in the tavern so the beggar could barely see the slender figure that had entered the main chamber from the hallway, dressed in a jerkin of muskrat pelts, wearing a hood and a shawl which covered her face. The beggar had good hearing, though. He heard the soft cry of one of the serving wenches, the clatter of the other's clogs and the innkeeper's hushed curse. He heard the scraping of swords in scabbards and Cyprian Fripp's quiet, scornful voice. We have you, Falker. Didn't expect us here, did ya? Oh, yes, I did, the beggar heard, and he trembled at the sound of her voice. He saw the slender figure move and heard a sigh of terror, the muffled scream of one of the wenches. He couldn't see that the girl named Falka had removed her hood and shawl. He couldn't see her hideously disfigured face or her eyes painted all around with a paste of soot and grease like a demon's. I am not Falka, said the girl. The beggar saw again her fast, blurred movement, saw something shine fierily in the light of the cressets. 
I'm Siri of Caer Morhan. I'm a witcher. I've come here to kill you. The beggar, who had seen many a tavern brawl in his life, had a practiced method for avoiding injury. He ducked under the table, curled up and grabbed the table legs tightly. From that position, naturally, he couldn't see anything and didn't want to. He was clutching the table tightly, and it was sliding around the room with the other furniture, amidst clattering, banging and crunching, the thudding of heavily booted feet, curses, shouts, grunts, and the clanging of steel. One of the serving wenches was yelling shrilly, unremittingly. Someone tumbled onto the table, shifting it along with the beggar, and fell onto the floor alongside him. The beggar yelled, feeling hot blood splash onto him. Didi Vargas, the one who had at first wanted to drive him away, the beggar recognised him by the brass buttons on his jerkin, croaked horribly and thrashed about, spurting blood and flailing his arms around. One of his wild movements caught the beggar right in the eye. He could no longer see anything. The screaming serving wench choked, fell silent, took a breath and began to yell again at a somewhat higher pitch. Someone sprawled on the floor with a thud and blood splashed the freshly cleaned pine floorboards. The beggar couldn't tell that the dying man was Rispat La Pointe, slashed in the side of the neck by Siri. He didn't see her turn a pirouette right in front of Fripp and Janowitz's noses and pass through their guards like a shade, like grey smoke. Janowitz slipped behind her with a swift, soft feline turn. He was an expert swordsman. Standing firmly on his right foot, he struck out with a long, extended thrust, aiming at the girl's face, straight at her hideous scar. He couldn't miss, but he did. He was too slow to shield himself. She lunged from close up, two-handed, cutting him across his chest and stomach, and at once sprang back, whirled around, evading Fripp's blow and slashing the crouching Janowitz across the neck. Janowitz pitched over headfirst against a bench. Fripp leapt over the bench and the corpse and struck powerfully. Siri parried obliquely, made a half turn and jabbed him in the side above his hip. Fripp staggered, sprawled onto the table and instinctively extended his arms in front of himself to keep his balance. The moment he rested his hand on the table, Siri hacked it off in a swift slash. Fripp raised the stump spurting blood, examined it intently and then looked at the hand lying on the table and suddenly dropped, sitting down heavily on the floor with a thud, just as though he had slipped on some soap. He sat yelling and then began to bay, with a savage, high-pitched, long-drawn-out, wolf-like howl. Crouching under the table, the blood-drenched beggar heard the ghastly duet continue for a moment, the monotonously yelling serving wench and the spasmodically howling Fripp. The wench was the first to fall silent, her screaming ending in an inhuman, choking croak. Fripp simply fell silent. Mama, he suddenly said, utterly distinctly and lucidly. Dear Mama, what is this? How did... What has... happened to me? What's... the matter with me? You're dying, said the disfigured girl. What was left of the beggar's hair stood up on his head. He clenched his teeth on the sleeve of his coat in order to stop them chattering. Cyprian Fripp, the younger, made a sound as though he was having difficulty swallowing. After that, he uttered no more sounds. None at all. It was completely silent. What have you done? The innkeeper groaned in the silence. What have you done, girl? I'm a witcher. I kill monsters. They'll hang us. They'll burn down the tavern and the village. I kill monsters, she repeated. But in her voice suddenly appeared something like surprise, something like hesitancy, uncertainty. The innkeeper moaned and groaned and sobbed. The beggar slowly emerged from under the table, moving away from Didi Vargas's body and his hideously mutilated face. You ride a black mare, he mumbled, on a night as black as a pall. 
you sweep away the tracks behind you. The girl turned around and looked at him. She had already wrapped the shawl around her face and the black-ringed spectral eyes looked out from over it. Whoever meets you, the beggar mumbled, will not avoid death, for you yourself are death. The girl looked long at him, long and rather dispassionately. You're right, she said finally. Somewhere in the swamps, far away, but much closer than before, a banshee's plaintive wailing sounded a second time. Visigotta lay on the floor where he had collapsed as he was getting out of bed. He found, to his horror, that he couldn't stand up. His heart pounded in his throat, choking him. Now he knew whose death the elven apparition's nocturnal cry was auguring. Life was beautiful, he thought, in spite of everything. Oh, gods, he whispered. I don't believe in you. But if you do exist... A dreadful pain suddenly exploded in his chest, behind his breastbone. Somewhere in the swamps, far away, but much nearer than before, the banshee howled savagely for the third time. If you do exist, protect the witcher girl on the road. I have enormous eyes, all the better to see you with, shrieked the great iron wolf. I have enormous paws, all the better to seize and hug you with. Everything about me is enormous, everything, and soon you will discover it for yourself. Why are you looking at me so strangely, little girl? Why do you not answer? The witcher girl smiled. I have a surprise for you. Florence Delanoy, The Surprise, from the book Fairy Tales and Stories. Chapter 11 The novices stood before the high priestess as straight as ramrods, tense, mute, slightly pale. They were ready to set off, prepared down to the minutest detail. Men's grey travelling clothes, warm, loose-fitting sheepskin coats and comfortable elven boots. Haircuts which could easily be kept clean and tidy on camps and marches so as not to interfere with work. Very small bundles containing only provisions and essential equipment. The army was to provide them with the rest. The army they were enlisting in. The faces of the two girls were composed, seemingly. Triss Merigold could see that the hands and lips of the two girls were quivering faintly. The wind tugged at the bare branches of the trees in the temple grounds, swept dead leaves across the flagstones of the courtyard. The sky was a deep blue. A blizzard was in the air. You could feel it. Nenica broke the silence. Do you have your postings? I, I don't, Yunaid mumbled. For the moment, I'll be in winter quarters in a camp outside Vitsima. The recruiting officer said that in the spring, mercenary units from the north will be stopping there. I'm to be a nurse in one of them. But I, said Yola II, already have my posting to Mr. Milo Vanderbeck, field surgeon. Mind you don't disgrace me. Nenica gave the novices a menacing look. Mind you dishonour neither myself nor the temple, nor the name of great Melitola. Certainly not, O oh mother. And look after yourselves. Yes, O oh mother. You'll be dead tired, attending the wounded. You will not know sleep. You'll be frightened and have doubts as you gaze on pain and death. And then it's easy to misuse narcotics or stimulants. Be careful of that. We know, O oh mother. War, fear, slaughter and blood. The high priestess's eyes drilled into the two girls, mean a slackening of morals, and for some are also a powerful aphrodisiac. How they will act on you, my girls, you do not and cannot know at present. Please be careful about that, too. If, though, it comes to it, take preventative measures. Should one of you get into trouble, in spite of that, stay well away from shady quack solvers and village wise women. Search for a temple, or better yet, a sorceress. We know, O oh mother. That's everything. Now, come closer to receive my blessing. 
She placed her hands on their heads in turn, embraced and kissed them in turn. Yurneid sniffed. Yola II simply burst into tears. Nenica, although her eyes were shining a little more than usual, snorted. Don't make a scene, she said, seemingly crossly and sharply. You're going to a normal war. People return from them. Take your things and I bid you goodbye. Goodbye, O oh mother. They walked briskly towards the temple gate without looking back. The high priestess Nenica, the sorceress Triss Merigold, and the scribe Yara watched them go. Yara drew attention to himself by grunting intrusively. What's the matter? Nenica glared at him. You let them, the boy exploded bitterly. You allowed them girls to sign up? And me? Why am I not allowed? Am I to continue leafing through dusty parchments here, behind these walls? I'm neither a cripple nor a coward. It's a disgrace for me to stay in the temple when even girls... Those girls, the high priestess interrupted, have spent their whole young lives learning to treat and heal illnesses and to care for the sick and wounded. They're going to war not out of patriotism or a hankering after adventure, but because there are countless wounded and sick people there. Piles of work, day and night. Yurneid and Yola, Mira, Katya, Prina, Deborah and the other girls are the temple's contribution to this war. The temple, as part of society, is repaying its debt to society. It's giving the army and the war its contribution. Experts and specialists. Do you understand that, Yara? Specialists, not arrow fodder. Everybody's joining the army. Only cowards are staying at home. You're talking nonsense, Yara, Triss said sharply. You don't understand anything. I want to go to war. The boy's voice broke. I want to rescue... Siri. My, my, Nenica said mockingly. The knight errant wants to ride out to rescue his sweetheart on a white horse. She fell silent under the sorceress's gaze. In any case, enough of this, Yara. She shot the boy a black look. I said I'm not letting you. Return to your books. Study. Your future is scholarship. Come, Triss. Let's not waste time. A bone comb, a cheap ring, a book with a tattered binding, and a faded light blue sash lay spread out on a cloth before the altar. Yola I, a priestess with prophetic powers, was kneeling over the objects. Don't hurry, Yola, Nenica standing beside her warned. Start concentrating slowly. We don't want a dazzling prophecy. We don't want an enigma with a thousand solutions. We want an image a distinct image. Take the aura from these objects. They belonged to Siri. Siri touched them. Take the aura, slowly. There's no hurry. Outside, a strong wind howled and a snowstorm whirled. Snow quickly covered the temple's roofs and courtyard. It was the 19th day of November, a full moon. I'm ready, O mother, Yola I said in her melodious voice. Begin. One moment. Triss sprang up from the bench and threw the chinchilla fur from her shoulders. One moment, Nenica. I, I want to enter the trance with her. That isn't safe. I, I know. But I want to see with my own eyes. I owe her that. I owe it to Siri. I love that girl like a sister. She saved my life in Kaidwen, risking her own life to do it. The sorceress's voice suddenly broke. Just like Yara. The high priestess shook her head. Run to the rescue blindly, recklessly, not knowing where or why. But Yara is a naive young boy, and you're supposedly a mature, wise sorceress. You ought to know that you won't be helping Siri by entering a trance, but you may harm yourself. I want to enter the trance with Yola, Triss repeated, biting her lip. Let me, Nenica. As a matter of fact, what am I risking? An epileptic fit? Even if I am, you'd pull me out of it, wouldn't you? You risk, Nenica said slowly, seeing things you ought not to see. The hill, Triss thought in horror. Sodden hill, where I died, where I was buried and my name was carved into the obelisk over the grave the hill and the grave that will one day call for me. 
I know it. It was prophesied. I've already made my decision, she said coldly, haughtily, standing up and throwing her luxuriant hair back with both hands onto her shoulders. Let us begin. Nenica kneeled down and rested her forehead on her folded hands. Let us begin, she said softly. Make ready, Yola. Kneel beside me, Tris. Take Yola's hand. It was dark outside. The snowstorm moaned. Snow was falling. In the south, far beyond the Amel Mountains in Metina, in a land called Hundred Lakes, in a place far from the town of Elanda and the Temple of Melitola, five hundred miles away as the crow flies, a nightmare jolted the fisherman Gosta awake. After waking, Gosta could remember nothing of the dream, but an eerie anxiety kept him awake for a long time. Every experienced angler knows you must wait for the first ice to land a perch. That year, the winter, although unexpectedly early, played tricks and was as fickle as a pretty popular girl. The first frost and snowstorm came as an unpleasant surprise, like a brigand from an ambush at the beginning of November, right after Sarwin, when no one had been expecting snow or frost, and there was still plenty of work to do. By the middle of November, the lake was already glazed over with a very thin layer of ice, which seemed just about able to bear the weight of a man, when the fickle winter suddenly subsided. Autumn returned. Torrents of rain shattered the ice, and a warm, southerly wind pushed it against the bank and melted it. What the devil, the peasants wondered. Is this winter, or is it not? Not even three days passed before winter returned. This time it came with no snow, with no wind. Instead, the frost gripped like a pair of blacksmith's tongs until everything creaked. Over the course of a night, the eaves, dripping with water, now grinned with sharp-fanged icicles, and astonished waterfowl almost froze to their duck ponds. And the lakes of Kentloch heaved a sigh and turned to ice. Gosta waited one more day, just to be sure, then took the chest with the shoulder strap where he kept his fishing tackle down from the loft. He stuffed his boots well with straw, donned a sheepskin coat, took his chisel and a sack, and hurried to the lake. It's common knowledge that it's best to fish for perch with the first ice. The ice was thick. It sagged a little beneath the man, groaned a little, but held firm. Gosta reached the broad water, cut an ice hole with the chisel, sat down on the chest, unwound a horsehair line fastened to a short larch rod, attached a little tin fish with a hook, and cast it into the water. The first perch, measuring half a cubit, snatched the bait before it had sunk or the line become taut. Before an hour was up, more than four dozen striped green fish with blood-red fins lay all around the ice hole. Gosta had more perch than he needed, but his angler's euphoria wouldn't let him stop fishing. After all, he could always give the fish away to his neighbours. He heard a long, drawn-out snort. He lifted his head up from the ice hole. A splendid black horse was standing on the lake shore, steam belching from its nostrils. The face of the rider, who was dressed in a muskrat coat, was covered. Gosta swallowed. It was too late to run. In his heart of hearts, he hoped the rider wouldn't dare to venture out onto the thin ice. He was still mechanically moving his rod as another perch jerked the line. The angler hauled it out, removed the hook and tossed it down on the ice. Out of the corner of his eye, he saw the rider dismount, toss the reins onto a leafless bush, and walk towards him, treading gingerly on the slippery surface. The perch flapped about on the ice, flexing its spined dorsal fin and moving its gills. Gosta stood up and reached for his chisel, which, as a last resort, might serve as a weapon. Fear not. It was a girl. Now the scarf was removed, he could see her face disfigured by a hideous scar. On her back was a sword. He saw a hilt of exquisite workmanship sticking up above her shoulder. I won't do you any harm, she said quietly. I only want to ask the way. Course you do, thought Gosta. Pull the other one. Now, in winter, in the frost, who treks or travels? Only a brigand or an outcast. This land, is it Miltrachter? 
There it is, he mumbled, staring into the ice hole, into the black water. Miltractor. But we says, Hundred Lakes. And Tarn Mira Lake? Do you know of such a place? Everyone does. He glanced at the girl, frightened. We calls it Bottomless Lake, mind. It's enchanted, awfully deep. Rosalkas live there, drowned folk they do, and phantoms live in the ancient enchanted ruins. He saw her green eyes light up. There are ruins there. A tower, perhaps? What tower? He couldn't suppress a snort. Stone upon stone, covered over with stone, overgrown with weeds, a heap of rubble. The perch had stopped flopping and was lying, moving its gills amidst its colourful striped brothers. The girl stared at it, lost in thought. Death on the ice, she said, has something bewitching about it. Eh? How far is it to the lake with the ruins? Which way should I ride? He told her. He showed her. He even scratched it on the ice with the sharp end of the chisel. She nodded, trying to remember. The mare at the lakeside struck its hooves on the frozen ground and snorted, belching steam from its nostrils. He watched her move away along the western edge of the lake, gallop along the edge of the cliff against a background of leafless alders and birches, through a breathtaking fairy tale forest adorned with a white icing of hoarfrost. The black mare ran with unutterable grace, swiftly, but at the same time lightly, the beat of its hooves barely audible on the frozen ground a faint silver powder of snow dropping from the branches it knocked against, as though it were not an ordinary horse, but one from a fairy tale, as if a spectral horse was running through a mythical forest, the trees bound in hoarfrost like icing. And perhaps it was an apparition, a demon on a ghostly horse, a demon that assumed the form of a girl with huge green eyes and a disfigured face. Who? if not a demon, travels in winter, or asks the way to enchanted ruins. After she had ridden away, Gosta quickly packed away his fishing tackle. He walked home through the forest. He was going out of his way, but his good sense and instincts warned him not to take the forest tracks, to stay out of sight. The girl, his good sense told him, had not, contrary to all appearances, been a phantom. She was a human being. The black mare hadn't been an apparition. It was a horse. And people who gallop through the wilds in winter, to boot, are very often being hunted. An hour later, a search party galloped along the forest track. Fourteen horses. Ryons shook the silver box once again, swore and smacked his saddle pommel in fury. But the xenogloss was silent, as the grave. Magic shit, commented Bollard coldly. It's broken, the cheap Gugor. Or Vilgefortz is showing what he thinks of us, Stefan Skellen added. Ryons raised his head and glared at the two of them. Thanks to this cheap Gugor, he stated caustically. We're on the trail and won't lose it now. Thanks to Lord Vilgefortz, we know which way the girl is headed. We know where we're going and what we have to do. I'd call that plenty compared to your efforts of a month ago. Don't talk so much. Hey, Boreas, what does the trail say? Boreas' man straightened up and cleared his throat. She was here an hour before us. She's riding hard where she can, but it's difficult to rain. Even on that exceptional mare, she's not more than five, six miles ahead of us. And so she's still pushing on among those lakes, Skellen muttered. Vilgefortz was right, and I didn't believe him. Neither did I, Bonnard admitted, until yesterday, when those peasants confirmed there really is some kind of magical structure by Tarn Mira. The horses snorted, steam billowing from their nostrils. Tawny Owl glanced over his left shoulder at Joanna Selborne. For several days he had been none too pleased by the telepath's expression. I'm getting edgy, he thought. This chase has exhausted all of us, physically and mentally. It's time to be done with it. High time. A cold shudder ran down his back. He recalled the dream that had visited him the night before. Very well, he said, coming back to his senses. That's enough meditation. To horse. Boreas Mun hung from his saddle, looking for tracks. 
it wasn't easy. The earth had frozen solid, hard as iron, and the loose snow, quickly blown away by the wind, only lingered in furrows and clefts. It was in them that Boreas was searching for the black mare's hoofprints. He had to pay close attention in order not to lose the trail, especially now, when the magical voice coming from the silver box had fallen silent, stopped giving advice and instructions. He was unbelievably weary and anxious. They'd been tracking the girl for almost three weeks since Sawin and the massacre in Dundara. Almost three weeks in the saddle, constantly on the hunt. And still, neither the black mare nor the girl riding it had weakened or slowed their pace. Boreas Munn looked for tracks. He couldn't stop thinking about a dream from the night before. In it, he had been drowning. The black water had closed over his head and he sank to the bottom, the icy water gushing into his throat and lungs. He awoke hot and sweaty, wet through, although a truly bitter winter was raging around them. It's enough, he thought, hanging from his saddle, looking for tracks. It's high time we were done with it. Master? Do you hear me? Master? The xenogloss was silent as the grave. Ryans moved his arms vigorously and breathed on his numb hands. The cold nipped his neck and shoulders, his lower back and loins hurt. Each jolt of the horse reminded him of the pain. He didn't even feel like swearing. Almost three weeks in the saddle, in an unending pursuit, in the bitter cold and for several days in severe frost. And Vilgefortz was silent. We are too, and we're scowling at each other. Ryons rubbed his hands and pulled down his sleeves. Skelen, he thought, looks at me strangely. Might he be plotting a betrayal? He came to an agreement with Vilgefortz too quickly and too easily back then. And that troop, those thugs, it's him they're loyal to. It's his orders they carry out. When we seize the maid, he is liable, heedless of the agreement, to kill or carry her away to those conspirators of his, in order to enact his insane ideas about democracy and civil government. But perhaps Skellen's got over his conspiracies by now. Perhaps that born conformist and opportunist is now thinking about delivering the maid to Emperor Emir. He looks at me strangely, that tawny owl and that whole mob of his, that Kenna Selborn, and Bonnart. Bonnart is an unpredictable sadist. When he speaks of Siri, his voice trembles with fury. Depending on his whims, if we capture the girl, he's liable to beat her to death, or kidnap her and make her fight in the arena. The agreement with Vilgefortz? He won't care about it, particularly now, when Vilgefortz... He removed the xenogloss from his bosom. Master, do you hear me? It's Ryans. The device was silent. Ryans didn't even feel like swearing. Vilgefortz remained silent. Skelen and Bonnart made a pact with him. Only in a day or two, when we catch up with the girl, it may turn out that there is no pact. And then I might have my throat cut. Or ride in fetters to Nilfgaard as proof of and as ransom against Tawny Owl's loyalty. Solid. Vilgefortz remains silent. He isn't giving us any advice. He's not giving us directions. He isn't dispelling our doubts with his calm, logical voice which touches the depths of your soul. He's silent. The xenogloss has broken down. Perhaps because of the cold. Or maybe... Maybe Skellen was right. Perhaps Vilgefortz really has turned his attention to something else and doesn't care about us or our fate. By all the devils, I never thought it would turn out like this. Had I, I wouldn't have been so enthusiastic about this mission. I would have gone and killed the Witcher instead of Skiru. Damn it. I'm freezing out here, and Skiru is probably nice and warm. To think that I insisted on going after Siri and Skiru after the Witcher. I asked for it myself back at the beginning of September, when Yennefer fell into our hands. The world, a moment ago, still an unreal, soft and muddily sticky blackness, abruptly took on hard surfaces and contours. It became brighter and materialized. 
Yennefer opened her eyes, rocked by convulsive shivers. She lay on the stones among dead bodies and tarred planks, littered with the remains of the rigging of the longship Alcione. She could see feet all around her, feet in heavy boots. One of the boots had just kicked her to bring her around. Get up, witch! Another kick, sending pain shooting right into the roots of her teeth. She saw a face bending over her. Get up, I said, on your feet. Recognize me? She blinked. Yes, she did. It was the man she had burned when he was fleeing from her using a teleporter. Ryons. We'll square accounts, he promised her. We'll square accounts for everything, you slut. I'll teach you what pain is. I'll teach you what pain is with these fingers and these hands. She tensed up, clenched and spread her fingers, ready to cast a spell, and immediately curled up in a ball, choking, wheezing and trembling. Ryan's guffawed. Nothing doing, eh? she heard. You haven't even got a scrap of power. You're no match for Vilgefortz when it comes to sorcery. He squeezed the very last drop out of you, like whey from curds. You can't even... He didn't complete the sentence. Yennefer pulled out a dagger from a sheath, fastened to her inner thigh, sprang like a cat and thrust blindly. She missed. The blade merely brushed her target, tearing his trousers. Ryans leapt aside and fell over. Immediately, a hail of blows and kicks rained down on her. She howled as a heavy boot dropped on her hand, squeezing the dagger from her crushed fist. Another boot kicked her in the belly. The sorceress curled up, rasping. She was picked up from the ground, her arms jerked behind her. She saw a fist flying towards her. The world suddenly flashed brightly, and her face exploded with pain. A wave of pain passed downwards to her stomach and crotch, transforming her knees into a thin jelly. She drooped in the arms holding her up. Someone seized her from behind by the hair, lifting up her head. She was struck once more in the eye socket, and again everything vanished in a blinding flash. She didn't faint. She could still feel. They beat her. They beat her hard, cruelly, as a man is beaten, with blows that aren't just meant to hurt, but meant to fracture, meant to crush all energy and the will to resist from the victim. She was beaten, jerking in the steely grip of many hands. She wanted to faint, but couldn't. She could feel it. Enough! She suddenly heard from far away, from behind the curtain of pain. Have you gone mad, Ryans? Do you mean to kill her? I need her alive. I vowed her, master, snarled the shadow looming in front of her, which gradually took on Ryans's form and face. I promised I'd pay her back. With these hands, I care little for what you promised her. I repeat, I need her alive and capable of articulated speech. It's not so easy, laughed the one holding her by the hair, to knock the life out of a cat or a witch. Don't be clever, Shkiru. I said she's been sufficiently beaten. Pick her up. How do you do, Yennefer? The sorceress spat red and lifted her puffy face. At first, she didn't recognize him. He was wearing a kind of mask, covering the entire left side of his head. But she knew who it was. Go to hell, Vilgefortz, she mumbled, gingerly touching her front teeth and cut lips with her tongue. What did you make of my spell? Did you like it when I lifted you and that boat up from the sea? Did you enjoy the flight? What charms did you protect yourself with to survive the fall? Go to hell. Tear that star from her neck and to the laboratory with her. Let's not waste time. She was dragged, pulled, occasionally carried. A stony plain with Alcione lying smashed on it amid numerous other wrecks with protruding ribs, like the skeletons of sea monsters. Krach was right, she thought. The ships that disappeared without trace on the Sedna Abyss weren't victims of natural disasters. Ye gods, Pavetta and Duni. Above the plain, in the distance, mountain peaks thrust up into the overcast sky. Then there were walls, gates, cloisters, floors, staircases. Everything somehow odd, unnaturally large. Still too few details to let her work out where she was, where she'd come to, where the spell had carried her. Her face was swelling up, making observations all the more difficult. 
Smell became the one sense supplying her with information. She smelled formalin, ether and spirits, and magic. The smells of a laboratory. She was brutally shoved down into a steel armchair. Cold, painfully tight clamps slammed shut on her wrists and ankles. Before the steel jaws of a vice tightened on her temples and immobilized her head, she managed to glance around the large and glaringly lit room. She saw one more armchair and a strange steel construction on the stone floor. Yes, indeed. She heard the voice of Vilgefortz from behind her. That little chair is for your Siri. It's been here for ages. It can't wait. Neither can I. She heard him up close, literally felt his breath. He stuck some needles into her head, attached something to her ears. Then he stood before her and removed the mask. Yennefer sucked in air involuntarily. That's the work of your Siri, he said, indicating his once classically beautiful, now hideously mutilated face, crisscrossed with golden clasps and fastenings, securing a multifaceted crystal in his left eye socket. I tried to catch her when she entered the Tower of the Gull, the sorcerer calmly explained. I meant to save her life, certain that the teleporter would kill her. How naive of me. She passed through smoothly, with such force that the portal exploded, blew up right in my face. I lost an eye and my left cheek, as well as a lot of skin from my face, neck and chest. A very disagreeable, very bothersome, very complicated accident. And very ugly, isn't it? Ha! <laughs> you ought to have seen me before I began to regenerate magically. If I believed in such things, he continued, pushing a bent copper tube into her nose, I'd have thought it was Lydia van Bredevoort's revenge from beyond the grave. I'm regenerating, but it's slow, time-consuming and heavy-going. It's particularly difficult with regeneration of the eyeball. The crystal in my eye socket plays its role splendidly. I can see in three dimensions, but yet it's a foreign body and the lack of a natural eyeball occasionally makes me absolutely furious. Then, seized by, let's face it, irrational anger, I vow to myself that when I catch Siri, immediately after catching her, I'll order Ryans to pluck out one of those huge green eyes with his fingers, with these fingers, as he likes to say. You're saying nothing, Yennefer. Perhaps because you know I'd also like to rip out one of your eyes? Or both? He stuck thick needles into the veins on the back of her hands. Sometimes he missed and jabbed to the very bone. Yennefer gritted her teeth. You've caused me problems. You've made me interrupt my work. You've exposed me to risk forcing your way over the Sedna abyss in that boat towards my maelstrom. The echo of our brief duel was powerful and travelled far. It may have reached the wrong ears, prying ears. But I couldn't stop myself. The thought that I would have you here, that I'd be able to connect you up to my scanner, was too appealing. For you can't possibly imagine. He stuck in another needle that I was taken in by your provocation, that I swallowed the bait? No, Yennefer, if you think so, you're mistaking stars reflected in the surface of a pond at night for the sky. You thought you were tracking me, whereas in fact, I was tracking you. You made my job easier by sailing over the abyss, for I cannot find Siri, you see even with the help of my peerless scanning device. The girl has powerful innate defense mechanisms, her own powerful anti-magical and suppressive aura. It's the elder blood, after all. But my super scanners ought to detect her anyhow. Yet they don't. Yennefer was now completely entwined in a network of silver and copper wires and encased in a scaffolding of silver and porcelain tubes. Glass vessels containing colourless liquids wobbled on racks placed by the chair. 
And so I thought. Vilgefortz thrust another tube into her nose, this time a glass one, that the only way of tracking Siri was an empathic probe. For that, I needed someone who had a sufficiently strong emotional bond with the girl and had developed an empathic matrix, a kind of algorithm, to coin a phrase, of feelings and mutual affection. I thought about the Witcher, but he had disappeared. And besides, Witchers are poor mediums. I planned to order the kidnapping of Triss Merigold, our fourteenth from the hill. I pondered over abducting Nenica of Elenda, but when it turned out that you, Yennefer of Wengerberg, were literally forcing yourself into my hands, truly I couldn't have hoped for anything better. Once connected to the scanner, you will track down Siri for me. Admittedly, the operation requires your cooperation, but there are, as you know, ways of making people cooperate. Of course, he went on, rubbing his hands, you deserve a few explanations. For example, how did I find out about the Elder Blood? About Lara Doran's legacy? What that gene actually is? How Siri ended up having it? Who passed it on to her? How will I take it from her? And what will I use it for? How does the Sedna Maelstrom work? Who have I sucked into it? What did I do with them and why? Plenty of questions, aren't there? It's such a pity there's no time to tell you everything, explain everything. Nay, even astonish you. For I'm certain several of the facts would astonish you, Yennefer. But, as has been said before, there's no time. The elixirs are beginning to take effect. So it's time you started concentrating. The sorceress clenched her teeth, stifling the deep groan shooting from her guts. I know, Vilgefortz nodded, drawing closer a professional-looking megascope. A screen and a great crystal ball on a tripod, wrapped around by a web of silver wires. I know it's most disagreeable and very painful. The sooner you set about scanning, the sooner it'll be over. Well, Yennefer, I want to see Siri here on this screen. Where she is, who she's with, what she's doing, what she eats, where and with whom she sleeps. Yennefer screamed shrilly and wildly in despair. It hurts, Vilgefortz guessed, staring at her with his living eye and his dead crystal. Well, of course it hurts. Start scanning, Yennefer. Don't resist. Don't play the hero. You know full well it's impossible to endure this. The result of resistance may be pitiful. A stroke will follow. You'll suffer paraplegia or simply turn into a vegetable. Start scanning. She clenched her jaw so hard her teeth creaked. Why not, Yennefer? The mage said kindly. If only out of curiosity. You're surely curious about how your darling's coping. Perhaps danger is hanging over her. Perhaps she's in need. You know, after all, how many people wish Siri ill and desire her death. Start scanning. When I find out where the girl is, I'll bring her here. She'll be safe. No one will find her here, ever. His voice was warm and velvety. Start scanning, Yennefer. Start scanning. I implore you. I give you my word. I'll only take what I need from Siri, and then I'll give both of you your freedom. I swear. Yennefer gritted her teeth even harder. Blood trickled down her chin. Vilgefortz suddenly stood up and beckoned. Ryans? Yennefer 
felt some kind of device tightening over her hands and fingers. At times, said Vilgefort, bending over her, where magic elixirs and narcotics fail, what works on the stubborn is good old-fashioned pain. Don't make me do it. Start scanning. Go to hell, Vilgefort! Tighten the screws, Ryans, slowly. Vilgefortz glanced at the torpid body being dragged across the floor towards the stairs to the cellar. Then he lifted his eye towards Ryans and Skiru. There's always the risk, he said, that one of you will fall into the hands of my enemies and be interrogated. I'd like to think that you'll demonstrate as much fortitude. Yes, I'd like to think so. But I don't. Ryans and Skiru said nothing. Vilgefortz started up the megascope again and projected the image generated by the huge crystal onto the screen. That's all she could produce, he said, pointing. I wanted Cyrilla. She gave me the Witcher. Fascinating. She didn't allow the girl's empathic matrix to be wrested from her, but she cracked when it came to Geralt. And I didn't suspect her of harboring any feelings for Geralt at all. Well, for now, let's settle for what we have. Witcher, Kair Epkialach, the bard dandelion, some woman? Hmm, who'll undertake this task? The final solution to the Witcher problem? Skiru volunteered recalled Ryans, raising himself up in the stirrups to give his saddle sore buttocks at least some relief. Skiro volunteered to kill the witcher. He recognized the countryside Yennefer had traced Geralt and his company to. He had friends or family there. Vilgefort sent me, meanwhile, to negotiate with Vatier de Rido, and then to tail Skelen and Bonhart. And I, stupidly, was glad at the time, certain that the easier and more pleasant task had fallen to me, one I would make short, easy, pleasant work of. If the peasants weren't lying, Stefan Skelen stood up in his stirrups. The lake must be over that hill in the valley. The trial leads there, Boreas Munn confirmed. Why have we stopped here? Ryans rubbed a frozen ear. Spur on the horses and let's go. Not so fast. Bonnard held him back. Let's split up. We'll encircle the valley. We don't know which of the lake's shores she took. If we choose the wrong way, we may put the lake between us. Yeah, very true, Boreas nodded. The lake's frozen over. It might be too thin for the horses. Bonnard's right. We must split up. Skelen quickly issued orders. The group, led by Bonnard, Ryans and Ola Harsheim, numbering seven horses in total, galloped along the eastern shore, quickly disappearing into the Black Forest. Very well, Tawny Owl ordered. Let's go, Silifant. He realized at once that something wasn't right. He reined his horse around, slapped it with his knout, and rode directly for Joanna Selborne. Kenna backed up her mount, and her face seemed to be made of stone. It's no use, sir, she said hoarsely. <laughs> Don't even try. We're not going with you. We're turning back. We've had enough. We? Dacus Elephant yelled. Who's we? What is this, a mutiny? Skelen leaned over in the saddle and spat on the frozen earth. Andres Vieni and Tille Krada, the fair-haired elf, had stopped behind Kenna. Miss Selborne, said Tawny Owl scathingly, in a slow, drawling voice. It isn't to the point that you are squandering a very promising career, that you're permanently throwing away the chance of a lifetime. You'll be handed over to the hangman, along with these fools who've listened to you. Whoever's meant to hang won't drown, Kenner replied philosophically. And don't threaten us with a hangman, sir, for who knows who's closer to the scaffold, you or us? Is that what you think? Tawny Owl's eyes flashed. You're convinced of that after slyly eavesdropping on somebody's thoughts. I thought you were cleverer than that, but you're stupid, woman. Whoever's with me wins. Whoever's against me always loses. Remember that, girl. Even though you think I'm incriminated now, I'll still manage to send you to hang. Do you hear, you mutineers? 
I'll have your flesh torn from your bones with red hooks. We have but one life, sir, Tilikrada said softly. You've chosen your way, and we've chosen ours. Both are uncertain and risky, and no one knows what fate will befall any of us. You won't set us on the girl like dogs, Mr. Skellen, sir. Kenna raised her head proudly. And we won't let ourselves be killed like dogs, like Naratin Tsekar. Oh, enough talking. We're turning back. Boreas, come with us. No. The tracker shook his head, wiping his forehead with his fur hat. Farewell. I don't wish you ill, but I'm staying. It's my service. I took the oath. To whom? Kenna frowned. The Emperor or Tawny Owl? Or a sorcerer talking from a box? I'm a soldier. I serve. Wait! called Dufizi Creel, riding out from behind Dacre Siliphant. I'm with you. I've had enough of this too. Last night I dreamed of my own death. I don't want to crock for this lousy, suspicious affair. Traitors! yelled Dacre, flushing like a cherry. It seemed as though dark blood would spurt from his face. Turncoats! Miserable curs! Shut your trap! Tawny Owl was still looking at Kenna and his eyes were just as hideous as the bird from which he took his name. They've chosen their way, you heard. There's no point shouting or wasting spit. But we'll meet again one day, I promise you. Perhaps even on the same scaffold, Kenna said without spitefulness. For they won't put you to death alongside noble princes, will they, Skelen? But with us churls. But you're right, there's no point wasting spit. Let's be going. Farewell, Boreas. Farewell, Mr. Siliphant. Dacre spat over his horse's ears. And beyond what I've said here, Joanna Selborne proudly raised her head, brushing a dark lock from her forehead. I have nothing to add, illustrious tribunal. The convener of the tribunal looked down on her. His face was inscrutable, his eyes grey and decent. Anyway, what do I care, thought Kenna. I'll try. You can only die once. Sink or swim. I'm not going to write in the citadel and wait for death. Tawny Al didn't make wild promises. He's liable to take revenge even from beyond the grave. What do I care? Perhaps they won't notice. Sink or swim. She pressed her hand to her nose, seemingly wiping it. She looked straight into the grey eyes of the tribunal convener. God, said the convener, Please take the witness, Joanna Selborne, back to... He broke off and started coughing. Sweat suddenly broke out on his forehead. To the, the tribunal chancellery, he finished sniffing loudly. Write out the appropriate documents and release her. The witness Selborne is of no further use to the court. Kenna surreptitiously wiped away the drop of blood that was trickling from her nose. She smiled charmingly and thanked him with a delicate bow. They've deserted, Bonnart repeated in disbelief. More of them have deserted, and just rode away like that. Skelen, you permitted it? If they inform on us, Ryons began, but Tawny Owl interrupted him at once. They won't inform, because they don't want to lose their own heads. And besides, what could I have done? When Creel joined them, only Bert and Munn were left with me and there were four of them. Four, said Bonnart malevolently, isn't many at all. As soon as we've caught up with a girl, I'll go after them, and I'll feed them to the crows in the name of let's catch her up first. Tony Owl cut him off, urging on his grey with his knout. Boreas, keep your eyes on the trail. The valley was filling up with a dense blanket of fog, but they knew that down below was a lake, because there was a lake in every valley in Miltrachta. The one, meanwhile, to which the black mare's hoofprints were leading was undoubtedly the one they were looking for, the one Vilgefortz had ordered them to look for, which he'd described to them precisely, and whose name he had given them, Tarn Mira. The lake was narrow, no wider than an arrow shot, crowded into a slightly bent crescent between high, steep hillsides covered in black spruce, beautifully sprinkled with a white, snowy powder. The hillsides were swathed in such a silence that there was a ringing in their ears. Even the crows, whose portentous cawing had accompanied them on the trail for the last fortnight or so, had fallen silent. This is the southern end, stated Bonnart. 
If the mage hasn't made a hash of everything and landed us in it, the magical tower is on the northern shore. Keep your eyes on the trail, Boreas. If we pick up the wrong one, the lake will separate us from her. The trail is clear, Boreas Mun called from below. And fresh. It's leading towards the lake. Ride. Skelen brought his grey skittering on the steep slope under control. Downhill. They rode down the slope, cautiously, reining back the snorting horses. They struggled through the bare, black, ice-covered thicket, blocking the way to the bank. Barnard's horse stepped gingerly onto the ice, crunching through the dry reeds sticking up from the glazed surface. The ice creaked, and long arrows of cracks diverged like a star from under the horse's hooves. About face! Barnard pulled in the reins and turned his snorting horse back towards the bank. Dismount! The ice is thin. Only by the bank in the reeds, Dekka Silphant judged, striking a heel onto the icy crust. But even here it's at least an inch and a half. It'll hold a horse sure as anything. No need to wa- His words were drowned out by cursing and neighing. Skelen's grey slipped, sat down on its haunches, and its legs spread apart under it. Skelen struck it with his spurs, swore again, and this time the curse was accompanied by the harsh crunch of ice breaking. The grey pounded with its forehooves, its hind ones imprisoned, thrashed about in the tangle, breaking up the ice and churning the dark water, spurting from under it. Tawny Owl dismounted, tugged on the reins, but slipped and went sprawling, miraculously not falling under the hooves of his own horse. The two Jimerians, now also on their feet, helped him up. Ola Harsheim and Bert Brigden hauled the whinnying grey out onto the bank. Dismount, Bonnart repeated his eyes fixed on the fog covering the lake. There's no sense risking it. We'll catch up with the maid on foot. She also dismounted. She's also moving on foot. How very true, confirmed Boreas Mun, pointing at the lake. It's blind to see. Only at the very edge, beneath overhanging branches, was the crust of ice smooth and translucent, like the dark glass of a bottle. Under it, reeds and water plants turned brown were visible. Further from the bank, the ice was covered in a very thin layer of wet snow, and on it, as far as the fog permitted them to see, were dark footprints. We have her, Ryans cried heatedly, throwing his reins on a broken bough. So, she's not as cunning as she seems. She set off on the ice, straight across the middle of the lake. Had she chosen one of the banks or the forest, it wouldn't have been easy to pursue her. Straight across the middle of the lake, Bonnard repeated giving the impression of being lost in thought. The shortest and straightest way to the alleged magical tower Vilgefortz talked about leads across the middle of the lake. She knows that. Mun? How far ahead of us is she? Boreas Mun, who was already on the lake, knelt down over a boot print, leaned over low and examined it. A half hour, he estimated. Not more. It's getting warmer, but the print isn't fuzzy. You can see every hobnail in the sole. The lake, mumbled Bonnard, vainly trying to look through the fog, stretches north for more than five miles, so said Vilgevortz. If the maid has half an hour's start, she's about a mile ahead of us. No slippery ice? Mun shook his head. Not even that. Six, seven furlongs at most. Even better. March. March, Tony Owl repeated. Onto the ice and quick march. They walked swiftly, puffing. The quarry's closeness excited them, filled them with euphoria like a narcotic. She won't escape us, as long as we don't lose the trail, and as long as she isn't leading us up the garden path in this fog. It's white as milk. You can't see twenty paces ahead, damn it. Move your asses, Ryan snarled. Quick, quick, as long as there's snow on the ice, we're following her trail. The trail is fresh, Boreas Mun suddenly muttered, stopping and stooping down. Very fresh. You can see the print of every hobnail. She's just in front of us. Just in front of us. Why can't we see her? And why can't we hear her? Ola Harsheim wondered. Our footsteps boom on the ice. The snow creaks. So why don't we hear her? Because you're yakking. Ryan's cut them off abruptly. Keep marching. Boreas Munn took off his hat to wipe his sweat-covered forehead. She's there, in the fog he said softly. Somewhere there in the fog. But the devil knows where. The devil knows whence she'll strike. 
lot back there, in Dundara, on Sawin Eve. He began to draw his sword from its scabbard with a trembling hand. Tawny Owl leapt at him, seized him by the arm, and tugged him forcefully. Shut your trap, you old fool, he hissed. But it was too late. The terror had spread to the others. They also drew their swords, involuntarily positioning themselves to have one of their companions behind them. She is not a spectre, Ryan snapped loudly. She isn't even a witch, and there are ten of us. In Dandara, there were only four, and they were all drunk. Spread out, said Bonnard suddenly. To the left and right in a line, and move forward together. Don't lose sight of each other. You too, Ryan's grimaced. Has it infected you too, Bonnard? I thought you were less superstitious than that. The bounty hunter looked at him with eyes that were colder than ice. Spread out into a line, he repeated, ignoring the sorcerer. Keep your distance. I'm going back for my horse. What? Bonnard didn't grace Ryans with an answer again. Ryans swore, but Tawny Owl quickly placed a hand on his shoulder. Leave it, he snapped. Let him go, and let's not waste time. In a line. Bert and Stigwood left. Ola, right. What for, Skelen? The ice will break more easily under men walking in a group, Boreas Munn muttered. Then spread out in a line. Furthermore, if we walk in a line abreast, there's less of a risk the wench will outflank us. Outflank us, Ryan snorted. How could she? The tracks in front of us are plain as a pikestaff. The maid is going straight ahead. Were she to try to turn, the trail would betray it. Enough chatter. Tawny Owl cut them off, looking back into the fog into which Bonnard had vanished as he left them. Forward. They went on. It's getting warmer, Boreas Munn panted. The ice on top is melting. It'll form overflow ice. The fog's getting thicker. But the footprints can still be seen, said Dacus Elephant. Moreover, it seems the girl has slowed down. Her strength is waning. As is ours. Ryans tore off his hat and fanned himself with it. Quiet! Silifant suddenly stopped. Did you hear that? What was it? I didn't hear anything, but I did. Like a scraping. A scraping on the ice. But not from there. Boreas Munn pointed at the fog into which the trail was fading. He seems to be over on the left, to the side. I heard it too. Tawny Owl confirmed, looking anxiously around. But now it's gone quiet. Damn it, I don't like it. I don't like it. The footprints, Ryan said with wearied emphasis. We can still see her footprints. Don't you have eyes? She's walking straight ahead. If she took even a single step to one side, we'd know it from the trail. Quick march, we'll have her soon. I give my word, we'll see her in a moment. He broke off. Boreas Munn sighed so hard his lungs groaned. Tawny Owl cursed. Ten paces in front of them, just before the limit of visibility bordered by the dense fog. The tracks ended. They vanished. A pox on it. What is it? Has she taken flight or what? No, Boreas Munn shook his head. She hasn't. It's worse. Ryans swore crudely pointing at scratches in the icy crust. Skates, he growled, involuntarily clenching his fists. She has skates. Now she is darting across the ice like the wind. We won't catch her. What? Damn, his eyes has become a bonnet. We won't catch the maid without horses. Boreas Munn hawked loudly and sighed. Skelen slowly unbuttoned his sheepskin coat, uncovering a bandolier with a row of Orions slung across his chest. We won't have to hunt her, he said coldly. She'll be the one hunting us. I'm afraid we won't have long to wait. Have you gone mad? Bonnard anticipated this. That's why he went back for his horse. He knew the girl would lure us into a trap. Beware. Listen for the grating of skates on ice. Dacre Silifant paled visibly, despite his cheeks being flushed from the cold. Fellows, he yelled. Beware. Take heed, and gather together. Don't get lost in the fog. Shut up, Tawny Owl roared. Keep quiet. Absolute silence, or we won't hear. They heard. A short, strangled cry reached their ears from the fog to the left, from the furthest end of the line, 
and the sharp, rough grating of skates, making the hair stand on end like iron scoring glass. But, Tony Owl yelled, but, what's happening over there? They heard an unintelligible cry, and a moment later, Bert Brigden emerged from the fog, fleeing pell-mell. As soon as he was near, he slipped, fell over, and slid across the ice on his stomach. She got... Stigworth, he panted out, struggling to get up. She cut him down as she flashed past. So swiftly. I barely saw her. She's a witch. Skelen swore. Siliphant and Mun, both with swords in hand, whirled around, staring goggle-eyed into the fog. Grating. 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 Quick. Rhythmic. And more and more clearly. More and more clearly. Where's it coming from? roared Boreas Mun, spinning around, flourishing the blade of his sword two-handed. Where's it coming from? Quiet! screamed Tawny Owl, with an Orion in his raised hand. I think it's from the right. Yes, from the right. She's coming up on the right. Look out! The Jamarian walking on the right wing suddenly cursed, turned around, and ran blindly into the fog, sloshing through the melting layer of ice. He didn't get far, not even out of sight. They heard the sharp grating of skates gliding and made out a blurred, flickering shadow and the flash of a sword. The Jamarian howled. They saw him fall, saw a broad spray of blood on the ice. The wounded man thrashed about, curled up, screamed and moaned. Then he fell silent and stopped moving. But while he was still moaning, he drowned out the sound of the skates. They didn't expect the girl to be able to turn back so swiftly. She fell among them, right in their midst. She cleaved Ola Harsheim as she flashed past, low, beneath the knee, folding him up like a penknife. She spun in a pirouette, covering Boreas Mun in a stinging hail of icy shards. Skillen, left aside, slipped and caught Ryans by a sleeve. They both fell over. The skates grated just beside them, and cold, sharp fragments stung their faces. One of the Jamarians yelled, and his cry broke off in a savage croak. Tawny Owl knew what had happened. He'd heard many people having their throats cut. Ola Hosheim shouted, rolling around on the ice. Grating, grating, grating. Silence. Mr. Stefan, Dacus Elephant gibbered. Mr. Stefan, you're my only hope. Save me. Don't let me. She's fucking crippled me. Ola Hosheim bellowed. Help me, for fuck's sake. Help me get up. Bonart. Skellen yelled into the fog. Bonart! Help us! Where are you, you awesome? Bonart! She's got us surrounded, Boreas Mun gasped, spinning around and straining to hear. She's skating around us in the fog. She'll strike a will. Death. That wench is death. We'll breathe our last here. It'll be a massacre like it was on Saw and Eve in Dundera. Stick together, Skellen groaned. Stick together. She's picking us off one by one. When you see her looming up, don't lose your heads. Trip her up with swords, saddlebags, belts. Use anything to stop her. He broke off. This time, they didn't even hear the scraping of skates. Dacre, Siliphant and Ryans saved their lives by dropping flat onto the ice. Boreas Munn managed to jump aside, slipped, fell over and upended Bert Brigden. As the girl flashed by, Skellen swung and threw an Orion. It found the target, but not the right one. Ola Harsheim, who had managed to get up, tumbled over in convulsions onto the blood-spattered ice. His staring eyes seemed to cross on the steel star sticking out of the bridge of his nose. The last of the Jamarians threw down his sword and began to sob in short, choking spasms. Skellen sprang at him and struck him hard in the face. Pull yourself together, he roared. Get a grip on yourself. It's just one girl. Just one girl. Like in Dandera, on so in Eve, said Boreas Mun softly. We shall never get off this ice, off this lake. Listen out, listen out, and you'll hear death gliding towards you. Skelen picked up the Jamarian's sword and tried to shove it into the sobbing man's hand, but unsuccessfully. The Jamarian, racked by spasms, turned his dull gaze onto him. Tawny Owl threw down the sword and jumped at Ryans. Do something, sorcerer! he roared, tugging at his arm. Terror redoubled his strength, and although Ryans was taller, heavier, and more powerful, he flopped around in Tawny Owl's grasp like a ragdoll. 
Do something. Summon that high and mighty Vilgefortz of yours. Work some magic yourself. Work magic. Perform witchcraft. Invoke spirits. Conjure up demons. Do something. Anything, you little turd. Do something before that she-phantom kills us all. The echo of his cry boomed across the forested hillsides. Before it died away, the skates grated again. The sobbing Jamerian fell to his knees and covered his face in his hands. Bert Brigden howled, flung his sword away and bolted. He slipped, fell over and scampered for a few paces on all fours like a dog. Ryans! The sorcerer swore and raised a hand. As he chanted the spell, his hand was trembling, his voice too. But he was successful, though not, admittedly, completely successful. The thread-like, fiery lightning bolt spurting from his fingers carved up the ice, fracturing the surface. But not crossways, as it should have, to bar the way of the approaching girl. It broke lengthways. The crust of ice cleaved open with a loud cracking sound. Black water gushed and rumbled, and the rapidly widening rift shot towards Dekasilifant, who was looking on in stupefaction. Jump aside, Skillen yelled. Run! It was too late. The crack sped between Silifant's legs and split open, the ice shattering like glass and breaking into huge slabs. Dacre lost his balance and the water stifled his howl. Boreas Munn fell into the breach. The kneeling Jamerian vanished under the water and Ola Harsheim's body disappeared. Ryans plopped after them into the black depths, followed by Skelen, who managed to catch hold of the edge at the last moment. Meanwhile, the girl pushed off powerfully and flew over the breach, landing so hard the melting ice splashed and darted after the fleeing Brigden. A moment later, a hair-raising scream reached the ears of Tawny Owl, who was hanging onto the edge of the ice floe. She'd caught up with him. Sir, moaned Boreas Mun, who by some miracle had managed to crawl out onto the ice. Give me your hand, my lord coroner. After being hauled out, Skelen turned blue and began to shiver violently. The edge of the ice was breaking under Silifant, who was struggling to drag himself out. Dacre vanished beneath the water again, but he surfaced at once, choking and spitting, and dragged himself onto the ice with superhuman effort. He crawled out and collapsed, exhausted to the limits. A puddle spread out beside him. Boreas moaned and closed his eyes. Skelen was trembling. Save me! Come on! Help! Ryons hung onto the edge of the ice, submerged up to his armpits. His wet hair was plastered smoothly to his skull. His teeth were chattering like castanets, sounding like a ghoulish overture to some infernal dance macabre. The skates grated. Boreas didn't move. He waited. Skelen was trembling. She approached, slowly. Blood trickled from her sword, marking the ice with a trail of drops. Boreas swallowed. Although he was soaked to the skin with icy water, he suddenly felt unbearably hot. But the girl wasn't looking at him. She was looking at Ryans, who was vainly struggling to get out onto the ice. Help me! Ryans overcame the chattering of his teeth. Save me! The girl braked, whirling on the skates with the grace of a dancer. She stood with legs slightly apart, holding her sword in both hands, low across her thighs. Help me, Ryons howled, digging his numbing fingers into the ice. Save me, and I'll tell you where Yennefer is, I swear. The girl slowly pulled the scar from her face and smiled. Boreas Munn saw the hideous scar and fought to stifle a shout. Ryans, said Siri, still smiling. You were going to teach me pain, weren't you? Do you remember? With those hands. With those fingers. Those ones? Those? The ones you're holding the ice with? Ryans answered, but Boreas didn't understand what he said, for the sorcerer's teeth were chattering and rattling so much they made articulated speech impossible. Siri spun around on her skates and lifted the sword. Boreas clenched his teeth, convinced she would slash Ryans. But the girl was picking up momentum to set off. To the tracker's astonishment, she skated away quickly, gathering speed with powerful thrusts. She vanished into the fog. And a moment later, the rhythmic scraping of the skates also died away. 
Man, pull me out, Ryan sparked out, chin on the edge of the ice floe. He flung both hands on the ice, trying to hang on with his fingernails, which had largely been torn away. He spread his fingers, trying to cling to the blood-stained ice with his hands and wrists. Boreas Munn looked at him and was certain, terrifyingly certain. They heard the grinding of the skates at the last moment. The girl approached at extraordinary speed, literally a blur. She skated up at the very edge of the flow, speeding along right beside the brink. Ryons screamed and choked on the viscous, leaden water and vanished. There was blood on the ice, on the perfectly even tracks left by the skates. And fingers. Eight fingers. Boreas Munn vomited on the ice. Bonnart galloped along the edge of the lake, hurtling along, heedless that any moment the horse might break its legs on the snow-covered clefts. Frosted over spruce branches, lashed his face and whipped his arms, and icy powder poured down his collar. He couldn't see the lake. The entire valley was filled with fog, like a bubbling witch's cauldron. But Bonnart knew the girl was there. He sensed it. Deep under the ice, a school of striped perch curiously followed the silver, fascinatingly glimmering casket, which had slipped out of the pocket of a corpse floating in the water. Before the casket had sunk to the bottom, raising a cloud of silt, the boldest of the perch even tried to nudge it with their snouts, but they suddenly took flight in terror. The casket was emitting strange, alarming vibrations. Ryans, can you hear me? What's been going on? Why haven't you responded for two days? Give me a report. What about the maid? You can't let her enter the tower. Do you hear? You can't let her enter the Tower of the Swallow. Ryans, answer, damn it, Ryans. Ryans, naturally, could not answer. The embankment came to an end. The shore flattened out. It's the end of the lake, thought Bonnard. I've done it. I've trapped the maid. Where is she? And where's that sodding tower? The curtain of fog suddenly ruptured and lifted. And then he saw her. She was right in front of him, sitting on her black mare. She's a witch, he thought. She communicates with that beast. She sent it to the end of the lake and ordered it to wait for her. But that won't help her. I have to kill her. The devil take Vildevots. I have to kill her. First, I'll make her beg for her life. And then I'll kill her. He yelled, pricked his horse with his spurs, and launched into a breakneck gallop, and suddenly realized he had lost, that she'd deceived him. Not more than a furlong separated him from her, but over thin ice. She was on the other side of the lake. What's more, the crescent of open water now curved around the opposite way. The girl, riding along the bowstring, was much closer to the end of the lake than he was. Bonnart swore tugged on the reins and steered his horse onto the ice. Right, Kelpie! Frozen earth shot from under the black mare's hooves. Siri clung to the horse's neck. The sight of Bonnart pursuing her filled her with dread. She was afraid of him. An invisible fist tightened on her stomach at the thought of facing him in combat. No, she couldn't fight him, not yet. The tower... Only the tower could save her, and the portal. As on Thaneth, when the sorcerer Vilgefortz was upon her, was already reaching for her. The only hope was the tower of the swallow. The fog lifted. Siri reined in her horse, suddenly feeling a dreadful heat. Unable to believe what she saw, what was in front of her. Barnard saw it too, and yelled triumphantly. There was no tower at the end of the lake. There weren't even the ruins of a tower. There was nothing. Just a barely visible, barely outlined hillock. Just a mound of boulders covered in frozen, leafless stalks. That's your tower, he roared. That's your magical tower. That's your salvation. A heap of stones. 
The girl seemed not to hear or see. She urged the mare nearer the hillock onto the stony mound. She raised both hands towards the sky as though cursing the heavens for what had befallen her. I told you that you were mine, roared Bonnard, spurring on his bay, that I'll do what I want with you, that no one will stop me from doing it, not people, not gods, not devils, nor demons, or enchanted towers. You're mine, witcher girl. The bay's shoes jangled on the icy surface of the lake. The fog suddenly swirled, boiled under the impact of a strong wind appearing as if from nowhere. The bay whinnied and danced, bearing its teeth on the bit. Bonnart leaned back in the saddle and tugged on the reins with all his might because the horse was frantic, tossing its head, stamping and slipping on the ice. In front of him, between him and the shore where Siri was standing, a snowy white unicorn was dancing on the ice, rearing up as if on a heraldic shield. Don't try tricks like that on me, roared the bounty hunter, fighting to get control of his horse. You won't frighten me with sorcery. I'll catch you, Siri. I'll kill you this time, witcher girl. You're mine. The fog swirled again and seethed, forming bizarre shapes. The shapes became clearer and clearer. They were horsemen, nightmarish silhouettes of eerie horsemen. Bonnart stared goggle-eyed. Skeleton riders rode skeleton horses dressed in rust-riddled armor and chainmail, ragged cloaks, dented and corroded helmets decorated with buffalo horns and the remains of ostrich and peacock plumes. The specter's eyes shined with a bluish light from under their visors. Ragged pennants swished. An armed man with a crown on his helmet and a necklace bumping against the rusty cuirass on his chest galloped at the head of the demonic cavalcade. Be gone rumbled a voice in Bonnard's head. Be gone, mortal. She is not yours. She is ours. Be gone. There was no denying Bonnard had one thing. Courage. He did not take fright at the apparitions. He overcame his terror and did not give in to panic. But his horse turned out to be less resolute. The bay reared, danced ballet-like on its hind legs, whinnied frantically, kicked and pranced. The ice broke with a horrifying crunching sound under the impact of its hooves. The sheets of ice stood up vertically and water gushed out. The horse squealed and struck the edge with its forehooves, fracturing it. Bonnart yanked his feet from the stirrups and jumped. Too late. The water closed over his head. There was a drumming and a ringing as though in a belfry. His lungs were full to bursting. He was lucky. His feet, kicking out in the water, struck something, probably his horse as it sank to the bottom. He pushed off, bursting from the water, spitting and gasping. He seized hold of the edge of the ice hole. Without yielding to panic, he drew a knife, drove it into the ice and hauled himself out. He lay, panting heavily, the water trickling from him and splashing down. The lake, the ice the snow-bound hillsides, the black and frost-encrusted spruce forest, all of a sudden everything was flooded with an unnatural, pallid light. Barnard struggled to his knees with immense effort. Above the horizon, the deep blue was lit by a crown of brightness, a luminous dome from which fiery pillars and spirals suddenly rose and scintillating columns and vortices of light burst forth. Shimmering, flickering, Rapidly changing shapes, ribbons and curtains hung on the horizon. Bonnard croaked. It was as though he had an iron garrote around his throat. A tower had risen up, where a moment before had been only a barren hillock and a pile of stones. Majestic, soaring and slender, black, glassy and gleaming, as though carved from a single piece of basalt. Fire flickered in the few windows, and the aurora borealis glowed in the serrated battlements. He saw the girl looking towards him from the saddle. He saw her bright eyes and the cheek slashed by the line of an ugly scar. He saw the girl spur her black mare and unhurriedly ride into the black gloom under the arched stone entrance and disappear. The aurora borealis exploded in dazzling swirls of fire. When Bonhart regained his sight. The tower was gone. There was the snow-topped hillock, the pile of stones, the withered black stalks. 
kneeling on the ice in the puddle of water trickling from him, the bounty hunter screamed savagely, horribly. On his knees, arms raised towards the sky, he screamed, howled, swore and railed against people, gods and demons. The echo of his cries rolled over the spruce-forested hillsides, drifted over the frozen surface of Tarn Mira Lake. At first, the inside of the tower reminded her of Caer Morhen, the same long black corridor behind a colonnade, the same unending abyss in the perspective of columns or statues. It was beyond comprehension how that abyss could fit into the slender obelisk of the tower. But she knew, of course, that there was no point analysing it, not in the case of a tower that had risen up from nothingness, appearing where it had not been before. There could be anything in such a tower, and one ought not to be surprised by anything. She looked back. She didn't believe Bonart had dared or managed to enter after her, but she wanted to make certain. The colonnade she had ridden into blazed with an unnatural brilliance. Kelpie's hooves rang on the floor, something crunched under them. Bones, skulls, shin bones, rib cages, thigh bones, hip bones. She was riding through a gigantic ossuarium. Caer Morhen, she thought, recalling. The dead should be buried in the ground. How long ago that was? I still believed in something like that then. In the majesty of death, in respect for the dead. But death is simply death. And a dead person is just a cold corpse. It's not important where it's lying, where its bones decay. She rode into the gloom under the colonnade, among the columns and statues. The darkness undulated like smoke. Her ears were filled with intrusive whispers, sighs and soft incantations. Suddenly, brightness flamed before her as a gigantic door opened. One door opened after another. Doors. An infinite number of heavy doors opened before her without a murmur. Kelpie went on, horseshoes resounding on the floor. The geometry of the walls, arcades and columns surrounding her was suddenly disrupted, so confusingly that Siri felt dizzy. She felt as though she were inside an impossible, multifaceted solid, some gigantic polyhedron. The doors kept opening. But now they weren't delineating a single direction. They were pointing to infinite directions and possibilities. And Siri began to see. A black-haired woman leading an ashen-haired girl by the hand. The girl is afraid, afraid of the dark, fears the whispers growing in the gloom, is terrified by the ringing of horseshoes. The black-haired woman with a star sparkling with diamonds around her neck is also afraid, but does not let it show. She leads the girl on towards her destiny. Kelpie walks on. More doors. Yola the second and Yurnaid, in sheepskin coats with their bundles, marching along a frozen, snowy road. The sky is deep blue. More doors. Yola the first, kneeling before an altar. Beside her is Mother Nenica. They are both looking at something, their faces contorted in a grimace of dread. What do they see? The past or the future? Truth or untruth? Above Nenica and Yola, hands. The hands of a woman with golden eyes held out in a gesture of blessing. In the woman's necklace, a diamond shining like the morning star. On the woman's shoulder, a cat. Over her head, a falcon. More doors. Triss Merigold holds back her glorious chestnut hair, buffeted and tugged by gusts of wind. There is no escape from the wind. Nothing can shelter from the wind. Not here. Not on the brow of the hill. A long, unending row of shadows encroaches on the hill. Forms. They are walking slowly. Some turn their faces towards her. Familiar faces. Vesemir. Eskel. Lambert, Cohen, Yarpen Zigrin, and Pauli Dahlberg, Fabio Sachs, Yara, 
Tissaia de Vries. Missile. Geralt? Mordor's. Yennefer in chains, fastened to a dungeon wall dripping with water. Her hands are a single mass of clotted blood. Her black hair is tousled and disheveled. Her mouth is cut and swollen, but her will to fight and resistance are undampened in her violet eyes. Mummy, hold on. Don't give up. I'm coming to help you. More doors. Siri turns her head away in distress and embarrassment. Geralt and a green-eyed woman with black, close-cropped hair, both naked, engrossed by and consumed with each other, with giving each other sensual pleasure. Siri fights to overcome the adrenaline tightening her throat and spurs Kelfi on. Hooves clatter, whispers pulsate in the darkness, more doors. Welcome, Siri. Visagota? I knew you would succeed. Oh, courageous maiden, my brave swallow, did you emerge unharmed? I, I defeated them, on the ice. I had a surprise for them. Your daughter skates. I meant psychological harm. I held back from vengeance. I didn't kill them all. I didn't kill Tawny Owl, even though he hurt and disfigured me. I controlled myself. I knew you'd prevail, Ziriel, and that you'd enter the tower. Why, I've read about it, because it has already been described. It has all been written about. Do you know what learning gives you? The ability to make use of sources. How is it possible that we're talking? Oh, Visigotha, are you... Yes, Siri, I'm dead. Oh, never mind. What I have learned is more important. What I have worked out. Now I know what became of the lost days. What happened in Korath Desert. How you vanished from the sight of your pursuers. And how I entered here. Entered this tower, right? The Elder Blood that flows in your veins, gives you power over time and over space, over the dimensions and the spheres. You are now master of the worlds, Siri. You have a mighty power. Do not let criminals or rogues take it from you and use it to their own ends. I won't. Farewell, Siri. Farewell. Swallow. Farewell, old raven. More doors. Brightness, dazzling brightness, and the heady scent of flowers. A mist lay on the lake, a haze as light as down, which the wind quickly blew away. The surface of the water was as smooth as a mirror. Flowers shone white on green carpets of flat lily pads. The banks drowned in leaves and flowers. It was warm. It was spring. Siri was not surprised. How could she be? After all, now everything was possible. November, ice, snow, frozen ground, the mound of stones on the hillock bristling with dried stalks. That was there. But here is here. Here, a soaring basalt tower, crowned with serrated battlements, reflected in the green water of the lake, dotted with the white of water lilies. Here, it's May. For wild roses and bird cherry bloom in May, don't they? Nearby, somebody was playing on a whistle or a pan flute. They were playing a jolly, lively tune. On the lakeside, two snow-white horses were drinking, four hooves in the water. Kelpie snorted and banged a hoof against a rock. Then the horses lifted their heads and nostrils dripping water, and Siri sighed. Because they weren't horses, but unicorns. Siri was not surprised. She was sighing in awe, not in astonishment. She could hear the tune more and more clearly. 
It was coming from behind the shrubs of bird cherry festooned with white blossom. Kelpie moved towards the sound by herself without any urging. Siri swallowed. The two unicorns, as still as statues reflected in the surface of the water, as smooth as a mirror, looked at her. A fair-haired elf with a triangular face and huge almond-shaped eyes was sitting on a round stone beyond the bird cherry shrub. He played on, nimbly running his lips over the pipes. Although he could see Siri and Kelpie, although he was looking at them, he didn't stop playing. The small flowers gave off a scent. Siri had never encountered bird cherry with such an intense fragrance. No wonder, she thought quite soberly. Bird cherry blossom simply smells different in the world I've lived in until this moment. Because... Everything is different in that world. The elf finished his tune with a long, drawn-out, high-pitched trill, took the instrument from his mouth and stood up. What took you so long? he asked with a smile. What kept you? End of Book Four